All right. So basically, now that we have an E1000 uh, network driver that allows us to send raw, send and receive raw frames, uh, we're gonna start adding a network stack on top of that. Now, one thing that we're gonna need to do is we wanna support these two other devices, which are slight variants from the E1000. So for that, we're gonna need a database of the, uh, we're gonna need a database of the different offsets for some of these uh, NIC buffers. But I know that the shapes of the descriptors are the same and the logic is the same. So we'll have to end up um, figuring out all these constants uh, for each device that we support. Um, and that's really an issue because we're uh, we're implementing three three Intel drivers in one uh, because they all kind of fundamentally work the same way. They have slightly different offsets, but that we can work around with uh, dictionaries and lookups. So I think what we're gonna do is we're first gonna probably get this sending and receiving UDP frames, um, and then once we have the sending and receiving UDP frames, we'll transition to. Um, yeah, we need to figure out our networking model. So I need this networking model to work without interrupts entirely. So that means that I cannot handle external ARP. So if someone wants to send me a packet and they send me an ARP, I actually can't respond to that packet unless I'm receiving. So the other thing we have to handle, which typically I'm doing an X540 driver, which has 64 different, um, it has 64 different, cues that we can use on the NIC. So I actually give a different queue to every network card on the system. So what I'm gonna need to do is I'm gonna need to make it possible that uh, basically a core is gonna get access to the network card. So they're gonna request access to the network card. And one thing that I wanna do is I don't want that access to the network card to be uh, a global lock because finding the network card is going to be non-free. So I don't want it to be every time you send and receive a packet, you lock the network card and you send something or you find the network card. So what I'd like is that if you're writing an application that may interface with the network, that you get access to the network card very early on in the function or whatever you're implementing. And then you pass that along to send and receive uh, in future packets. Now what that means is I'll probably need to implement read writer locks and I'll need to make the send and receive uh, mechanisms uh, work with a reference, so a non a non mutable reference. Currently, they require um, send and receive require mutable references, and what I'll probably end up doing is make that take a self, and then inside of here we'll have a small lock or use atomics to guarantee there's no trampling. Um, so we have to kind of figure out how we want to do that as well. But other than that. We're in pretty good shape here. So I think this driver is pretty solid. Uh, we, of course, need to support those other network cards. And now what I need to do is I need to make a way that this dynamic device can be converted into a net device. So I think what I'll implement, uh, we'll start a file kernel source net.rs. And this is going to have um, networking. Uh, uh, this is going to be driver agnostic networking utilities. And this is where we're going to define a net device. And we're gonna say that a trait net device. What color scheme is this? This is just the default. <clears throat> so I'm not, I'm not sure. So let's see here. Um. Okay, so network devices will have a send. We'll take a mute self for now. We're gonna probably relax that in a bit. And then a packet. Um, and I think sends will just be blocking. Hmm, I'm trying to think if I need sends to be non-blocking. Um, If I do non-blocking sends, I need to track who sent what packets so I can notify them. So we're gonna have sends be blocking. So this is going to be um, send a raw frame over the network containing the bytes packet. This packet does not include the FCS. That will be computed uh, by that 
must be computed or inserted by the driver. Um, so what we'll do is we'll also have a receive mute self. This takes a packet mute u8 and returns an option u size. This is a uh, receive a raw frame from the network into packet return um, number of bytes read if a packet was available. If no packet was available, then the number of bytes, uh, then if no packet is available, this returns none without blocking. So these are the standards required for making a network driver. And then we'll also have a uh, Mac, let's take a self, and this will return a U8 for six. Um, and this will, uh, gets the Mac address of the hardware. Um, and then we'll also, when you implement this trait on your network device, um, can we have an associated constant here? I think I can. But I don't know if I can if I wrap it in a box. So let me see that. So we'll do mod net. So that does build. Um, okay. So then what we're going to do is on device kernel source PCI, we're going to have to wait. We're going to have to have a way to determine whether or not a device implements network. So to do that, PCI will have a routine here on a device, this will be uh, fn get net device. This will take a mute self, and then this will give a option dynamic dispatch um, net device. We're gonna have to wrap that in a box, I think. Problem is this is already wrapped in a box. I would really like to be able to inherit that. Let me see if I can get this to work. Um, if this device supports the networking model. It should return a uh, an implementer of the net device trait. Uh, otherwise, it should return none. And we can default implement this to none. So by default, that'll just return none on your behalf. Um, and then if you're making a network device, you do that, and we're going to have to box that up, I'm pretty sure. So we'll have to do use crate net, net device. Uh, and that's a private trait. Let's make that pub. Cannot be made into an object. Yeah, so... That's where it's like really weird. I think I have to box it up, but that makes a copy of it. I want to be able to access it as a net device, but I don't think I can do that. Uh, if I make this mute net device. Fuck. This is a really difficult part of the any trait stuff in Rust, but I don't think I can turn that into an object. Um, fuck. So what I what I have is I I have a list of box device. Can I box up a reference? No. Fuck. Um, get net device. 
Maybe I'm doing this stupidly. I could use a closure to get access to the net device. But the problem is I have a I have a box of a device. And that device may implement net device. So what I want to do is I want to convert that box device into a option box net device effectively. But I can't create a new allocation because I would make a new object. So I need them to refer to the same object. So it needs to be a reference. Um, and I don't think there's any way to do this. So basically, right now, this is a device that implements the any trait. And we can downcast. We can downcast that any trait into. Um, we can convert the the device into a into the actual device like the E one thousand. So we can do that. Um, but you can't convert an any to a trait, which is really frustrating. So. Yeah, you can see if it is that type. And this is a device which is contained in the box. I can't return the net device. I can't downcast into a trait. I guess I have to make a new box, don't I? But how do I make that refer to the same thing? We have an any type, something that implements device, get net device. Um, ah. Do I do an arc? If I do an arc, that works. And then I could have something return an arc. Yeah, I think I could do this. I could do arc of a net device. I can do that conversion through here. But that won't be able to take a self. Because I need to give it the arc. Oh. Hmm. Can I do this? No. Can I move that device in there? This. Dynamic dispatch, this. Uh, sell for it's sized. Restricting sell for it's sized. How do I do this in TKO? I think I do this in TKO. Let me see. And we do this with arc. Um... Oh, maybe I do a box. What? Dine plugin, an RC ref cell. That allows it to be mutable inside of there. Oh yeah, I made these as any traits. How did this work again? Oops. As any. Trait which allows converting to an any. Implement as any for T, which implements plugin and static. Um, so how did this work? 
Yeah, I think I think with another trait we can perform a, a trait to trait conversion. You can return a ref dine any. Is that what I need to do? Can I return if this is a mute self? Can this return a this can't return a reference to a dynet device because it can't be turned into a Oh, because it has the associated constant. Okay. So this does work. We can do this. So we can return a mutable reference to a net device. Yeah, never mind. I just should have read the compiler output. So this will allow me to call net device, get net device on a device, and then if it supports a network device, it can return a mutable reference to something that implements network device, which self does, in the case of a network card. So we're gonna go into our network card, and we'll pull in use, boop, 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 boop. Pull in use, reorder those, use crates, PCI, uh, create net, net device. So net device implements that trait. In this case, now we have to implement it, and we have to implement send receive Mac, and that's it. So we'll do um, we'll do. Uh, yeah, I think we just go to the end. Impl net device for Intel Gbit. We gotta implement purge still. Uh, implement purge for Intel Gbit. Okay, so implement net device for this, and we take a Mac, takes a self. This returns the Mac address, and I think I already have a get Mac or something. Oh, I actually just save the MAC address, I think. So we can return self.mac. Okay, and then send and receive. I think we already do send and receive in the same shape. So there's our send, self.send payload. And then receive, same shape. Uh, self dot receive buffer that will return that value out. So we're just wrapping up. We're giving generic access to these send and receive routines. Uh, Four seventeen. Those don't need to be pub, of course. Honestly, I could make everything in here not pub because they don't need to be accessed externally. Through we're gonna always use that generic trait. Fn. So what's public? We got probe. Probe is the only public thing. Perfect. Fuck yeah. And that works. Now on this, I need to implement fn get net device. Uh, we'll say just net device. So this will allow us to get access to the network device through the any trait. So based on the any trait, we can return a network device if we support it. And in this case, we support it, mute self. And I'm pretty sure I can just return self here. Um, sum. Oh, yep, and then this returns an option mute dine net device. So something that implements a net device, we can return it. That, yes! We did Rust, we did Rust lifetimes. Do you like Zeal, the documentation browser? I've never used it before. Um, all right. So then for all devices, we can ask if they're a network device. By default, it's no. If they implement net device, then we return self. That gives access to these routines, uh, which will allow us to access the MAC address and send and receive. Um, and that's pretty good. <laughs> Nice. All right. It's need for pulling docs fast. Interesting. I've really never had an issue with documentation in Rust. What what does it what does it change that makes it faster than like uh, cargo doc or rust up doc? 
because I haven't had any problems with those. Okay, so now we have generic access to a net device. Fuck yes. So now, for a net device, we can now implement uh, pub fn trait or pub trait uh, EDP. I think we'll do this with traits. Well, we'll do um, we'll do Ethernet. So this is uh, so this is a um, driver implemented trait to get generic access to uh, network card uh, send uh, RX and TX. Consumes all the Rust docs and you can browse them offline. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I have the Rust docs offline because they come with the compiler by default. So if I go to, if I just search Rust, right, here's the offline Rust documentation. And then all my local documentation works offline. I'm guessing that's only useful if you're using third party crates. It's the fact that you can swap through languages and technologies through the same interface. Okay. Well, we only use Rust here, and we don't use third-party crates. So, so we don't really have a strong need for that. But that's mainly just the way that we develop. That's, I'm sure it's a super useful tool for a lot of people. So Ethernet will allow us to create an Ethernet frame. Um... To do that, so I need to figure out how I want to how I want to send and receive Ethernet frames. I think what I'll do is I'll probably do a packet, and then you'll fill in before and after. Uh, so one of the biggest issues with uh, networking is that you need to like wrap up packets. Um, you need to wrap up packets with encapsulation, and sometimes like a user. A user's gonna call on like pub trait UDP, right? They're gonna call FN send on a UDP trait, and they'll do mute self, um, buff, U8, something like this. And, and they'll wanna send this as the contents of a UDP packet. Now the problem is we actually need to wrap that buffer. Uh, we need to put some headers on there. And we either need to, um, we either need to be able to, we either need to make an allocation for every layer in the networking stack and basically put a header in front of it, which we can potentially do. Um, yeah, I think this will take a U8. I might have to implement something like struct packet and this would either have uh, the payload and this would be enough room to hold uh, 15, 18. Uh, this would be enough to hold all networking packets. And what we could do is when someone does a UDP send, we either copy into the UDP portion. So we're gonna have, a packet's gonna look like this. We're gonna have the MAC header, an IP header, and a UDP header, and then the UDP payload. And then at the end, there's an FCS checksum, uh, but we don't see this, right? That's actually handled by the network card for us. Um, well. That's our standard here. Our standard is saying that this does not include the FCS, must be computed or inserted by the driver. So, we might have to have a method for making these packets. So, basically I don't want to, I don't want to have to make any copies of, of a packet. So when I send a packet, I want to make sure that no memory gets copied, no mem copies occur. So if I send a UDP packet, I want it to use the this buffer itself. So what we can do is we can do um, what's relatively common in network cards. So we can't actually have the payload here. But what's relatively common is if we had this take a packet instead, then we can control the contents and someone would create a UDP packet. Um, so that's one way we could go about it. The other way we could go about it is this packet could contain all the things we might possibly use uh, for one of these things. So we can say like ethernet, and this would be an option to, uh, this is like the raw bytes of the ethernet header. In fact, this would be raw bytes to a reference. 
of the bytes for an Ethernet header. Um, and then what we would do when we actually copy that packet into the network payload, um, technically the network card is capable of sending multiple buffers. Uh, we would have to know that this memory is physically contiguous, and that's where it's kind of difficult. We can't guarantee that this memory is physically contiguous. Uh, but what we could do is we could literally just have all these different buffers and we could give these to the NIC all in one go uh, directly where they were in memory and then let the network card send those. That would allow us to not copy into the actual packet. So at the network layer, right on the NIC, we have a send routine uh, which takes up uh, the packet. And that packet currently... The way that we implement that, and we might want to find a way to implement this differently, this will actually copy the contents of payload. It'll copy the contents of the payload into the TX descriptor, um, the TX buffer that we allocated. So what we could do is we could change this all to not actually do that. And what we could do is we could give it a pointer directly to the packet, um, we could basically change the pointer here as long as the packet's physically contiguous. But that's going to be relatively difficult to prove, I think. Um, we could do it. We could translate to get the physical address of the pack. Uh, yeah, so... I think we'll probably want this one copy because it's going to be more expensive to translate from a virtual to a physical. I think it'll be more expensive to translate from a virtual to a physical than copy the payload. Actually, that's not true. This will take about four cycles per... Yeah, let's say, yeah, about four cycles per 64 bytes minimum. That's the bare minimum. So let's say we want to copy 1,500 bytes divided by 64. That's 23 and a half multiplied by 4. It's about 94 cycles to perform that copy at maximum speed, which we probably won't hit. So let's say 100 cycles to perform the copy. If we can translate an address... If we pre-translate it with a packet and make a user reuse a packet, then we can guarantee that that packet is in physical memory and contiguous. I think that's the play. I think what we'll do is when you want to send, you will use a packet object. And the packet object, you will, allow, you will be able to reuse and repurpose. But when you create it once, it will allocate all of the buffers in a way that they're contiguous, and then, I think we'll then send them, we'll put them on the network card as the physical pointers, and let the network card coalesce them. That way we have no copies. I think that's what we want to do, because I want to make this a no copy network stack. Um, which is relatively difficult, right? And I think we can do that if we're using fixed uh, UDP headers. So let's take a look at the MAC header. So MAC header for Ethernet is just 6, 6, and 2, I'm pretty sure. Ethernet frame. Um, so for an Ethernet, yeah, it's just the destination MAC, the source MAC, and Ether type. So that is fixed. So when someone makes a packet, Let's, let's try this. So let's say we have a payload here. We know that the MAC header is always at offset zero. And then we have the payload. Yeah, I think we can just construct. Well, I'm still gonna need to copy the bytes that the user specifies. Mm. Hmm. 
That's not true. What I could do is I could have this uh, impl a uh, impl packet. It's not a. So we have a packet. This can hold. This can hold the full size of a EDP packet. Then what we'll have is we'll have like get. Uh, this will be like EDP payload. Let's take a mute self, and this will give a reference to the bytes that in that payload are the UDP part. And then when someone wants to send a UDP packet, they'll basically do, um, here's, here's my idea, right? And we gotta think through if this works before we implement it. But we'll probably do a, um, I use a DOS keyboard. This has Cherry MX Blues. So in this case, we'll do a packet. Um, so when I want to do a send, we'll do something like this. Let mute packet is equal to packet new. That'll create a new empty packet. Actually, probably say like packet UDP. And we'll give it, um, And we'll make wrappers on all of this stuff as well. So we'll probably do a packet UDP. This will construct a packet capable of holding a UDP, which will have the MAC header, the IP header, the UDP header, and then the UDP payload will just be a pointer to that. And then the user would do packet.udp payload dot... Um, how do I inform it of the size? That will return mute u8. I think we might implement the problem is we can't get the length. That's what I'm trying to think through right now. So right now, with this design, I can copy into the UDP payload from whatever I want. So when the user wants to send a message, it will copy it into there. I don't think we're going to be able to avoid this copy. Because we can't, we can't validate the physical address of this. Um... Yeah, I think so, because we have no way of... Ah, how's that going to work? Copy from slice. That would copy into there. But... The only way that I could possibly eliminate that copy is if I pass that copy directly to the NIC. The NIC would have to be aware of where that is in physical memory, and it would have to be contiguous in physical memory, and we'd have to translate that to physical. And I just don't think we're going to be able to avoid that. I think it'll be more expensive, likely more expensive, to get access to the page table to perform the translation. That also requires a lock on the page table. And we can't do that. Yeah, we would have to get a lock on the page table, which would then serialize who can use the NIC. Or it would serialize network rights based on who has access to the page table. I think this is going to be the best way that we can do this. And then they can reuse packet, right? So they don't have to reallocate this packet every time. So we could do this in a loop where we copy a different payload into there. And then we would do like net device.send packet. And that would send it. Um it would also allow the header to not be recopied and recomputed every time. 
Ah, oh, shit. I do need to get that length. So I think this will have to return an object that I can call like dot write on and write will update the length of the UDP packet. Get the UDP packet, get the payload. We can do write to that payload. That would then fill in the bytes of the payload where the UDP payload belongs. Um, And then we'd be able to send this payload directly to the NIC because we can guarantee that this is allocated at a fixed physical address. I think. So how do I do that? Capturing the size I can do with the trait. So this will be this will be like a UDP payload.write. This would eventually panic if you exceed the size of a UDP payload. Question is, do I want the packet to be agnostic or do I want this to be like a UDP packet? Um, I think we can enum inside to know which type of a packet this is. So internal, we can say this is a... Internal to this, we can track what type of packet it is so we know what offsets. That's going to be the raw payload. Well, the physical address of the payload will be able to send that packet to the network card with a size. Um, we'll have like a get fizz. The IP header and the MAC header will set up during UDP. And I think I'll probably have raw UDP. And then UDP. So raw UDP will take basically the source desk MAC addresses and the IP headers. And UDP will actually resolve the MAC address via um, ARP. And how long are you supposed to keep an ARP around? If you if we send an ARP, how long do we have to how long do we have to cache that? Um What do we do? We send this Get the MAC address. Yep. How do we, how long do we hold that for? Um. Oops. There we go. Arp. Okay. I have no idea how long you're supposed to hold that ARP for. Yeah, I'm not sure. But I think we'll ARP when we make the packet. So... Okay, so let's see if we can let's see if we can make this work. Impl uh, on a packet, we'll have fn raw mac. This will have the destination, so u eight for six, 
the source to U8 for six. Our cash timeout is set to four hours. Wow, that's a long time. And then ether type, that's a U16. Is big Indian. Everything's big Indian at this stage. So this will cat that. Sixty seconds. Okay. That seems pretty fair. So it seems kinda up to interpretation. So this will create a new packet with the Mac header initialized to the raw dest source and ether type. All right, so we can, we're gonna have a payload here. This is gonna be a, oh, we need to be able to drop that. Um, yeah, so let's grab the, we need a way of doing physical allocations. We implemented that on our network card. We implemented this alloc fizz, but that returns a static mute T. We're going to need to return that with a, um, yeah, I think we'll do SP kernel source MM. We'll go into here. I'm going to make a new structure, fizz contig, and this is a allocation containing a physically contiguous um, allocation containing a physically contiguous allocation. Okay. Then for this, this will return a fizz contig of a T. Um, containing a physically contiguous allocation. Okay. Um, and this is impl fizz contig new with a T. This will allocate physically contiguous uh, memory large enough to hold val. Um, Okay, jump out. What are you? What are you talking about here? I've noticed sometimes you say the weirdest shit, and I. It sometimes it it throws me off quite a bit. Allocate physically contiguous memory heart large enough to hold val, and move val into it. Dial up for your what, dude? Jump out, man. Uh, Impl drop for this. Fn drop mute self. Okay, so this will have the physical address, a uh, physical address of the allocation. Then we'll have a virtual address of the allocation. And I think we're gonna 4K align all these. We're gonna make sure we only return 4K aligned allocations. 
just so we get the most uh, out of our packet-based allocator. Um, ah, squeak. I gotta, I gotta oil my uh, mic boom thing. It's got some issues. All right, let's get this on shuffle, repeat. Okay. Virtual address of the allocation, and then this will be a... Um, I guess we'll implement DREF on these, actually. Okay. So we got a virtual address here, we got a physical address here. We return this physically contiguous. Um, and I think we'll always make this 4K aligned. That'll initialize the memory, so it'll be initialized. We'll move val into it. And this is currently only set up to do one page, so we gotta change that. Um, and I think what we'll do is, um, so we'll assert core pointer size of core mem. Actually, I think I have size of pulled in, don't I? No, I don't. Uh, use core mem size. We can actually use size of val here. So we'll pull that in. And then we'll say if the size of, the size of the value, which is val, uh, assert that this is greater than zero. Uh, I cannot use ZST, zero size type, for, uh, Fizz contig, so I'll get really mad. Fizzmem we already have access to. Mm, we're in mm. So get access to physical memory. Get access to the current page table. Um, then we're going to. Before that, we will do. Before we get access to this lock, we'll allocate a virtual address for this mapping. And I think what we'll do is we'll do um, core compare min, or max, the larger of the two, between 4096 and size of val, val. Okay. Uh, yeah, and here we'll do let elk size is equal to this. Thank you, manwalk, for the follow. Hell yeah. Here we're going to uh, convert the um, if the allocation is smaller than four kilobytes, then round it up to four kilobytes. This allows us to take advantage of our of our page free lists and relieves some pressure on the physical memory allocator. Uh, so basically, we can allocate pages, we've optimized our memory allocator to very quickly allocate pages because we use pages to create anything. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna round this up to a page size. Uh, if this allocation is smaller than four kilobytes, then round it up to four kilobytes. This allows us to take advantage of our page free list and relieve some pressure on the physical memory allocator as the free lists are per core and do not require a global lock. So we'll prioritize towards that. And then we'll allocate a virtual address for this mapping. So we'll say, I need, I need a virtual address that is capable of mapping this size allocation. And then elk size. Here we're gonna allocate, a pay, uh, allocate physical memory for this allocation which is four kilobyte aligned. Um, actually, is minimum uh, four K 
kilobyte aligned. And then in our alloc fizz up here, what we should do is if this, if the size is 4K and the align is greater than or equal to 4K, because that alignment, we know that the alignment is, if it's greater than or equal to 4K, then it's also 4K aligned. Uh, the alignment is required to be a power of two. So 8K, anything beyond this is 4K aligned. Um, and then free fizz. Here we actually care about only the alignment if it's zero and the size is 4K. Okay, so then down here, we'll do a from size align We'll put this up our line, we'll put this tier, and then we'll do core, compare max, the larger of the two alignment requirements, one which is 4K alignment, and the other which is align of val val. Uh, 380. Actually, I'm going to switch that to size of instead of size of val. So here we'll say size of T... This will be size of T. This will be a line of T. Pull in a line of. And then in this whole thing, anywhere that we use core mem size of, we'll replace that with a size of, because now that we imported that, we might as well. 380. Okay. Assert that the size of that is greater than zero. Then we determine the size of the allocation. So we round it up to 4K if it's under 4K. Otherwise, we keep exactly to the byte what it is. Then we allocate a virtual address for this mapping. Um, allocate physical memory for this allocation, which is minimum 4 kilobyte of aligned. So if it is, if the alignment is less than 4K, it'll be 4K. Otherwise, we'll use the larger of the two. Alignment requirements. We'll allocate that physical memory. We've got access to the current page table. Now we will map all the memory. So we'll do a four, four offset in zero to size of T. Uh, yeah, this is for, yeah, offset in this dot enumerate. Uh, actually, dot step by 4096. So this is the page offset. Um, actually, this is the... Yeah, we'll just call it offset. So that's the offset uh, mapped in each page from the allocation. So for every single page, we will map at virtual address dot zero plus offset... And then we'll map the physical address plus the offset. And this will be as U64. So go through every 4K offset from the allocation size. Oh, this is not size of. This is um, elk size. Because that's what we actually allocate. Then we go through every page, we step by 4K, we map in at the virtual address allocation plus the offset, we map in a page as non-executable, writable, and present, uh, fail to allocate, fail to allocate um, fizzcontig, and this is fail to map fizzcontig memory, then we initialize the memory, which is not ready yet. So that's going to map everything in. And then here we initialize the memory with the value that was passed in here. We write to that virtual address. And then we return uh, create the fizzcontig structure. And this will be a fizzcontig. And we'll return the virtual address which is the vatter and the physical address, which is the pattern. Okay, so we can just do this syntax. 
Done. So I'll do new, and then on drop, we will call, we'll get access to physical memory and we'll free the physmem. Uh, we can do this alloc vert before we get pmem. Uh, technically we should do that after the physical allocation, such that if that failed to allocate physically, then we would not actually reserve that virtual memory. Okay, and where do I actually get access to physical memory? APIC, E1000. So I use this to allocate the map in the APIC. I use this to map in the E1000. This is an MM, that's fine. And that's bootloader. Okay, so we should be fine here. Um, unexpected type argument. Yep, this holds a T. And we're basically going to, uh, this will be a phantom. So this is going to uh, mark that this holds a T. We gotta pull in phantom data. Use core marker phantom data, and we'll say um, uh, phantom. All right. Uh, go through, we allocate that, we then map all of that in, so this is physically contiguous, and then we give the virtual address and the physical address. Then for drop, we will do an unsafe core pointer drop in place of the virtual address as mute t, so we're just gonna drop, um, that'll drop what is in there. Um, okay, we need NX. NX page right, page present. Use page table, page present, page right, page NX. Okay. M impl t drop t for fizz contig, so that will drop that out. So I'll drop the held contents, and then we'll actually free the memory through physical memory. We'll do this, and we'll do pmem dot free fizz. I think is what we call it. Free fizz fizz adder size. Okay, so this will take a self dot physical address and size of t. Okay, so this will uh, drop the contents of the allocation, and then this will free the physical memory. Um, of this allocation, and then we also want to unmap that memory. How do we do that for alloc in free? That's free fizz, dealloc. So what we do is we will 4K line up the allocation size, get access to virtual memory, and then free the virtual memory, okay. So free the physical memory for this allocation. Oh, this will do that for us. Free will free the pages. So get access to physical memory. 4K line up the allocation size, and this will be um, uh, size of T, checked add that, unwrap and not FFF. So 4K align up the size of the T. Get access to virtual memory. 
and then we'll free that memory. Okay, impl t, fiscontig t, Okay, 403, as u64, phantom. And this is a, a phantom data. Okay, we're almost there. 454, this is the virtual address, self.vatter.0. Free the memory and page tables used to map it. Just a nitpick, I'm probably wrong here anyways, but you wrote 4 kilobyte and then wrote 4096. Don't you mean KB as a kilobyte instead of a kibibyte? KIB is 4096. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> 4 KIB is 4096. 4 KB is 4000. So, um, uh, Okay, but yeah, I always say KIB and MIB because it, it's technically correct um, because they're the, they're the base two versions of the kilos and stuff. How old are you? I'm 26. Um, okay. Jump out, man. Let's not do let's let's not do that's what she said. Come on. Um drop in place, drop the contents of the allocation, get the access to the physical memory. Align 4K align the size up. Um size of that, check out FFF. Line up the size, get access to the virtual memory. We've guaranteed that we have allocated this virtually aligned or physically aligned per address starting at zero. That's 4K. The phys adder is always 4K aligned because we require 4K alignment minimum. That will then go into align size. Check to add that, round it up, which is correct get access to physical memory, and then we'll free that memory at that virtual address with that align size. Yeah, I think this should be correct. Um, okay, and then this will have a fizz contig of a U8 for two, two, we'll just do 2K. Doesn't really matter, because it's rounded up to 4K. In fact, we can say, 1518, which is the max size for a packet. Well, it's 1518 including the FCS, so 1514 for the non FCS packet. Well, it should be large enough to hold that. Okay, so we'll grab fizzcontig not found. Okay, yep. Use crate mm fizzcontig and 184. Um, oh, this is an E1000. At 184, an E1000 will go up to here and we'll grab alloc vert adder. We need that from when we map it. And then alloc, uh, this will be fizz contig. 
Okay, private structure. So we'll go to MM, we'll make that pub. This will give us access to that memory. Okay, and then anywhere that we call alloc fizz in here, we'll change to uh, fizz contig new to hold that. Fizz contig new. Fizz contig new, and we're gonna change up some of this in a minute. TX descriptors, private associated function, okay. Uh, what did you study in university and what? I didn't go to university. I've just been doing this as a hobby, so I am not formally trained in anything other than my good old high school degree. So we got an Rx buffer here. Anywhere that we do this, we're gonna just get the TX descriptors. Okay, is that one liner now? No, not quite. We're going to create a buffer here. And I think we missed a couple of them. Can't get a length on that. 183, that doesn't return a tuple. That makes sense. Yeah, we should have done this sooner. I knew I was eventually gonna make this uh, this physically contiguous, and I was impatient. Now I have to like patch all this stuff up. No len found on that, so we're gonna implement deref on these. Um, fn deref. Oh, I implement. Uh, oops, I implement deref on lock cell. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna impl t deref for contig fizz t type, uh, I think you have to give this the target. I forget what it is, deref, yeah you do. Type target is equal to t fn deref self, turn self target on safe, and here we'll do uh, self dot virtual address dot zero as const t. So we'll cast the virtual address into a constant pointer, and then we'll deref it, and that will give us a Rust reference, and then we'll implement deref mute. So this will allow us to actually just use contig fizz as if it is actually the t type that it contains. This is gonna be deref mute. This will take a mute self. We've got a mute on this. And then this becomes a mute pointer. Then up here, we will pull in uh, use core ops deref. I think it's ops. Deref and deref mute. Ooh, okay. Uh, can't get length on that. Oh yeah, something's not working about derefs. Ah, contig fizz, fizz contig. Um, ASMR keyboard, hell yeah. Uh, I like your hobby then, hell yeah, thank you so much. All right. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Do you have any... Uh, recommend, do you recommend a, a book or maybe a course for learning programming? You know, I learned programming in a very non-standard way, and I think that led to me not really knowing <laughs> what references and what things work really well for other people. I know that for me personally, what works really well is to just pick a project and kind of bang it out, but I have a lot of free time, and I've been able to use that free time to 
um, and that's mute self-target. Um, and I've been able to use that free time to kind of learn and just randomly explore. But if you're more time constrained or you need a more fixed curriculum, um, I think some people in chat do have some good resources for things like learning Python. There are a bunch of courses for learning Python and other sorts of programming. Uh, reading the Rust book is good once you understand low-level development, which I think by the time you can like learn Rust out of the gates, you probably know programming already. In my opinion, it is a relatively difficult language to program in. Um, so yeah, do you have any good resources to get into kernel development? There aren't too many great resources for that. Uh, one of the really good things that is out there is the OS Dev Wiki. It's, you should not use it as fact, it's more of a reference. Um, I would highly recommend getting comfortable reading the specifications of whatever hardware that you're implementing. So get comfortable using the ARM ARM for ARM dev. Get comfortable, the ARM ARM is the ARM ARM uh, reference manual, which is like their big book on how ARM processors work and their specification. Uh, Intel has their own manuals, the software or the systems developer guide kind of goes into the systems details. I would say being able to read those, being able to read the source original documentation is so important to doing development, I would say. A lot of people do OS development based on like public resources and other people's code. And those people did it on public resources and other people's code, and it kind of goes down this nested thing where no one has really consulted the manual in a couple revisions, and the code starts to really not resemble what was actually intended uh, by hardware. Phil Ops writing an OS in Rust is pretty good. Oh yeah, that's uh, um, that's the blog. Wait, yes, that's a series about doing the OS in Rust Dev. I have not read that. I've read individual pieces of it. Um, there's also like a build a hypervisor from scratch that someone's doing that kind of that's more on the hypervisor dev side of things But there's a lot of overlap in hypervisor dev and systems dev Okay, we're gonna impl on this we'll impl uh, pub fn fizz self a fizz adder and this will return self dot patter this will return a fizz adder and this will gets the physical address of the allocation. Okay, so then if we were to make a physical contig, that'll drop the contents, and then we will free, we'll free the actual virtual memory and the physical pages that were used to construct it. Um, yeah, now those will end up on the free list but that's fine if they're pages that it's actually okay. Okay. So then anywhere that we do an under fizz in E1000, which is the only place we're using this code so far. Um, so that's, these are no longer static mutes. These are now, um, and this shouldn't be a static mute. We should probably make a mapping type that allows us to map something as a type. Maybe, I don't know, we'll, we'll get to that later. So this is a fizz contig of that. This is a vec of fizz contig. This is a fizz contig. And this is a vec of fizz contig. So I think that's pretty close. Then anywhere that we reference the physical, we'll want to grab rxbuff.fizz. And then we push rxbuff, that'll keep that around, and then the rx buffers we store. Uh, 209. Uh, this is dot fizz as u64, or dot zero, because that contains the raw physical 64-bit number. Then, what else do we got here? 220. This, we don't need the under fizz for those actually. Because we can get that from the fizz contig. Much better. Uh, 186, no method fizz. 
This is adder. So we called that function. This is adder. Okay, now we're gonna have some size of issues. Oh, 236. This is dot fizz adder. Ah, shit. There we go. Fizz adder. Just barely fits. Dot fizz adder. I gotta fix that underscore up above. Dot fizz adder. Fix this, turn it into a dot. Oh, we're getting so close, 241. This is the size of, and here we'll slice it to get the contents. And it's the same for this, so we'll slice this up. Now we have the contents of that. Fuck yeah, 176. This needs to be mute. This needs to be mute. And now we can allocate things physically contiguous in memory. Um, and we can... Uh, get the physical address of them, and then they'll get dropped and released from virtual and physical memory uh, once they're done. So this is what we'll use for any allocations that we pass into uh, DMA stuff. Do you use Clippy? I do not. Which terminal do you use? This is just a uh, bone stock X term. <laughs> for any sort of industrial programming, the <laughs> it is basically your Bible. Yeah. Um... For sure. I think, I think being able to read raw documentation is one of the best skills to have in OS dev, to be honest. Um, a lot of wikis and things get outdated. Documentation is pretty much always up to date. You can get the latest manual for whatever you're doing research on, but the most recent operating system or OS dev wiki article for that... Uh, Target is probably outdated at that point in time, and it might contain information that's no longer accurate. It might say that certain bits are reserved when they're actually used for things now. Um, so I think it's very dangerous to go solely based on those. That being said, most hardware is backwards compatible, so if you, if you implement the legacy version, you're probably fine without being aware of newer technology which is pretty crazy. Backwards compatibility is one of the most important features in hardware development. That's why Intel has done so well, because they've been so backwards compatible, where things like ARM and MIPS have not been backwards compatible. Um, okay. So now we can actually go back to what we were doing, which was making this packet. So you have a physcontig, which can hold a packet, and this is the um, physically contiguous contiguous allocation, which can hold a packet. And we're not gonna be able to receive directly into there. So we will have to do a copy on our receive. Yeah, I don't know. So we want the network card to be able to receive into, hmm. So eventually we'll have multiple things that want to use this network card to receive different packets. So we'll either need to drop packets that a receiver is not expecting, or we'll need a receiver to put packets up to hold the packets, which does not work if there are multiple, because um, we'll need to parse the like port so we can redirect messages to whoever was expecting that port. So we'll probably implement filtering on this stuff. Um, the backwards compatibility has also caused the large mess that is x86, I suppose. Yeah, it's... The problem is the x86 really isn't that messy at the end of the day. At least when you're on the software side of things, x86 is actually really easy compared to things like ARM and MIPS, where you have to build custom tool chains and you have to be aware of your specific architecture. On x86... If you are on a 64-bit machine, you can do pretty much anything. You can use SSE up to SSE2. You can uh, create page tables. You can do all of this stuff without checking any feature sets uh, pretty easily. And on things like MIPS, you have to check if instructions exist because instructions come in and out of existence uh, on MIPS processors. So you can have MIPS processors that are newer than old ones that don't support certain instructions while still having the same feature sets. It's really strange. 
I think x86 is bloated in terms of it has a lot of stuff because it can't delete cruft. But I would say dealing with cruft is often better because you can just kind of ignore the cruft. You can only use the pieces that you want to use. Whereas on things like Armin Mips, you have to like take into account the fact that things may have changed and you basically are forced to rebuild binaries for every version of your target board, which is so weird. x86 is so standardized compared to ARM where every vendor uses a whole different peripherals. You know it's an ARM core, but the timers, interrupt controllers are just completely different. Yeah. So for x86, this OS that I'm writing right now will work on pretty much any x86 operating system or any x86 processor that supports 64-bit. Regardless of if it's a Pentium 4 that came out in 2003, or if it's the most bleeding edge engineering sample of the next generation Intel processor, this OS will work and function as intended. You cannot do that with ARM. You cannot do that with MIPS. Um, you, you basically, when you write an OS for ARM, you're writing an OS for a platform, not for ARM. Whereas x86, you're implementing it for like the IBM PC x86 platform, which is, yeah. I can argue from like a, a, perfect, a perfect world perspective that ideally things get deleted when they're no longer needed by the world and we move on from them, but it's, it's very difficult. Like I would be fine doing armor MIPS dev for the type of development I do, which is disposable kernels, because... I would develop it for one or a select few platforms. How did you start writing kernels? I had a mentor growing up who, I don't know if I was interested in writing kernels or he was interested in teaching me writing kernels, but eventually I became interested in writing kernels and he taught me a lot of the things that I know now. I don't know if he's watching right now, but um, yeah, and that kind of got my interest in kernels. And then at that point, uh, I started off with an a kernel called Falk OS, which was a very early, um, it was my first operating system other than some like test things, but it had, it had threading and it had timer, timers and it had interrupt support and context switches, uh, which was really, really neat. It, I think it had a file system and an IDE driver, uh, but it did not have a network driver. And now I've kind of 180. I will probably never write another file system driver and disk driver again, because I just, just not a huge fan. That makes sense. Bloat instability is sort of the same side of the coin. Yeah, it's it's really weird how that works. It really is. You could argue also like this network card that I'm implementing. The fact that I can implement the same driver for a network card that was released in like 2004 and the most bleeding edge, um like x86 network cards also shows that they've kind of standardized the formats and the way that they implement them. I'm pretty sure we can get an x540 network card working here too, but I do need to figure out how I actually want to structure this networking model, which is really fucking hard. Um, so let's, let's talk through why this is difficult because a lot of people are here more to learn than to see me actually complete something. So we'll talk about why this is difficult uh, after I catch up on chat. Which architectures can you write assembly for? Pretty much all of them. Um, very fluent in x86, MIPS, and ARM. I can write PPCs, 6502. Uh, I can pseudocode pretty much any assembly language. Like, I've never written Spark, but I'm pretty sure I could get a Hello World on Spark working within 20 minutes. Because they're all the same. Once you've implemented a, like, load store... Once, you've, once you know a load store assembly language and x86, you can pretty much pseudocode any architecture. At that point, you might be looking for weird things of like, is XOR XOR or is it EOR? Um, but other than that, the syntax is typically the same. The way that you write it is typically the same. You like load up immediate, so you read and write from memory. You perform arithmetic. There's some way of interrupting or syscalling to actually go to a higher privilege level. Um, so I would say that pretty much any architecture I can write assembly for um, not necessarily off the top of my head, but off the top of my head, I can do, uh, x86, ARM, and MIPS, maybe PPC, uh, without really having to reference the manual. For anything else, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't really be a hindrance to my development speed. Okay, so 
let's go into draw IO and we'll start making a diagram. And we're not gonna update. Fuck that. Okay. So what we have here is we have a here's kind of the constraints we have. I really wish I could label a box in like the top left. Maybe if I use a square, I'll use a square box and then ASDF, uh, I want my font size to be larger. How do I, is there a way for me to globally set my font size? Otherwise I can just zoom, I'll probably just do that. We'll just zoom in and I should be able to do ASDF, okay. So we'll just build our diagram zoomed in. And then here, this is um, property. Okay, vertical line, top. Oh, that's for the image. Text align. Where's the text? Here we go. Boom, this. Okay. So this is, go to the next tab. I got it. I found it. Finally, uh, what OS do you use? This is uh, Debian, straight Debian. Uh, I remember when I had to learn MIPS in college, my teacher never taught us strings. Oh man, what? <laughs> huh, so you never learned like null terminated strings? That's kind of interesting. I mean, maybe it taught you the, the better way of doing it, which is a array and a length, <laughs> the rust way. I always wanted to write a kernel for educational purposes only, um, but I'm always putting it off because there's so many things to do. See, that's the issue is writing a kernel is really, there's really not that much to do. Um, when you write a kernel, the sky's the limit and the core of the earth is the floor. Whatever you want, whatever you want to say there. But like, you can technically make a kernel that doesn't even have a memory manager. It doesn't handle virtual memory. It just like uses some static buffers and physical memory and assumes that that physical memory is free and available for use. And then inside of there, you maybe print to a serial port. That's totally acceptable. There's no reason uh, kernels have to have all of the standard technologies that people consider. You don't need a memory manager. You don't need threading. You don't need scheduling. You don't need priorities. You don't need interrupts. You don't need drivers. You don't need serial port. You don't need display. There's so many things that you can omit to make the kernel your own playground where you do whatever you want. Hey, Flask, how are you doing? Um, I think you mentioned something about uh, bio stuff before. Is there a stream about that somewhere? I, I did that work like five or six years ago before I did any public work. So public work that I did, um, public work that I, I didn't really do any public work until I released my Falk Advisor code, which was, is that a year ago? It was like a year and a half ago. So basically, I, I had no public presence until about a year and a half ago. Like, I, I had a Twitter and a Facebook and stuff, but I, I never actually outreached to the general public. It was only for friends. Um, so all of that old work that I've done, I've never made public. But yes, I did do some BIOS development where I uh, flashed onto my BIOS chip on one of my Z600 machines, um, and I made the BIOS just beep upon boot. Um, and that's kind of part of my obsession with going lower and lower level because the x86 BIOS post times for my sh my machines is really long. It's about, it takes about two minutes for my main server to get through the BIOS and it takes a millisecond for the processor to actually execute code. So I kind of had this grand idea that instead of doing OS dev, I'd just do BIOS dev and I would implement a BIOS implementation uh, that would get access to basically memory and the PCI bus. And then I'd use that in instead of an operating system, and I would be able to boot instantaneously into that. Um, but I never I never got to that. How's working for the laser jump out? I'm sorry, man. But you you're saying like some random stuff. I'm gonna time you out for 24 hours. I'm sorry. I'm glad you're a sub. I'm glad you show up all the time, but you're always answering 
people's questions or always trying to correct people with incorrect things or like like here co correcting Godling when he asks a valid question. So I will be happy to see you in 24 hours, but if you keep it up, I will have to ban you. I'm really sorry. I hate having to do that. But every time I'm looking over at chat, I'm seeing some ramblings about like math or things that don't relate or answering questions on my behalf uh, and typically like an incorrect way. And I, I, don't, I don't like that. I'm sorry. I got to put my foot down. Okay. So here we have this system. Um, we have a whole system here. And inside this system, this is where our kernel is running, right? Uh, so let's say we have, yeah, we'll put our kernel in here. That's pretty easy. And this is running on all the cores of the system. I don't know a great way to describe this, but let's, let's put some NICs in here. So we have, let's say we have an E1000, which is a one gigabit Intel NIC. And then we have an X540, which is a, a 10 gigabit NIC. And you know what? To make this even more complex, let's add another. <laughs> Every programmer has a Picasso phase. <laughs> we'll have an E1000E. Uh, one gigabit NIC. We got an E1000, which is a one gigabit NIC. So we have this situation where these are connected. I think I can zoom out to that level and it's still readable on stream. And let's say that we have a switch here. Uh, what are the hotkeys? I should know. Um, what are the hotkeys for these? There's got to be hotkeys. Still readable? Sweet. Good to know. Extras. All right, well, we'll click it. So you got a switch number one here. And we'll line that up there. Oh, yeah, we're making good diagrams now. And this is switch number two. Okay, so, uh, that, let's say that both of these are plugged into these network cards, or that switch, and that's plugged into that switch, and basically, what we need to do is we need to manage this situation where this E1000 is connected to this switch, this is on this switch, this is to another switch. This is actually a common system configuration that I have in my own network, where I have two gigabit NICs on the motherboard, and then I have an X540 that I slotted into a PCI bus uh, that goes to another switch. So, um, Okay, gotta make a straight line, I'm losing my mind there. Well, it doesn't want me to use a straight line because it wants me to, it wants me to go in at that location. Oh boy, I'm, I'll try to fix it. Well, that's not what I wanted. Yeah, maybe if I just, maybe here, we'll try this. Oh boy. Hey, I don't know how I did that, but it worked. Hold shift. Okay, yeah. Oops, don't want that. If I hold shift, it actually goes to the center. So I think I... It kind of snaps. Kind of snaps. But in some situations, it doesn't seem to snap. Anyways. <laughs> Anyways, we fixed it. We did it. So we've got our kernel running on this system. And there's multiple cores. Um, I guess we can put the cores in here. 
because that is something that I want to actually note. And then this we can two front. Yeah, buddy. And we'll have a text core. Text up. All right. All right, there we go. Got a core, another core, another core. And we got a kernel. We'll front this kernel. All right, and then we'll color these in. This. Okay, and we'll make these colored, and we'll make this a different color. This, this. I just love diagramming. I gotta say. Oh no, I don't like that those are touching. Oh, here we go. Fixed. Fixed. And then we'll have this here. All right. <laughs> diagramming is life. Um. All right. And we should color this differently. Ah, there we go. All right, so we have the system. We have multiple cores on the system. We have multiple NICs. These aren't associated with the cores, but I think the diagram makes that clear. And effectively, what we have to do is we have to manage all of these network cards. So we're gonna have a, we're gonna initialize all of them. So when we do a PCI enumeration, oh yeah, hell yeah. You, you know that we're putting PCI in here. Um, this, this, I don't want to two back that. I actually want to two front these and this, okay, text, boop, boop. And it doesn't seem to tell me that there's a format for that. This is PCI bus. So I got a PCI bus here. Oh, I got more colors. Fuck yeah. Ooh, gross. Mmm. Mmm. These are these are aggro colors. There we uh I, I do want to brighten it up a bit. Yeah, we'll put we'll make these cores orange. Um, and then the PCI bus will be this color. Okay. <laughs> Alright, so we have the System here, we have all the cores on the system. We have the kernel, which is on all of the cores. We then have this PCI bus, and we enumerate from the kernel um, all of these devices that we have here. So I'm going to, let's go draw an arrow. Uh, it's in move mode. I think I have to find one of these points. To insert an arrow, yeah, I gotta hover over one of these points. To front, control shift F. How do I move that point? Oh, we did it! Oh, and we can just move this arrow. Now, will that arrow be attached? No, neither of those are attached. I see. So you have to use one of those points. Can you create like an arbitrary arrow? Diagrams make things so nice when learning things? Absolutely. Control shift F, because I do want them to be attached. Ooh, we'll do that. We can move these cores up. There we go. There we go. Grab this point. F, F. PCI bus. We'll drag this down one. We'll drag this down one. Oh, that's a diagram right there. We'll drag this up one. Oh, that's good. That's good right there. Okay. So the kernel, and I think that's a little misleading because that makes it appear. I feel like that makes it appear that the that that's a specific core that has access. I'm going to do this. We're going to say this. Um, F, F. Okay, so the kernel has access to these cores. Uh, and has access to these PCI buses, and I want to actually move this down one more, which means I have to move these two down one, which then means I can move this up one. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, so here's what we do. We enumerate the PCI bus to find all of the network cards that we support. And when we find a network card that we support, we will initialize that network card and uh, bring it online. So that's what we do in our code in E1000. So the PCI code here, this is going to go through, when we call PCI init, this is going to go through every possible device on the PCI bus. And when we go through the PCI bus, we'll then ask the vendor and device ID of what is there. And then we'll send that vendor and device ID information. We'll read the whole PCI configuration header. Then we will send that information over to this probe routine for all of the drivers that we have. So for every driver, every driver that we have on the system, we will probe with that device. And if that driver handled it, it returned sum. That means that we found a driver for that device, in which case we push that device into uh, we push that into our array of devices that are initialized. So here we say that we only have a driver for E1000, and here's the probe routine for it. And that will cause this probe routine in E1000 to get invoked with that PCI device. And then in here we say, if that PCI device is one that we handle, then we will gladly return a new Intel gigabit driver for that device. And that will go into new, and this will get the PCI bar, it'll get MMIO space, it'll create these descriptors, it'll create the TX buffers, it will then initialize the network card, uh, set up the RX and TX lists, and then it will enable RX and T TX on those. Um, so once those are all set up, we then can send and receive on a network device that implements that. So we're definitely not gonna change that model. I'm very happy with that. Uh, that is pretty much perfect. There's nothing we really have to change there. The hard part is at a higher level. So let's go into, we're gonna break out one of these NICs and is there like a breakout thing? Like I want the dotted lines or like a magnifying glass to indicate like a breakout, break out. Something like that, or a, I guess we'll just use a triangle. Right? You guys okay with triangles here? Um, and we'll send this to, actually we'll change this to not have a fill. There we go. Actually, I kind of like the fill maybe. <laughs> you guys okay with triangle? You, you get a triangle. God damn it, I keep alt dragging when it's control drag. Okay, so now we have this and we'll break this out. And this is going to be a network card. Uh, actually, we'll just say, we'll do an arrow. We have arrows, we can use arrows. And we can say that this is a, and we'll dash this arrow. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Dude, I love draw IO, man. It's so good. It's so fucking good. So easy to work with. It's like everything is pretty intuitive to where I expect it. As long as it's not equilateral. <laughs> love the energy. Hell yeah. We, I don't know. Programming is just beautiful, man. And I don't mean that from like a... Programming itself is beautiful. What's beautiful is having machines do work for you. <laughs> it's made by people who write high-level languages. Ooh, ooh, gross. <laughs> Get that out of here. High-level? Ew. <laughs> Making computers do what you want. It's sick. It's OP. It's OP as fuck. <laughs> it's, it's really weird to say. And, and I, do, I don't want to downplay the responsibilities of a lot of jobs out there. But I feel like if I went into accounting, I don't know how to do any fucking accounting, but I'm pretty sure I could still potentially outperform an accountant because I would identify things that are automatable and I would be able to write large code bases that could automate them, even including like GUIs and whatever. <laughs> Save the file or give me anxiety. Yeah... Yeah, yeah, what is the name of this? This is chocolate milk diagrams. 
And this is a uh, network stack. There you go. All changes saved. This is also pretty cool if you enjoyed the handwritten feel, like Scala draw. Interesting. I'm really bad at drawing with my, uh... oh, this is actually pretty cool. So one thing that I, I will say that I really do like, oh, I see. I see the style that it's doing here. Sorry, I, I have this up on another screen, but it's basically, um... oops. Oops. There we go. Uh, it basically has like a slightly different style to it, where it looks like it's handwritten, I guess. But one of the biggest things is that Draw.io doesn't have to be a web app. Obviously, it's still just uh, Chrome. It just is a local install of Chrome. But it means that I don't have an online dependency, because I need to be able to do diagramming offline. If I lose internet, I can't lose access to all of my diagrams and slides and and all of this information. So it's important that it works entirely offline. Uh, low level guru, guru here, you work on HFT? I do not. Uh, I have done a lot of trading. I've never done HFT, but I am familiar with, with trading and fix and custom protocols and uh, how to like implement all of that. I've you know, like CME co-location and all of that. So I do a lot of futures trading, but I am not a professional trader. Um, but yeah, that's always been a passion of mine because there's a lot of data in trading. Okay. And when there's data, there are things I can optimize, which is really fun. Um, okay. But more specifically, I'm actually a security engineer. I'm a hacker, right? I find, I find security bugs in software and most of my tools are centered around finding security flaws in uh, programs. Okay. So this is a network driver, network card driver. And in this network card driver, we've got, uh, we'll mark this, oh, oh, that's aggro. Um, so I'm colorblind, so I have to be really careful with what colors I use. Because <laughs> sometimes I won't be able to recognize what they are. <laughs> Can we call you Elliot? I'm assuming you're referring to Mr. Robot. Um, uh, I mean, I, I'm not going to complain. I don't really get... I, I don't really get upset if people don't remember or say the wrong name or pronouns or whatever. I don't really give a shit because I, I'm i so bad with those things myself that I have to just assume that people are as bad at names as I am. So you can call me whatever. As long as the, as long as the context makes it clear who you're talking to, I'll accept any name. <laughs> it's just like I, I can figure it out from context. I'm okay with context. Whatever name you want. Chat still hasn't given me a nickname or anything. We don't have any inside jokes yet with chat, so there's a lot of stuff that we gotta do. <laughs> if we want to be streamers, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta up our game here. Okay, Mr. Noodles. You know what? As someone who has 50 pounds of noodles in my like pantry because I eat so many fucking noodles that that's like my go-to for almost any dish. Although now I've gotten into rice. I got a really nice rice cooker and it's really difficult to say. If I had to pick between rice and between pasta for the rest of my life, I don't know anymore. Two years ago, I would have definitely said pasta, but rice is so fucking good. So I don't know. We gotta, we gotta come up with a name for the community. Ain't that what streamers do? Uh, yeah, I guess, am I supposed to, am I supposed to do that? Or are we supposed to naturally get one? Um, so obvious pasta. Yeah. I think if I had to pick a specific noodle, I would go with rice. Because I think rice generically is better than a specific noodle of pasta. Because I, I change up pasta. You know, some days I'm, I'm in that rotini Mood. Some days I want that bucatini, and it varies day to day. What kind of what kind of pasta I want? Sometimes I want a fresh pasta. Sometimes I want a dry pasta so I can get that nice al dente crunch. But it varies. What kind of rice? Uh, I use short grain like sushi rice. Uh, typically, uh, I like my rice a little bit moist. 
I don't like it to necessarily be sticky, unless it is explicitly sticky rice, which is its own category. But I don't like my normal rice to be sticky, if that makes sense. Can't imagine doing Thai curry with pasta. Can you do, you could do Thai curry with like a rice noodle, I guess. Arguably. Hell yeah, Team Short Grain! You know what, I will say, and this is gonna be controversial, because, it, uh, controversial, because it seems like a lot of people don't agree with this. I fucking love wild rice. And a lot of people aren't familiar with wild rice. I think it's more of a Midwest or like Northern thing. I fucking love wild rice. It's so flavorful and so good. Um, but yeah, I typically do like a short grain uh, rice. I use uh, Seca rice. Um, and there's one other brand that I get for, actually I think Seca is my medium grain and then for short rice I forget which uh, brand I use. And then I love wild rice. Uh, if I'm doing desserts, I like sticky rice. And then, what else? Uh, what other rices do I like? I Jasmine rice. Is jasmine rice the... Jasmine rice is what you get with most Indian food, right? Is that... What's the, like, the super long, thin, usually, like, has some deformity to it rice that you get with, like, uh, Indian cuisine? I, I really like that as well. Um... Wild grains are so are good in general, yeah. Basmati, basmati rice, yes, there we go. Basmati rice is fantastic. If I'm doing a curry, I love a basmati rice. Although I've never done like a Japanese curry with a basmati rice. I always use my short grain when I do a Japanese curry. <laughs> Anyways, rice tangent aside. <laughs> now that we know what rice I like, uh, we can talk about network drivers. So in this case, we're going to have a NIC driver, and I'm going to want to put some text in here. Ooh, we need a color for these. Uh, we already used that. That's the same. Ooh, let's find some more colors. Mm. Oh, that's back at the start, I think. Whoa. Ooh. Ooh, we got gradients. Oh, those look tacky. I don't like the gradients with white. Because they look shiny. I do like the matte colors. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> now we got a camo here. This probably looks atrocious to anyone who's not colorblind. So this is the um, uh, raw transmit. And we have raw uh, receive. And... This is part of our, you know, we might as well just make this accurate to our Rust model. In which case, this Nick driver and this uh, impl, impl's net device. So that implements net device and net device. Uh, and we'll do this. We have the network driver. We'll make another box. This is going to be like the uh, Nick specific data. So we have, whoops, the network specific data, and that's going to be a uh, th that color. Yeah, because I don't like the camo of this. Uh, so we'll have raw transmit, raw receive. We're going to put this in a box. We're going to put these to front. And we'll put this, and this is the net device. Um, this is in the center top, oh, top left. This is the net device, uh, impl net device. So this has raw transmit, raw receive. And we can go up one on both of these. Oh. Okay, and that one will do yellow. Oh, that looks so bad. Those colors are not good. Light orange on military green. I love it. <laughs> okay. So we have the network specific data. That's part of the network driver. And then we have the impl of net device. And the impl of net device. So we'll enumerate that. The kernel will implement this. We'll have a network driver for this NIC. That'll implement net device, which will give us access to raw transmit and receive. We can actually probably condense this a little bit. Um, OK. 
Okay. Net device. And that also gives the ability to get the MAC address, but we don't really care about that. This down. Okay. We have the network specific data, and then we have the raw transmit and receive on those. And then um that's going to allow us to send raw packets and receive raw packets from that network card. So packets will go in, and here's what we can do. We can draw some lines. Fucking arrows. How do they work? Let's draw some arrows here, and then we'll draw an error arrow out of this. Um you know what? We're gonna we're gonna intersect that at this top point, and then we'll have this go to here, move that over, uh, front that, okay. And then these will change to like dot lines. Okay. So, the raw transmit and receive will go basically directly to that switch. Um, all right. There's always color hunt that CO, what is that? Ooh, oh, this gives you palettes. Oh, that's so nice. It gives you colors that work well together. Yeah, I'd really like for, I guess that might be what these palettes are. These might all go well together. And by us, by us switching the palette and using different ones, we might be breaking it, but whatever. Um, but I do like that site. That's actually really cool. Looks like me coloring things. You missed your calling. <laughs> Colorblind people try to do art. Uh, okay, now, this is... Uh, I guess this is the main palette, and we'll change this. There we go. Nick Driver. And here's what we have to do. We have to make a... I'm, I kind of want like a, I kind of want like a dot 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 on this. I think on this whole thing to indicate that there's like multiple of these. I need to stop doing alt drag. I'm so used to alt drag. I wonder what tool I used in the past that was alt drag. That that's what I naturally want to do. So control drag will pan. So then here and. Control move will copy. Okay, so this is a this is the network stack, um, and this gets relatively difficult because what we're gonna want are we're gonna want routines here that allow us to uh, like UDP TX and UDP RX. Now it's difficult of this. So that's the network stack, and then we'll say there's a user of the network stack here, and this is a program. And we'll put that to the top. So you have a program that is running in the kernel. We'll change that line to a, oops. Change this line to one of these. Okay. So the kernel has a program, and there are one or more programs, in which case, we're gonna say actually program A, we'll make a program A and a program B, because this will allow us to represent the problem that we have, which is that when packets come in, we have to know what network card to use, as well as, once we know what network card to use, we also need to figure out uh, we need to use like UDP ports or something to determine the packets. So we're gonna have this kernel. It's gonna go to these. Oh yeah. So there are multiple programs in the kernel. Um, and let's differentiate those. Whoa. There we go. So you have two different programs in the kernel. These we can actually make concrete because we're talking about concrete programs and we'll just give them the program color. Okay, so these programs and let's see, can I, whoops. 
I want these to not be at the same level as well. Okay. Um, all right, so the kernel has two programs. We have a network driver that's implemented for every single network card. Now, these programs, um, this is going to like, this program is going to be really complex. And this is going to get a NIC uh, that can route to x dot x dot x dot x, I think is what I'm going to do. Now, now is where we're like designing how we want this to work. So I think this will get a NIC that can route to x dot x dot x dot x. And what that would allow us to do is a program would basically say, I would like a connection with some random IP. And what this would do is this would go to the network stack. Um, and this is going to have, this is going to be identify, identify usable device. And this would be like round robin, go through devices, sending ARPs, uh, find usable device for an IPv, for an IPv4 IP, right? We're only doing IPv4 in this case. So this will identify a usable device for an IPv4 IP. We'd go round robin through devices sending ARPs using the NICs. Um, well, technically we know, do we know our subnet from DHCP? Yeah. Uh, round robin, go through NICs. Um, Yeah, go through go through devices. Round uh, round robin, go through devices. Then we're going to if device is on uh, if IP is on the subnet. Oh, we're also not doing internet routing. We're only doing local routing. So we're gonna ignore actually routing packets. Um, we're only gonna do local. So no routers allowed in this environment, which is fine, because we're not going to have any for what we're doing. So round robin, go through devices. If the IP is on the subnet, then send ARP for IP. If response, return network device. So I think that logic is relatively straightforward. And this allows us to have multiple network cards on a system, right? And we'll put these as uh, this color. So basically, the program will get a network card that can route to x.x.x.x. It will go through all of the devices in the device list, all the network devices. Go through all the network devices. If an IP is on the subnet, or if the IP is on the subnet, then we'll send an ARP for that IP address. If we get an ARP response, then we will use that network device. I think that's fair. And then that's, that's a doubly linked arrow. Um, how do I do that, actually? How do I change that in post? Oh, line start. OK. Nice. So that's going to. And I don't like the size of that box. Let's change that a little bit. We'll change this. Oops. Change this to go one out. OK. We got program A. We got program B. Get a NIC that can route to A. And then in this case, what we want to do is we want this to return a different network device than. OK, that arrow got fucked up. Okay, there we go. Get a nick that can route to that. We're going to do the same thing here and the same arrow. Doop. There we go. And we can move that over just a, sh a smidge, hopefully. No, nope, doesn't like that. Yeah, 
Anyways, so that will then get a nick, and ideally, these would get two different nicks, because we have two nicks that go to this switch. So ideally, what we would have is that this would get a different nick than this would get. And that means that we would be able to use gigabit on this and gigabit on this. And they wouldn't share the locks because the locks are going to be per network card. So, and that's what the round robin is. We'll go through the network devices. If it's on the subnet, we'll send that ARP, and then that will come through. Now, here's where it gets difficult, is if these both get the same network card, we need to somehow do raw transmits and receives, and this will say... Um, these network cards will have different requests. So one of them, this one's going to want uh, UDP on on 100, right? So that one wants UDP on 100, and this one wants UDP on... This one wants UDP on 101. Okay. Still, no problem. Super easy so far. But let's say that they get the same nick. If they get the same nick, we'll have a network stack here, and this needs to be able to handle, uh, let's say these go to UDP, and let's say they go to the same network, okay, so we have this network stack, we got a usable, usable device, that gives us a device. And in the situation where we get the same device, and I don't know how to represent this in a diagram, but let's say if they got the same device, then we're gonna have, let's say, uh, UDP. Um, UDP. All right? For IP, I think IP is automatic. Um, let's take a look at that. So we've got IP. And I think what we'll do is when we request a packet, so when one of these calls receive, um, and we need to move this line, there we go. So when one of these calls receive, we need to potentially buffer packets. And I don't know where we're gonna put those. So let's say that this program does a receive, uh, actually, we can just say that on the UDP. So we'll say rec v UDP 101. It wants a single UDP packet that goes to 101. So that's going to go to the UDP stack to do that. So it's going to say, I would like a UDP packet. Now, this network stack is going to be per, per NIC, I think. Well, these are going to be per NIC. Um, so I think we'll draw it like this. Something like this. Per nick. And then this one we'll do in a dotted line to indicate that there are multiple. Same for UDP. Uh, per nick. Per nick. And then here we'll have IP, which is per nick. And that's just the dot, 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 basically. Okay. So that's going to go to the per NIC UDP for that device. Now, this is going to do a receive. Now, here's where it all gets fucky. And this is why we wrote this whole diagram. First of all, we need a way of handling having multiple NICs. And I think we handle that by doing the round robin where we're going to get the network card that can route to that. Um, now, we might potentially want to have a way of specifying the speed. So if we have a 10 gig NIC, um, this would give us a method of prioritizing the fastest one. So, But we can implement that in the algorithm. The, the algorithm we use to select a NIC can be whatever we want it to be, no problem. So here's where it's difficult. This wants to receive a packet that was sent to the system. Now, an external system, which will be represented by this cloud, um, and this is an external system. So we have an external system, and this is connected 
to this switch. There we go. So you have an external system that is connected to that switch. And we'll give this a nice color. Yeah, not the same color as the switch. So you have an external switch system that, which is connected to this switch. And this is sending us a packet. And this is, uh, let's say this is sending UDP 101s. Now, this system cannot actually send us a packet because it's sending us, us an ARP. So what that's going to do is it's going to ARP for our IP, our OS IP, or more specifically our NIC IP. And then it's going to send UDP to NIC IP 101, right? So for that to work, it's going to send a UDP packet. But for that to happen, it needs to send an ARP. And depending on your network, there's something called a gratuitous ARP. Um, I think gratuitous ARP? No, I'm thinking remote ARP. Uh, a remote ARP allows something on the network to respond on behalf. But we can't assume that exists on this network. Um, so what that means is that this is first going to send us an ARP, which is basically a raw Ethernet frame. It's going to have a destination of a broadcast. It's going to have a source of the source MAC address. And then it's going to have an ARP frame. And ARPs are really simple. They're just the packet. Uh, let's see if it's actually in here. Yeah, here's an ARP packet. Um, you have the hardware type, protocol type, and some stuff that you use to communicate the IP address. So this is basically how you determine, um, this basically determines which IP to use. Because at this point, or which MAC address to use. So at this point, we have a, an IP address that we want to send to, which is the IP that this server is going to get over DHCP. But this system doesn't actually know how to send to that because it doesn't know the MAC address. So an ARP is used to resolve the IP address into a MAC address. So this is going to send an ARP, which will end up sitting in one of our receive buffers. So if our receive buffers are full, it'll drop that ARP packet. But if the receive buffer has space, we will have a, an ARP packet sitting in our receive buffer. So what we need to do when we want to receive a UDP packet, this will call... Um, and this is where it's kind of weird. Let's see if I can add some text into here. Yeah, we'll just add it here. We've got that. Yeah, proxy ARP is, is different. I think it's r remote ARP or RARP. Sometimes they'll call it. So this is going to have a... Um, this is going to receive a raw packet, right? If we're receiving a UDP packet, we have to receive a raw packet. And that's going to pop the most recent thing. Oops. That's going to pop the most recent thing off of the network card. Now, the thing is, that network queue, and we'll represent that with a cube. And this is like um, Rx raw packets, right? Uh, yeah, so we'll say this. Nice repo name, hell yeah. Isn't that good? High quality here. Okay, so this goes into a ring buffer queue. Nope, I don't want that to go there. I gotta zoom in, I think. There and there we go. Okay. So this is the like RX packet ring buffer. So the packets will come in from the network. They'll be placed on this ring buffer. And when we do a raw transmit or receive, um, yeah, I want to change that to link to there. OK. Then we have this ring buffer here. Packets will come in. They'll sit on here. It's one way. Uh, to no from. Yeah, there we go. Same with this, so no from, okay. So packets will come in, they'll be placed into this ring buffer. Um, and then if full, if full, uh, drop packet, right? So packets come in on the switch, 
if they're routed to here, which is either they are broadcast packets or they know the MAC address of our system, if it's full, they'll drop packet, and then we'll say, we'll, we'll mention that filter. Might as well. So this is the ring buffer. If full, drop packet. If des is broadcast or our MAC, um, then if full, drop packet. Oops. Else. Uh, store packet. Okay. Right. So there's our ring buffer. And now we'll point this in. Is that really the only edge that we have here? Okay. And we'll do this. No. Uh, maybe it is on that point. Okay. It totally is. This. And we can move that off of this point to here. Okay. All right. So, packet comes in from the switch. It is... That arrow is very broken. But I also don't want those to cross over, so we'll do this. Um, son of a bitch. All right, whatever. Uh, packet comes in from the switch. If the destination is broadcast or it's our Mac, then we will store the packet. Otherwise, if it's full, if this ring buffer is full, then we'll drop it. So what that means is that when we receive a raw packet here, we're not necessarily getting the raw packet we want. And there's a chance um, raw packet could be anything. Um, so what we'll say, if raw packet is UDP to our IP and port, then we return that packet, right? If the UDP is um, okay, if the raw packet is UDP to our IP and port, then return packet. Now here's where it's kind of weird: is there's a chance that let's say this device sent UDP 100 and UDP 101. So UDP 100 is sent. That is the first thing in the buffer. Then the next entry in the buffer is a UDP 101. We want to receive a UDP 101. Now if we, we will see first, we will receive from the NIC, we will see the 100 packet. And that 100 packet is not what we want to handle. We, we're looking for a 101 which kind of puts us in a predicament where now we have this packet that we didn't handle that someone else might want sitting in our hands. So what do we do about that? Where, where do we put that packet? Do we stuff that packet in somewhere in the network stack where we have a, like, we buffer up to like 64 packets for each different... Maybe we have a buffer of 64 packets for each UDP port that's been established, in which case we'll have to do something like a bind, which will allow the OS to know that that wants UDP packets, and it will register a data structure to buffer a certain amount of UDP packets before dropping them. That's one way to do it. How do we do that without copies? How do we reuse those buffers? There's, there's like so many different things we have to keep in mind. Um... So I think what we might do is this raw receive, this RX, these ring buffers will be packets. And those packets will have a physical address inside of them. And hopefully what this allows us to do is that we can just move the packet out of the ring buffer into this space. And if this doesn't like it, then it will give that back to the... Um, probably not to the ring buffer. It'll put that, it'll probably parse that packet and put it in a UDP slot if there's something listening. So I think that's the model we want to go with. How we do this with minimal copies is difficult, right? Because that's what we have to avoid. We have to avoid doing copies of the packet as much as we possibly can. 
So if we have copies of everything all over the place, we're losing a lot of our performance. So what we'll probably end up doing here is we'll have a, this is gonna be, um, this is like a packet storage or something like that. Since you're not using threads and only CPU cores, each core will only be able to access one UDP port? No, so they'll be able to access multiple UDP ports. <laughs> so that's another issue, right? We're gonna have, I've done that model before. I've done that model where I physically use the network filtering on the NIC to then redirect UDP packets to certain queues, and then the cores can access those queues without locks because it's guaranteed that no one no one else has access to that queue. It's, it's really weird, but it does work. It does actually work. But for these NICs, we don't have that many queues, so we're not going to assume that we can have a queue for every core on the system. Um, we can do that with more high-end NICs, but not with these. So what we're gonna have here, I think we'll have to bind. I think that's what we're gonna have to do. So I think um, we're gonna have like bound inside of here. We'll have like bound um, this will have like bound ports, right? And well, it doesn't really matter. The colors are just to differentiate. So the bound ports here, we'll say like uh, and then this will have. Um, port 101 goes to, in this case, uh, this will be like packets for, I don't know, maybe like 128 or something. So when someone binds a port, they will register here. And this is also where we can handle, yeah, so we'll say like bind UDP, that will then create a buffer for packet storage, which will go here. And then we will receive a raw packet from the NIC. If that raw packet is, if that raw packet is not what we want, if it is what we want, we just return it out. We return that packet directly back to the receive routine. So this has access to that packet. And then we're also going to have, um, Hmm. Um. Yeah, so these will have a fixed amount of packets. So if we get the packet we want, we'll return that packet back to here. If we don't get the packet that we want, then we will parse the packet still, because we already parsed it to figure out if it is what we want. If it's not what we want, then we will store that back into one of the packet storages for that specific port. That way, if another core receives, or if another UDP port, we get a packet for a different UDP port, we'll store it if it's bound. If it's not bound, we'll drop that packet, which will give it back to the ring buffer. Um... Yeah, I think that's pretty solid. And then we'll have a generic implementation here. So we'll have some drivers on here that handle all packets. We'll have like a packet filter, which will be like if raw packet is ARP handle, right? So before we actually return that raw packet out, if it's an ARP, then we will just handle it. Remember, a program can get raw access to these packets where it can just request a packet, but this is more for the actual whole stack. Um, so yeah, I think that's what we'll do, is this will say get a NIC that can route to this and then bind UDP. That will then cause this to get allocated in the bound ports, which will be a table. And then when we do a receive, it'll check this table. If this table is empty, then we will receive a raw packet and then return out that packet back to here. Otherwise, if this packet were not empty, then we will, if it weren't empty, then we'd pop a packet from here. So we'll implement, this will be a vec DQ. Um, 
and we'll probably put a limit on the size of that where it will start dropping packets. We can technically not put a limit on it and just let the system run out of memory. Um, but we'll probably make that fixed size. I think that's going to be the architecture. So you basically say, I would like to bind UDP 101. That'll find a network card that is able to route to that IP. I guess this will be like bind UDP 101. And that's the source. Don't you just receive uh, everything with your MAC address or addresses? The, the adapter is filtering. It'll give me broadcasts and things that are on my MAC address. Um, but yeah, I think this is the way I'm going to do it. So these, buff these packets will get buffered. No one will receive them. They'll just be sitting on the NIC until someone calls raw receive. The raw receive will be, will be responsible for either accepting the packet or rejecting the packet. If the packet is not what it wants, it'll get rejected, and then that will go to somewhere else in the network stack, which will handle rejected packets, which will then parse the UDP out of it, and if it's, a, if it's to a different bound port, we'll put the packet up into that storage. Okay. I think we can do this. I think we can do this. Um... This is really good. We can have limits on these. These packets, we will actually give these back. I think the entire receive pack, I think for the entire receive path, we can do it copyless, right? When we receive a packet, we're going to give it to the caller of receive. That will then return out a packet. Um... Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to hit the head. I'm going to get some wine. And then I think we'll just start implementing this. I actually really like this design. I think this will be really good.
Okay. So, um... I'm finding this discussion interesting, especially since instead of going uh, the route of... I'm used to making everything predefined and static, you go in the opposite direction and making everything dynamic. Yeah, so I... I need this to be able to scale pretty arbitrarily um, to many different servers with many different number of ports connected and many different things communicating to different servers. And there might end up <laughs> there might end up being packets being sent all over the place. So there's a good chance that I will end up saturating two 10 gigabit NICs with this stack. So it has to be capable of some pretty good throughput. Um, don't most network stacks work like this, with a packet uh, buffer per port, even if not bound? Uh, yeah, that's pretty much standard here. Um, in this case, the, the biggest difference between this network stack and pretty much any other network stack is that this does not allow for interrupts at all. So this network stack has to work if interrupts are disabled, uh, which I'm not aware of really any network stack that has that functionality. Obviously, it's possible because we're, we're theory crafting it. Maybe some like embedded devices. Um, but this has to work without interrupts. And what that means is you have to be able to give packets back to the NIC. And then there's another part that is quite different here in that this has to be zero copy. This means that when someone requests a UDP packet here, that no packets got copied, not a single byte gets copied. Obviously, there's like metadata in like the actual call I'm pushing to the stack, but no byte from the original packet gets copied into a new buffer or a different buffer or reordered or whatever. Um, basically, this is going to get raw access to the packet that was here. So when you call raw receive, this is going to give you ownership of the packet. It is then on you to give that ownership back. Now, luckily, in Rust, we can actually implement that ownership model by giving out a lease to the packet. And that guarantees that the network card will get access to that packet once that, uh, once that lease is complete. <laughs> um, wait, network stuff usually uses interrupts? Like to tell the CPU, hey, I've got a packet. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's pretty much the only way. Otherwise, the CPU has to check it on a timer or on demand. But yeah, very frequently it'll be based on interrupts because the kernel will have to the kernel will not know what process because the the processes right on like a standard system the processes are going to bind they're going to receive receive as blocking that's basically going to put them their threads in a state that's saying I'm waiting for a packet from this, but the kernel pretty much has to parse every single packet that comes through to then see if it needs to wake up that thread to deliver a packet to it. It pretty much requires uh, interrupts in almost any network stack. Not sure about at that level, uh, but I worked with one that wouldn't allow interrupts, but I worked with an app up in a VM. Was that like a, a kernel level thing? Because in user land, yeah, for sure. Not allowing interrupts is, is totally easy. But in kernel land, it's very difficult because basically if you have a network stack that doesn't allow interrupts, you cannot have task switching in your kernel effectively. You'll need to like permanently block a thread on waiting for that receive. And that's basically what we're gonna implement. <laughs> uh, or you'd need to make all callers non-blocking which is what we're gonna do. So all callers to receive will be non-blocking, which means we can return out, hey, don't have a packet for you right now. Copy list here, meaning your kernel doesn't move stuff out of the NIC. Uh, in this case, the, the raw packet will be given directly to whoever received it. So like the physical and virtual address that has moved into the NIC, that the NIC DMAs the packet into, that buffer will be given directly to the receiver. Which is pretty interesting. It's a very, uh, a very interesting model, and we're going to enforce that using Rust with uh, drops. 
So, but yeah, we'll have uh, zero copy this whole this whole path. Um, you could pull in the idle thread for C packets. Once all threads block, the idle thread gets executed. You can handle network stuff. Yeah, that works, but there's typically not... It's hard to get good latency if you go to an idle thread. But yes, that is a model. If you're saying that that's a model that you could use, yes, absolutely. Um, have you heard of an API for Linux? I have not. What is it? The new API? Interrupt mitigation techniques for networking devices. I see. Reduce the overhead of uh, packet receiving. Oh, uh, this is slightly different. Um, this will use network cards to basically load reduce the uh, interrupt request numbers, but it's still going to do IRQs, I'm pretty sure. It can periodically check for new arrival without being interrupted. Yeah, so it'll basically tell the network card that to only interrupt it once every n packets comes through, and then probably, yeah, during halt or idle or something, it will then check uh, without the interrupt. Um, can you end up in a situation where your Rx buffer gets filled if the program does not give the packet back fast enough? Nope, uh, because we will move that packet out of the NIC, and in fact, that's what we're about to write. So we're gonna have a packet and a packet is going to be a physically contiguous allocation which can hold a packet. In this case, we're gonna do 2048. Um, this must be large enough for all of our network drivers to place directly in their ring buffers. This is a four kilobyte aligned allocation, and we'll just say 4K, to be honest, because it's gonna get rounded up anyways. Uh, four kilobyte aligned allocation and should work in any NIC DMA. So then this packet, um, so we have a packet here, we can create a packet. This is Ethernet EDP, we'll, we'll get to all this shit later. Then we're gonna have a struct, um, This will take a structure, we'll call this packet lease, I think. A and T. No. So we're gonna have a packet lease, and this is the owner. Mute, uh, mute dine. Um. Hmm. Mute dynamic dispatch of a net device. I think this is valid. Uh, a mute. Uh, dyn mute. Mute dyn. Mute dyn. Okay, that's valid. So, what we're going to do is the network card's actually going to return a packet lease. When we do receive. This is going to receive a raw frame from the from the network and return ownership of the raw physical buffer that was used uh, for the DMA of the packet. And this is going to return a packet lease, which is going to have a an A ref. Let's see if we can make sure these lifetimes work, but I'm pretty sure we can. Net device A. Impl A, net device for Intel G bit. Um, and then here, net device for A. Uh, actually, is that gonna work? Yes, I think it is. So then this will give an option containing a packet lease to there. And then we'll do, this will be pubstruct, uh, impl a packet lease a, 
fn new packet lease packet lease owner uh packets and then this will have an owner which will be a a mute dine net device a we're gonna have some weird lifetimes that we got to figure out here but uh, we can probably make this work Okay, so this is receive. That's going to call self-receive, which is going to have the same syntax. That'll return a packet lease. Um, net device has a reference. Hmm. I actually don't know if I'm going to do... No. That'll get the lifetime of the net device. So A must live for the length of the net device. Okay, I think we are doing this correctly. That's going to call A self-receive. Then we'll have receive. Receive a raw ethernet frame. We're just going to comment this out for now. And then we'll return none. And let's make sure this works. Um, and what if I if I do this? I don't think that's valid syntax. Yeah, I gotta declare that lifetime. So to do that, we will do impl a. Right? Or do we do that on the receive? Let's try it on the receive. I don't think this is going to work, but let's do none. Um, 376. 375. Expected. Doesn't match the trait item. I see. Um... We'll give it an A. Cannot infer the lifetime of the receive. I see. Yep. Yep. Can I? Let me see if I can do that. So that has. I think I have to put the lifetime, if I do this, impl a gigabit. I think that should work, because this will give a lifetime to this whole gigabit thing. Yes! Nice! Okay. <laughs> so, what this allows us to do is this will allow us to, um, this will take an fn release packet. Mute self, packet, and this will be, um, when the packet lease is done, give that back. So, when the network stack is done with a packet lease, it will give it back to the NIC that it got the packet from. This gives the packet... Yeah, so we get a packet lease from receive. So receive will give us a lease of a packet, and then we'll give that packet back to the NIC, and let's add a panic on that. We're gonna try and get this shit to work, but I think it should work. FN release packet, mute self, option. Uh, this will take a packet and we're going to move that packet ownership back here. Print got ownership of packet dot patter. We'll just print the physical address. Back. Got ownership back of this. Okay. 
And that is create net packet. And then packet. I think we'll make that pub, the raw payload, 3D4. And we're gonna get a reference to that packet. So we're not gonna be able to modify that packet. So we're gonna have to figure out lifetimes for this because we're returning back a packet and we're gonna need to track some of the parsing states of it. Um, also, let's get rid of this rec v, oops. I'm gonna get rid of this and we'll move this code to this actual rec v. We don't need two implementations. Okay, so uh, none, and that's gonna be payload. That's the physical address of the payload. And then 379, we're gonna actually give mute to that packet. When you give a packet lease, Yeah, so this will contain the packet. So we'll get ownership of that packet. And then at 379, uh, the pattern is, oh, fizz. Get the physical address of the payload of the packet. Okay, so now receive is returning none. So we will attempt to receive a packet. It will return none right now, but we want to actually change that. And this will return a packet. Um, Rx buffers. This is gonna be a packet. And then we'll have packet new, impl packet fn new, Packet uh, creates new physical storage for a packet. And then this, we can do packet. And then everything's based around this packet, which will be really nice. Packet payload is equal to a fizz can take new of an OU8 4096. Okay, new physical storage for a packet. Now at 355, um, and both receive and transmit are gonna use packets. Honestly, are we gonna have a buffer for those? Maybe. I think these are gonna be option packet. Um, if there is currently a vacant descriptor at that location, at if there's currently a vacant, vacant descriptor corresponding to this entry, this will be none. So transmit will actually give ownership of a packet to the NIC, and then it will give it back to us, I think. Uh, actually, we'll probably give it a reference to a packet. Because um, we want to be able to reuse on the transmit side of things. Fuck. Well, let's, we'll figure out the transmit side after. The receive side is, I think, easier. So to receive, this will get a packet lease. Check if there's a packet to be read. If there's no packet to be ret read, return zero. Then get the length of the Rx buffer, and then we're going to um, self.rx buffers, self.rx head dot set len to um, Rx. And that's gonna be on packet. So we'll have a pub fn set len mute self, and this will uh, set the length of the internally held payload. And this will have len, this will be u size at zero, start out at zero. So we'll allocate it, it'll be zero. Create a new packet. 
Then we'll have length. And this is the uh, size of the payload member in bytes. So this will set the length of the internally held payload. It doesn't matter if we end up exposing old data. So this will just do self.length is equal to um, this will take a length. This will be equal to uh, how do I make sure that's in bounds? I'll do this. Assert len is less than or equal to self.payload.len uh, set len on um, packets out of bounds. So assert that the length is less than or equal to the payload length, and then we'll just set the length. Okay, 214. That's here. Rx buffers expect destructive packets. Yep. So what we're going to do. We're going to make the Rx buffers allocate a packet. And then we're going to give the physical address of that packet self.back, rxbuff.backing, oh, dot packet. No. Payload. Uh, I might say raw. Yeah, I'm going to rephrase that to raw. I like that a little bit more. Uh, packet. I can only help bytes. And then this will do raw. And that's going to get the physical address of that, 366. Oh, and that's raw. OK, and now we just have Rx. In this case, what we're going to do, clear the status to put the buffer back up for lease. So previously, we were doing a copy out of that old buffer. And what we're going to do is I'm going to restylize this code. We're going to read volatile, get, get the length, uh, set the length of the uh, packet, and then we don't want to put the buffer up for use, so we'll need to have a rx tail, I think. Um, we have to track our like internal head. So we don't want to put it up for use. We don't want to let the Nick use this. We can bump the RX head. Um, no, I think we want to have a, a tail. So there we check that bit. If that bit is set, then we'll bump the tail. Ah. Uh, Shit. Read this. Uh, we don't have a tail right now, so I think we'll have, yeah, we'll make a Rx head. Current index of the receipt buffer that is next in line to get a packet from the NIC is going to be Rx tail. And then Rx head. This is the current index of the receipt buffer, which is. Um, which is empty head. Current index of the first receive buffer, which is empty. So that'll start at zero. The tail will be zero. When we see a packet, we'll check the tail. Oh, Rx head will actually be 
the last entry in the list. Have you tried Cargo Watch to spray some keystrokes when compiling? I have not. I'm guessing every time you save the file, that'll rebuild it. I oversave files, so that would be a little bit annoying, because I will I will typically save a file many, many, many times before it's actually ready to build. But that does sound pretty neat. I would have to adjust my workflow for that. Current index of the first receive buffer, which is empty. And I think that's the tail for the nick. We're kind of switching those terms around. So I think what we'd probably do is current index of the C buffer, which is next in line to get a packet from the NIC. And this is Rx tail. And this is the current index of the packet in the Rx ring, which is not initialized for use. Right? So we'll bump the head. When we get a receive, we'll bump the head, but we won't bump the tail. Okay, so I'm gonna put an assertion in here. We'll check the head. If the head has something, or if it doesn't have something, we return out. Otherwise, get the length of the receive buffer, set the length, Bump the Rx head, and then bump the Rx tail. Uh, we don't want to do that. So the tail stays the same. And then we insert packets at the tail. I think that's how that's going to work. So at 2.14, Rx tail is equal to the... It's what we literally write to the tail, which is this minus one. So the number of descriptors minus one. Uh, Rx descriptors minus one. Okay. Honestly, I think I just create packets out of thin air. I might want to make like a packet free list that holds packets such that I can get a packet cheaply. We'll take a packet and then I wouldn't actually give it back to the Nick. Shit, I think that's correct. That's going to return a packet lease. And then we wouldn't have a lifetime on the packet lease. So I could have, I could basically have the packets be stored on the NIC or on the networking subsystem, which would be per core. Yeah, I could have a pre -core, per core free list. Nah, I don't want that. I want it to be on the NIC. That way you don't have to get another lock. Um, okay. So this is going to return. Yeah, we don't need that tail. Bump the Rx head. Keep that as is. Okay, so we have the head. We check the head. And then here we're going to... Um, this is clear. Uh, this is going to... Uh, clear the status to put this uh, descriptor back up for use. Let the nick know this buffer is available again, uh, available for use again. Then we're going to bump the rx head. So clear the status, and then here we're going to allocate a new packet for this descriptor, and then we'll do self dots. Uh, allocates packet. And this is going to 
go into self.rx descriptors. Um, yeah, we're going to allocate a packet. And then we're going to do a make that mute. And we're going to do a core pointer swap or mem swap. Mute new packet with the mute self.rx buffers self.rx head. Allocate a new packet for the descriptor. Swap in the new packet in place of the old packet um, in the buffer list. So that'll keep it around because we don't want to actually end up dropping that packet. Um, and then, yeah, we'll do this all in line. Allocate a new packet for this descriptor. In fact, we want to do that ASAP as possible. So we'll get the length right away. Um, get the length. Allocate a new packet for the descriptor. Swap in the new packet in place of the old packet in the buffer list. Then at this point, we can do a set the length of the packet. And here we'll do a packet.setlen. So we got the length. Let the nick get that. Bump the rx head. And then set the length of the packet and return the packet out. Uh, at that point, that is up for use. We bump that. So basically, we try to get the nick. We try to get a new packet in that ring buffer as soon as possible. Um, wow, this is actually really cool. I like this. I like this swap if it works, which I think it will. Uh, this is not new packets, just packets. So we allocate a packet. We then swap those. Uh, 377 packets. Expected a packet lease, found a packet. Allocate packet, expected packet lease, found a packet. Um, yes. We want to give a packet lease of the packet. And... Um, oh, can we use the nick when we have that mute ref on it? Fuck. I don't think we're going to be able to use the nick while we have a packet lease out. Is that okay? Do I ever want to have multiple leases out at once? Maybe. Hmm. A packet will have owner, which is self, which has a mutable reference to ourself. And then allocate packet, we're just going to do, we're just going to hack that in right now. And we'll just say packet new. We're just going to create a whole new packet. Cannot infer lifetime for that. Okay, now we're running into the complex part. Impl A. First, this lifetime cannot outlive the anonymous lifetime of the body of this. Um, so can't infer an appropriate lifetime for the automatic conversion due to conflicting requirements. The lifetime cannot outlive the anonymous lifetime of the body. I think I can explicitly amute that. Lifetime mismatch. 
found that, expected, found. Okay, can we change that on net? Ooh, private field. Fuck yeah. Make these pub. I think we, we might have did it, guys. <gasps> Holy shit! So now we can... Oh, we have a new packet lease. Okay. Self packet. Uh, return out a lease to this packet. So packet lease is just a wrapper. That contains the pointer. This is pub. Okay. So... I think as long as I'm not using that, I think I'm fine. And that will allocate a new packet, put it up for use. This will drop that packet. It won't put it back up into a free list. Okay. Okay. I think we did it. Kind of. So we have a... Got a packet. When we do receive, we check if we have a packet. If we don't have a packet, we return none. We'll get the length of the packet that was received. We allocate a new packet. We swap in that packet in place of the old one, keeping the old one around. We then write the status as zero because we put this one up for use in this slot. We update the nick head pointer, or that's technically the tail. Then we bump the head, and then we set the length of the packet and we return out that packet. So we basically swap in a new packet. We, we had a packet, we put a new packet in its place and say that the Nick can write a packet to there so it doesn't overwrite the old one. And then we grab that old packet and we give that out as a lease to who called receive. And then when they drop that packet, it should call release packet, which will then give ownership of that packet back to the network card if we were to want to use it. That allows us to maintain a free list so we don't have to allocate new packets every single time. Okay, so print. All right, so now we gotta make something that is able to get a network device. Um, can I do receive here before I return the nick out? I think so. I'm gonna do, um, this is just test code. Uh, nick.receive, so I'll receive a packet. Oh, that should work. Packet is equal to this. Print rx a packet x packet.raw uh, fizz adder um, packet raw fizz adder dot zero. So this will print the physical address of the packet we rxed. Uh, ooh. I think we want the packet lease to appear. So we'll do impl a deref for packet lease a target, oops, type target is equal to a packet, fn deref self return a ref to self target, and then we can just do a, uh, ref self dot packet and then we can do that for mute as well so this will make packet lease behave as if it is a packet and then we, all, all we have at this point is just wrapping it up and we just got to pull in use core ops deref deref mute uh, deref under mute Okay, so then raw, we don't have that. This is going to print the physical address of the packet. Uh, can I do dot raw? Oh. Loop. Because it's non-blocking. If let some packet 
If we got a packet from the network card, print the address of the packet. Yes! Reset. Okay. RX to packet, and it's printing the addresses. Nice. Nice. Now, now we need to impl a drop for packet lease a fn drop mute self, and we'll call on the owner release packet. Um, self dot packet. Um, move occurs. Ooh, ooh. I can't move out of there because I'm in a drop, and that's a mutable reference to self. Um. So I could put that in a none, or an option. And this is uh, uh, option. That's only wrapped in an option so that we can drop it by doing this. Um, packet dot, uh, fuck, what is it to get an option and replace it with a none? Um, I forget, I forget. Take. So we'll take that out, that'll replace it with a none, and then we'll unwrap it. It should never be none when we get to this drop, so we don't have to worry about that. Then deref mute, this is just uh, a packet as mute, unwrap. Like that, new, that field's only none in the drop state. As ref, unwrap. And then here we're going to take it out, and then we're gonna pass it back to there, and then this needs to be a packet is some packet. Okay, so this should print rx and drops. Yes! Okay, so that means that we received a packet, and then we gave that packet back to the network card. We basically said, hello, network card. I seem to have had a packet that you gave to me. Okay, so let's do packet a is equal to nick.receive. Now, I think this is going to fail. Packet a, packet b... And I want this to be if packet B, actually packet A, and I think this fails because it's borrowed here. Because we need a mutable reference to our network card. Is it okay if we only allow one packet borrowed at a time? And I think the answer is yes. Is there any situation where I'm not gonna process one packet at a time? I'm pretty sure I can make this be fine. Um, yeah. And then we also need a packet lease. I think when we send, we give the packet to the network card. Is there ever a situation where I don't need two packets? And I don't think so. I think this is acceptable. The problem is while after receive, the network card is borrowed until I explicitly drop the packet, giving it back to the network card. Um, kernel is just routing a packet from the network card to the program. So one at a time shouldn't be any performance issues. Yeah, that's what I think. My, my only concern is if, if there's ever a point where I need mutable access to the network card while this is given out, and I don't think so. So I might call nick receive. I might call, I can't do a send at this stage. Well, I can do here, because it will actually move that lifetime. It'll do a non-lexical lifetime. So I should be able to send B ASDF, and that should work. Okay, I do need to explicitly drop that, but I can do a core mem drop 
packet A. Oh, um, it's dropped up there. Uh, oh, that's interesting. It's actually no lifetime on that, but Russ is kind of confused about that. But yeah, we'd probably do stuff like this, where you do a nick receive, and then when we're done with that packet, we will give it back to the network card, and then we'll send these A's. I don't think those A's will actually send through because it's not a valid packet. Nevertheless, um, there we go. So you have packets coming in, continue without saving. Yeah. So those ARPs are going out, and then we can give that packet back to the network card, which requires mutable access to the network card. Uh, we could potentially relax that by having an atomic vector on the network card. So we can always relax this if we need to, but I think this is the model that I want. So yeah, now the network card will literally receive into that buffer, and when you call receive, it'll just hand you, it'll just hand you the packet that was read into, and then when you're done with that packet, Rust will automatically give that packet back to the NIC. And in this case, we will just have a buffer um, packets. And this is just a packet free list of packets. And now, up here where we do packet new, we can do um, self dot get packet or like allocate packet. Blank doesn't matter. And then on this, we can do fn allocate packet mute self packet and this is allocates a new packet for use and then we can do self dot packets dot unwrap or packet new so if the free list is empty oh pop pop something from the free list if we were unable to get something from the free list then we literally allocate a new packet and then free packets We'll just push that, and we'll do uh, release packet. We'll do, oops, self.packets.push packet. And this will put the packet back into the free list. So now we'll reuse those packets, and we won't cause allocate free thrashing. Um, 213 packets is a vec new. Actually, we'll do with capacity um 128 and then down here we'll say if packet dot len is greater than or equal to or is less than packet dot capacity uh, push the packet into the free list and then here we'll say if we have room in our free list push the packet into it otherwise Otherwise, we'll just free the packet entirely, putting it back up uh, for use for the whole system, right? So, we have packets, which is a vector of packets. We allocate with a specific capacity, which starts out as 128. Well, it's always 128. Then... When we call allocate packet, we will pop the last thing we added to that vector. If it was none, then we will allocate a new packet from the system allocator. If, and then once we will give out leases to that packet, and when the lease is expired, if we have room in our free list, the length is less than the capacity, meaning we won't cause a reallocation of the free list, which won't thrash and allow for like an arbitrarily sized free list. We just cap the free list. Once we have 128 free packets based on the capacity that we set, uh, we will just drop the packet because this function will return. Packet will go out of scope. We didn't move it into anything. And at that point, packet will get freed into the system free allocator. Okay. Uh, Self.packets.capacity. And then this is uh, self.packets.len. 
If it's less than the capacity, then we know that it's not going to move that and overflow it. So now we should be able to see the same addresses will get repeated um, when we do this allocation. So if we reset, we should eventually see um, some of the same addresses get used. And let's see if we see that 38. I think we have pretty large free lists right now. Yeah, I think we're using, we're gonna switch these to eight. The TX and RX descriptors, 216. Okay, so we have some hard-coded numbers somewhere. Num RX desks. Oh, num TX desks. Aha, uh -huh, perfect. Um, expected. I see. Num RX desks. Num TX desks, and we'll make sure that everything is correct by doing. We'll do one at 16 and one at eight. Okay. Now we can reset. This will have eight descriptors. We'll give out a packet on a receive. We'll then pull that out. And yeah, it's using the same packets. It works exactly as I expect. That's not causing traffic to the system allocator, which means we're not constantly allocating and freeing new things over and over and over again. So we're reusing packets. Um, and they go back to who allocated them, which is fantastic. So now that allows us to have a free list for each network card. Okay, now packet, I can implement parsing routines on that Dude, it's happening, it's happening This is uh, uh, create a new packet lease with owner as the owner of the packet uh, When this packet lease goes out of scope, the owner will be given the given the owner will get the packet back. Okay. So this is the owner of the packet. Um, and then this is the packet that was leased out. And this is a a lease of a packet. This allows Rust-based drop handling to allow a NIC to get access back to a packet it leased out during a receive. Uh, receive. Uh, when a drop occurs on a packet lease, and we'll say drop with a capital D, when a drop occurs on a packet lease, the packet will be given back to the owner of the packet via the release packet um, via the net device release packet uh, function. Okay, and drop, release packet, take that on wrap. Nice. Um, the packet is wrapped in an option just so we can move it out of the uh, uh, packet lease during the drop handler for the entire existence of the packet lease this will always be a sum value and thus unwrap is safe is safe okay so now that's documented why that quirk exists Okay. Bam. Have you liked project? How have you liked uh, Rust on a project like this? It's the only language I would do a project like this in. It's just, it's just so fucking good. It, for for something like this, it's just you you really can't get better than Rust. Like having this automatic drop handling stuff that we have right now is unreal. And then I'm gonna change this to use a broadcast just so we don't end up scaring ourselves but um like in this case what we do is when you receive from a network card we literally give you 
the DMA buffer that the network card used to receive that packet, and we give it to whoever called receive, and Rust can guarantee that the network card gets that packet back when you're done with it. It's so cool. Existence is... Existence? Yes. Yeah, it's not ants. Wait. It's this. Wait, is it? Existence. Yeah. Okay, anyways. Um, so we will RX those packets. We'll give them back to the network card. And that means our receive path, we did it. Our receive path no longer has a single copy. This is what we do. We read some memory. If it says that that packet exists, or if, it, if that packet does not exist, we return it out. Then we'll read the length of the packet that was received. We'll allocate a new packet, which will use a packet from the free list. So that's literally updating a length on a, a vector. We swap in, we, we swap the new packet with the old packet. Um, we then clear the status to put it up for use. We let the network card know that this buffer is available for use again. We bump the RX head internally and set the length, and then we return out the packet. So yes, we now have a copyless um, receive uh, path. Really fucking cool. We did it, Dora the Explorer. My contribution to the stream is popping in every couple of days, correcting meaningless typos. Hey, hey, someone needs to learn the English, and it ain't gonna be me. I can tell you that much. I would be too afraid to advance my reading level past the fifth grade level. That would not be very American of me. <laughs> okay, that, that totally fucking works. God damn. And we got all the lifetimes and everything right. The irony is I'm German. <laughs> I, I bet most ESL people probably know English grammatically better than others. They might not be able to do it quickly, but they probably understand the rules better because I never learned the rules of the English language. I never had a class where I was taught verbs versus nouns versus pronouns. I think most people did. So I switched schools growing up, and I think what happens is I switched from a school that taught like did reading in fourth grade and then did English like mechanics in fifth grade and I think I swapped schools to one that basically ended up with me reading in both fourth and fifth grade so I never actually like formally learned like what a fucking adjective versus a proper noun versus a noun is actually pretty weird it's a it's a big hole in my uh it's a it's a big hole in my knowledge but hey it's it hasn't been a big problem <laughs> I can always look at if I really need to know I can always look it up right Aw, oh. Napalm, how do you like my uh, uh, copyless receive networking stack? I failed my grade school grammar. If it, if it sounds good, it is good, the way English works now. Yeah, it's pretty accurate. I mean, that's how all languages kind of have always been, except for languages that have a uh, an overseeing body. So, like, some... Some languages, I think like French and Spanish, have overseeing bodies. English does not. So no one is like managing the English language. Like Oxford and Webster's are, are third party dictionaries versus uh, I think like French and Spanish have official dictionaries that are by like the Council of French. <laughs> English is so inconsistent, hard to say it as rules. English is the language of the common folk. The people who say, fuck the system. I don't, I don't need you telling me what to do. I can, is, and do what I want with my own language. Damn it. <laughs> French does have an overseeing body, but that's only because they don't want the language to become bastardized with loan words. Yeah. I mean... English is 
arguably the language of no culture, right? And I would say that French, there's still a large culture around, like, preserving your French heritage. No one gives a fuck about English heritage. Like, no one cares. In fact, if you say that, people are going to look at you like you're a little fucking weird. But, like, look at that in, like, Montreal and, and Quebec in uh, Canada. They still require that if you are, like, a waiter or waitress, that you must talk to someone in French first because they're trying to preserve their French heritage. They're trying to forcefully keep French in their culture, which I would argue is not culture because if your culture requires that you force people to do something, I wouldn't really say that culture is really being dictated by what people want to do at that point. It's uh, being enforced as like preserving some old norms because uh, I think culture needs to be fluid. So it's kind of really weird. <laughs> Ultimately, I don't really give a shit, but I, I do think it is kind of strange to try to maintain a culture by not allowing the culture to grow. <laughs> Obviously, it's not that strict, right? Obviously, there's still a lot of flexibility in it, but... Uh, so, I thought that was in Quebec only. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, it's just Quebec... Um, but yeah, it's it's just interesting. It, it's people who are interested in their fr French roots, which is which is really cool. I think that's great to like have that appreciation. But I also don't think it's worth like forcing. I don't know. I think the whole concept of like a national language, national religion is just kind of pointless if you can just just let the people decide. If like if the U.S. wanted to go ninety percent Muslim next week, like fine. Like, who fucking cares? <laughs> we don't recognize religion here nationally. We're not supposed to. Um, obviously, we still do. Quebec is a province. Yeah. It's not throughout all of it. Parts of Montreal and others don't. Yeah. I love Montreal. I will say Montreal is my favorite city in the world. I haven't traveled too much. I haven't done, like, a massive amount of traveling. But uh, so far, Montreal is one of my favorite, favorite cities I've ever been to. And it's so cheap. The rent in Montreal is so fucking cheap. You pay like shitty 50,000 person town in US prices for rent in a major metropolitan area. I uh, There's probably a reason. It's probably like that the taxes are much worse or like property taxes are much worse and like somehow you get fucked in the end. But I've looked at like houses there as like a vacation home or something. Oh my god, dude. You can get like a nice flat for like 250 to 300k US. Uh, okay. So packet's coming in. Now, let's get our TX side figured out how we want to do that, how we want to pass the ownership of that packet. And I think on the TX side... I think we'll actually have an Alec packet from the Nick. But then we can't call send when we have that. Um, when it's done with the packet, Lisa will give it back to the Nick. And I guess where I'm using the network card, I actually will allocate my own packet. No, I need a way of allocating a packet out of here because that's going to put it in its free list. Unless we give it a packet lease, but we don't want all the callers to be doing that. So we're going to say allocate packet, mute self, packet. This will return a packet. Uh, get a packet from the uh, Nix uh, packet free list. Um... This allows us to give ownership of a packet during the send process, which the NIC can then use for whatever it needs. And we can get back packets from the NIC when we need a packet. The NIC is responsible for creating a new packet via packet new when... Um, it 
does not have a packet, uh, a, a free list. And then what we can do is we can generic implement this, and we can say packet new. Um, by default, create a new packet out of the global heap. And then this will uh, release a packet. Uh, by default, uh, do nothing with the packet, causing it to get freed back to the global heap. Uh, global allocator. So that way, if you're writing a network card, those will automatically get implemented for you as this will just create it out of the global heap or the global allocator and this will just, um, and this will just free it by not doing anything with it, which will cause it to get dropped. But if you make a free list in your network card, which you should for maximum performance, um, then you would implement those. Uh, so what we'll say is uh, by default, oh uh, yeah. Uh, it is strongly recommended that a NIC implements its own packet free list as creating and freeing packets requires uh, virtual memory and physical, virtual memory, uh, physical memory, memory allocations and vir uh, virtual memory mappings. Okay, so basically you should do that, and that basically allows you to pool up packets and keep them around. Sweet. Um, so really stupid question, uh, because I don't know Rust. Is the concept of drop handling roughly equivalent to descriptors? Uh, so this is basically the equivalent of uh, R, A, I, I, and C++. Um, do you actually implement a drop handler or is it an implicit thing throughout the language? Yeah, so typically you will implement drops on types where you have to do something more, but by default, if you don't implement drop, Rust will recursively call drop for everything um, as they fall out of scope. So if you have a structure and you allocate that structure to have some vectors and some heap allocations, and what, what have you in your structure, you don't have to implement drop because by default, Rust will drop all of those fields for you. So what we're doing is we're explicitly, um, in, in the case of these, when we're dropping these packets, uh, we are explicitly implementing a different semantic than the language. The, the typical semantic is the language calls drop on every field, and it still will after this. This just gives us an opportunity to do something else before drop happens. So what we're doing here by doing a self.packet.take is we're replacing the option packet with a none, giving that packet to the owner, and then it will still call drop on the packet field, but since it will be none, nothing will actually happen and nothing will actually get dropped. Um, so that's why we're required to do that because drop actually is kind of a hook before Rust drops the whole structure. So it gives you an opportunity and then if you want to have something that you manually handle, you can either use the manually uh, drop tag, or maybe you're using const pointers, like you're using actual uh, physical pointers, um, or raw pointers, I guess. And that would allow Rust to not drop those on your behalf. And then we could then pass that. In fact, we maybe should use a manually drop here um, instead of an option. Because I think that means that we will... Um, drop will drop it into inner. That'll extract the value from the container. Take. Takes the value from manually drop container out. Um, moving values out in drop instead of using. So I could use this, and this would be more performant because then these wouldn't have to unwrap that value, but I would have to use unsafe. I, I don't know why this is unsafe. Moving values out in drop instead of using manual drop. Um, it is preferable to use into inner instead, which prevents duplicating. Yeah. Extracts the value from the manually drop container. 
I think we can into inner is actually what we want to do here. So what we're going to do is we will put this into a manually drop. And that means that Rust won't drop that for us. Uh, use core mem manually drop. And I guess we have to move. The, the problem is we have to move that into there. Box new into inner. It drops the box. Um, but what does that do with that in a structure? Um, moving the values out in drop. Instead of using drop to manually drop the value, you can use this method to take the value and use it however desired. It's preferable to use that, which prevents duplicating the content of the manually drop. Yeah, I guess, I think we will still do this because it's technically correct. Um, here we can do self.packet dot take, and that's unsafe. And this is uh, release the packet. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. So we'll take that. 116, and now these don't need to do the as ref shit. So I'll just ref it, and this will just mute that. We have to use unsafe, but that is actually relatively easy to prove, so I'm not concerned about that. So that'll take it out. Moving the value out of the drop, instead of using drop to drop the value, um, you can use this to take it out. And the reason that that's unsafe is because it still leaves the contents in packet. But since packet will not be operated on when we return from drop, that's actually safe. Okay, take. Oh. Um. Oh, I see. Uh, manually drop take self dot packet. That's mute. Okay. Unsafe, manually drop that, and then this doesn't need to be that option anymore, which is uh, better for accessing that packet performance wise. 98. Oh, you got to wrap it up. Not that that matters. There's no cost to manually drop, it's just a marker. Um, and then this is mute space self. Uh, what editor? Yep, this is just Vim here. I should really start using uh, Learn and Rust sometime. Uh, whenever I read about it, I like it a lot. It's so good. It's really a fantastic language. It's just, it's so clear. It's so obvious, like, what everything, what is going on when things happen. I never would have thought I would switch away from ANSI C. Uh, C. I hated C++ because you didn't know what was happening. You didn't know what was actually getting invoked when you did certain things. But in Rust, it's fucking obvious because things don't automatically cast to different types. You have to manually specify what trait you're using. And it's very, there, there's nothing that goes into a black box of like this just magically appears and something gets invoked based on a dynamic dispatch that you have no idea what it is. In Rust, when you use dynamic dispatch, you have to mention what type or what trait you want to use on that type. And there's no type confusions and all this stuff. It's so cool. And even if you use box types or box traits uh, like the any trait, or um, when you use dynamic dispatch like the any trait, you have to explicitly mention what type you want to use that value as. Um, so nothing ends up just magically happening and it goes into one of the 50 implementations because you explicitly say what implementation you're targeting. It's so good. It's so fucking good. It's difficult because you have to structure your code 
in a way that actually makes sense, where C and C++ let you just do things that are inherently not valid for describing how your program works, um, and it doesn't care, right? And Rust forces you to do that. So people complain about the borrow checker in these things. But if anyone's been watching my streams, we're doing OS dev, which is very difficult levels of Rust development. We're not running into the borrow checker ever because I know how to structure my code in a way where the borrows make sense. Um, it's just really important. It's, it's Rust basically the code shape defines the correctness of the code. You can't just automatically have things happen. You can't have children having references to their parents unless they're ref counted. It's so cool. It's so cool. It's an incredibly good language. Um, okay, so packet size of the raw member in bytes. Create a physical storage for a packet, set the length. Let's see if this works. After the manually drop, it should. Yep, still works. Exactly as I would expect, we're reusing packets. Okay, so now we gotta do the send side and we'll do that through allocate packet. And what that's going to do, we already implemented an allocate packet right here. <laughs> so we're just going to move that into the trait instead. Uh, and this will allocate a packet from the free list. And it will just do self packets pop, unwrap or packet new. So easy. That's the free list. Like this is all I'm requiring people to do if they want absolute maximum performance is just have a little free list uh, on your network card. And that means we don't have to get another lock to the system allocator when we want packets. Okay. Bam. And now, when we construct a packet, we will give it to the network card. And then we'll get back that packet in some, like, undefined state. We're going to get the old contents, but it's a kernel, so I don't consider the previous contents of a packet to be sensitive. Um, so I don't care about that. Hello, friend, Twitch Prime! Thank you so much. Have you tried looking at ATS? Um, I don't think it's ready at all. There's some great ideas. No, I haven't even heard of it. Um, I will say that I am very much so a implementation person, so I really don't spend any time with languages that don't have real paths to adoption, right? Like, I know that this Rust kernel will be fine for 10 years. Like, I know that there will be a Rust compiler and a Rust community for at least 10 years. If Rust goes away, it'll only get replaced with something better. <laughs> so I'm just not really worried about that, where a lot of these, like, random theoretical test languages never get past 200 active users. Um, and I, I will say that, to me, that is a part of the language that makes the language ineffective. Because you can't use it as a communication method uh, between people because people don't learn the same ways of doing things people don't learn the language the language is too obscure um, I've had people in my life before that like doing everything in the latest whiz bang language and you can never use any other stuff because every week it's a new language but yeah it has some good ideas that it could take yeah I do agree that you can definitely get good ideas from those for for sure they're like I'm just saying personally I don't spend a lot of time exploring uh, alternative languages, but I know I know for a fact that, of course, uh, there's value in that. Okay, so now we can allocate packet, release packet. Now we're gonna make send. Um, what makes you certain that Rust will have a community in ten years? It's just too big at this point. It's already it's it's too big to fail. Um, there's too much money, too much investment in it. Too many large companies already have footholds in Rust. Uh, at this point, at the speed of which large companies move, uh, they could not get rid of their Rust dependencies within 10 years at this point. So, even even barring Mozilla, like, it just, Microsoft's starting to write code in Rust. It's part of the, like, core Windows build chain. There's going to be, like, real parts of Windows that will be written in Rust probably within the next, like, one or two years they'll get shipped out. I'm sorry, the language cannot go away. 
And once Microsoft is writing code in it, the language isn't going away for at least a decade. Like, they would have to start a phase-out process. Over the course of, like, three years, they'd have to write everything in a port it to a new language. They'd have to test it. Schools are starting to teach Rust. It's just, it's an incredibly good language. It, Rust, Rust is the C of this, of this century. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we'll get another language because we're still pretty new into the century. But, like... Rust is probably the C replacement until 2040 or 2050, right? So five or ten years from now, the average person who writes C now will probably be writing Rust. And then a new language will come out in 2035 or 2040 that will make Rust really bad. It'll, it'll like show some flaws in Rust and better ways of doing things. And then it'll go through the same adoption cycle we're in right now, which is about 10 years for people to use it and 10 years for people to stop using it. And we're like halfway through the people start using it phase. People started to use it about like three or four years ago. Language replacement takes a long time. Yeah, absolutely. I'm saying mainly for like new stuff. And given that we get new architectures and new operating systems uh, pretty frequently on the embedded and cloud platforms, um, I think we'll see probably a full Rust uh, cloud or embedded platform within the next five years. Because quite frankly, it would, take, it would take about three months to make like an IoT device with a TCP UDP stack um, basic memory management, low memory support, uh, no paging support. You could probably do that in about three months, and you would be the only IoT device without memory corruption bugs in the world. <laughs> the problem is no one would want to buy that yet because they don't want to hire their people to write in that framework and that model. Uh, but I think in like two years, that would be a decent enough selling point to differentiate yourself from existing uh, embedded RTOS uh, platforms, and then eventually, I would say like two years is probably when you could sell an embedded RTOS that's written in Rust, um, and people would consider buying it due to the security impl implications, and they would have a hiring pool large enough to develop uh, applications to run on it. So, <clears throat> Cobol and Fortran have been around for 70 years, so I think Rust will be around much longer than 10. Yeah, Rust is still in a phase where it could die in the next two years, and then it would die within 10 years. There's the Tak Artos, which is written in Rust. Yeah, I have looked at that. Um, it's interesting. I don't really like how most people do OS development. I think it still follows way too many of the norms of existing systems, um, and I think that's going to lead to kind of some flaws there, but... To be honest, it's it's pretty solid, I would say. Um, I don't know. I, I think they do a decent job of leveraging Rust. I do think they use a lot of extensions on Rust that kind of hurt the language um, in terms of like how they define. Like if we look here, I'll grab. Uh, okay, like this, right? Like this. This is not standard Rust at all, right? They probably have a, a register bit field. So they're using a, a macro here. I guess that's not too bad uh, if they're using a macro. I thought that was a procedural macro. But I think they're pretty good about unsafe. I don't know how many raw pointers they're using. Oh, they're using raw pointers. Well, this is MPU. You'd expect raw pointers there. Um, I'd be curious to see if they're like standing, sticking to Rustisms. Um or if they're using a lot of pointers, right? So we have a lot of statics here. Um, static array of process pointers for an embedded system, you can kind of get away with that. But yeah, they're using filters, they're using iterators. They seem to be leveraging the language quite well and unsafe seems to be at a minimum. Do process, yeah. Honestly, not too bad. Um, Dart is another one. That's for app level, not a systems language. Yeah. Yeah, I just have no idea what what app languages are for. It's foreign to me. <laughs> Obviously, I understand the, the value of them. Um, do nothing. I don't know. B 
but it looks it looks pretty sand. I don't actually know who works on the talk project. The documentation is pretty bad, unless they have documentation somewhere else. Maybe they do. They probably have a wiki or something. No. Yikes. <laughs> Your stream now has multiple quality levels. Hell yeah, it does. Good comments here, which is nice. So one thing that I will say is Rust, most Rust developers comment quite well. Like the, the language kind of encourages you to heavily comment, which is really cool. I refuse to watch this stream with less than 60 FPS. Hell yeah, you gotta get that smooth cursor. See, I'm actually on 140, uh, 144, uh, so the cursor to you is actually really choppy. <laughs> I would say 60 hertz is really unacceptable for coding. The, the cursor movements are much more jittery. Um, the pixels sometimes lag uh, by, by a little bit. You know, you're, you just got, you got to use 144. I will say that I'm probably never going to buy a non-144 monitor anymore. It, it's, it is actually like having that smooth cursor. Like when I have my cursor on my uh, 4K, which is 60 hertz, it's unusable. So I'm probably going to get a 4K uh, 60 or a 4K 144. So I've tried a 240 and 240 didn't didn't do anything for me at all. Um, I mean, I'm not saying it's bad. I'd take a 240 over a 60, but it didn't seem to give anything more than a 144. Yeah. Non-IPS screen for coding is hell no. I don't think I have... I have an IPS screen on my laptop, and that screen is so nice. Oh my god, my laptop has the nicest screen I've ever had, and it makes, I've always bought screens based on, like, the resolutions, and then I bought a TV last year, I bought a TV not based on the size, not based on the resolution, I bought a TV that was, like, as expensive as, like, a 95-inch TV, but it was only a 75-inch TV, but it had incredibly good contrast, and I realized that contrast, in this day and age, you can get, like, completely pitch black uh, wherever you don't have um, pixels displayed. It's, oh my God, it's amazing. Especially for watching like dark shows or dark movies where you have like, watching like Lord of the Rings on a really nice TV where you can actually see what the fuck's going on because it's not just all washed out. <laughs> like, it's crazy. Um, Not picky about screens, yeah. Mm, OLED. Yeah, that's what I have. So I have a, I think my TV and my, my new laptop is OLED. It's a, it's, it's pretty much the best uh, Dell XPS you can get right now. I think it's the XPS, like the new XPS 15. I got it in February. Uh, it's got a eight core turbo to five gigahertz. So eight core 16 thread turbos to five gigahertz processor, 64 gigs of RAM and two tera of NVMe and then a 4K OLED 15-inch uh, screen. So, yeah, it's actually really fucking good. I, I uh, That laptop is actually usable. I think it's the first usable laptop I've ever had. I've pretty much always bought laptops as a means to SSH into a real machine. So I had, like, a Surface Book before, which had, like, 8 gigs of RAM and, like, a dual core or something like that. Mm. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. It's not it's not good enough. Oh, it's got a GTX 1050 in there too. I think it's a desktop 1050 and not a laptop 1050. Um I know that it can run Dota at uh, uh 60 FPS in 4K on the laptop, which is pretty impressive, I would say. What 4K do you have? It's a piece of shit Asus. It was probably like 200 bucks. Because I basically would never buy anything over 200 bucks for a monitor. So it's basically like what 200 bucks got you in a 4K monitor four years ago. <laughs> Which is like, mm, nah, not good. It's, it's really washed out. Honestly, my 144 is pretty washed out as well. So I don't think I'm going to go under like 600 bucks a monitor now. Because that'll put me into the, like, exponentially, like, um, the, 
uh, not getting the returns back in, in the investments I put into them, whatever you call that, where it starts getting exponentially difficult to get like a little bit better uh, or exponentially expensive. <clears throat> yeah, diminishing returns. There we go. That's the word. Um, let's see. Space Sebi, thank you so much for the sub. Fuck yeah. We got, we got a whole sub party going on here. Um, got a some time ago. There aren't a lot of nice new 4K monitors that are big recently. Yeah. I, so, like, a lot of times the good tech comes out right when the tech comes out. Because after the tech comes out, people just want it cheaper, right? It, it's like you start off with a product that's, like, nuts and then you try to figure out what people are willing to pay and what people are willing to deal with for uh, reductions in cost of the device in terms of quality losses, and then you try and go for breadth. So, like, there are 4K 144 monitors that are out right now, and they're apparently really good. I think they have somewhat wash colors, which I would kind of expect because it's really hard to do that, but I would like to get 4K 144s to replace all my monitors in probably the next year or so so i've got 10 monitors that i need to replace though so cost does slightly matter so i'll probably stick in the like 500 to 800 range maybe i'll get a uh, 1400p um monitors i also want smaller monitors i hate how 4ks are always massive <clears throat> I, li I like the high dpi but i don't like the um I don't like when you can see the pixels again. In my opinion, I want a 4K that's like... I, I would like 4Ks that are actually like 23 inches, maybe 21 inches, and then I'd just have a shit ton of them, and they would be like super pixel dense, so you wouldn't be able to like see any of the pixels at all. <laughs> the, the DPI would be so fucking high. So your fonts would look great. Videos and games would look so good. But I've had problems with fractional scaling on 1440p. Yeah, I will say one thing I do like about uh, 1080p is you don't need to scale anything because dynamic DPI and scaling doesn't fucking work at all yet. Like, doesn't work in Windows, doesn't work in Linux. It's just so bad. 4K is pretty nice on 2x, yeah. So luckily with a 4K, you can just 2x legacy applications things that don't actually honor correct scaling. Oh, we just used a, that's a pretty new Rust feature we just used. Nice. All right, so we were doing the send path before our long tangent. Are we gonna take the packet here? Never had a problem with integer scaling. Um. So the problem is integer scaling is really hard to do per application on Linux. Unless I'm not aware of it, but I don't want to do 2x scaling on my whole monitor because at that point it's just squares. You can see the pixels again, so there's like no point in the 4K. I have a 4K 28 inch display and it's pretty dense. I can't see the pixels. Yeah, I would say anything under 30 inch 4K is actually pretty damn good for DPI. Um, all right, what else is, have I missed in chat? I feel like I missed someone asking an actual programming question somewhere. Let me find it. Oh, currently I'm doing more web stuff, both back and forth uh, and front infra stuff uh, for my look. What would you recommend as a project to get into low-level stuff? Ooh, um, what languages do you write in? Uh, Gretsuku. And then... I feel like there's one other question somewhere. Someone was asking something about the bootloader, I think. Where do I start or something? Uh, what the fuck was that? Have we really had that much chat already? Damn, chat's going ham. Fuck yeah. Uh, someone was asking something about the bootloader where I think it was about like the VODs or something, maybe? I, ca I can't find it by scrolling. But anyways, if you're looking for the VODs, they're up on the YouTube. Um, and they are actually all up to date. Uh, the one that went up yesterday was 
oh, where could I watch the Zero to Bootloader series from scratch? Uh, yes, you can find that up on my YouTube. And there's a specific, let me get the playlist for you. Um, fuck yeah. Uh, so I made a playlist for the Chocolate Milk series. And you can find that playlist here. Okay. Let's see, what do you do for a living? I work at Microsoft as a security engineer. So I'm basically a hacker. I try to find exploitable bugs in software uh, such that I can patch them so other people don't get to use them to get control of people's computers. That's effectively the quickest description I can give of what I do for a day job. Do you think VR desktops are gonna be a thing in say 10 years? No, I don't think so. I don't think VR is ever gonna be a major thing. Uh, it causes headaches in too many people and the lenses uh, have such a high level of amplification that the field of view of where your eyes have to be with respect to the lenses is so fucking sensitive that if your eyes are literally five millimeters away from the focal point of the lens, you can't see shit. Which means if you like, if you don't have your headband tightened to the point that it's breaking your brain, uh, if you shift your head just a little bit, everything just gets blurry again. Um, I am, I really don't get the point of VR for anything other than basically cartoonish graphic games because the, even if you had 8K monitors in your, in your VR headset, you're not going to be able to get your eyeballs in the right spots and the VR stuff centered in the right enough spot. Unless we can get dynamic adaptive lenses that like scan your retina, figure out your like optometry and like autofocus and pivot the lens into the location that is your eye. And I do think that is possible. And I think once we see that, we can have it work. But um, basically I, I think you'll need to have it dynamically autofocus with respect to your eyes location and that way you can have you can move the headset like plus or minus a centimeter in each direction thus you can have it loosely or comfortably fitting and it would still kind of dynamically compensate uh, for being off center directly from your eyes so that's that's my mindset I've, I've tried the HTC Vive I had a DK2 way back when I've tried the new oculus they all have the same problem to me. The second you shift your head a little bit, which is kind of the point of VR, is that you can move your head. The second you shift your head a little bit, everything gets blurry to the point that you really can't express anything that isn't equivalent to like maybe a, a 800 by 600 screen because you lose so much information in the blurriness. Um, do you have predictions where gains in computational performance is going to come from in the next 10 years? Uh, or if it's going to come, like parallelism, new architectures, better compilers. I think compilers will probably get uh, another like 10 to 20% better. I think, I think the biggest advancement in compilers is not going to be the... Um, I don't think the advancement that we see in compilers is going to be in the form of making fast code faster. I think the advancement we're going to see is have compilers that can reason about higher level constructs and produce low level equivalent code from the high level constru constructs such that hopefully a language like Go will be comparable to something like C because it will be able to reason about those effects a little bit better and understand those or uh, have better compile times which is also part of the dev cycle. Um, I think pretty much the only thing we're really going to get is parallelism. Uh, I think that's really it. <laughs> I, I don't think we're, like, architecture-wise, I don't think anything's really going to compete with x86's microarchitecture. Risk v is going to be a joke for at least a decade. Um, given that people have been dumping money into ARM64 for the past 10 years, and they're still maybe about 50% of the like computational performance of x86, I would say that uh, RISC-V won't be even remotely comparable in 10 years. And also RISC-V is meant to be cheap. 
So no one's going to invest a massive amount of IP into making a really good RISC-V processor because it's currently viewed as an academic thing right now, right? No one's taking it seriously. Um, also, RISC-V is literally MIPS, and MIPS has failed two or three times in the past. It got repurchased and revived, and then some people made a couple routers, and then it died again. The language is just not making it. It's just not making it. Smaller processors, though, yes, I do think we'll see a lot of advancement in power efficiency, absolutely. Um, the, the, basically, with gate size, I think it's exponential with respect to the power consumption. So we're going to get better and better and better tiny cores that are cheaper, that use less power. Um, I think until people start writing better code, or we have a language that forces people to write things that are parallel... Um, any parallel gains that we get are going to be for naught. But, like, yeah, you could probably... I'm guessing using, like, the best possible, like, Intel or, like, Global Foundry's tech, you could probably fit 1,500, 2,000 RISC-V cores clocked at probably 1.5 to 2 gigahertz. Yeah, probably, like, 1 gigahertz for power. Um... For like Risk V sixty four I, you could probably fit a thousand or two thousand of those cores in a single uh, package that is like four hundred watts, which is kind of what is doable right now. Um, that's effectively a GPU at that point, but it's still general purpose, so you can have address buses and memory and all these things. So we need to find a better way to get memory. Obviously, everything now is kind of bottlenecked on memory because memory is so incredibly slow. Um, I think if we can get a 10x in memory, we can do a lot more with CPU. But memory is just way too fucking slow. Like, it's... 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 Uh, it's so strange that memory is like one of the slowest fucking things on your computer at this point. DDR5, I don't think that really addresses any of the latency issues. I think it mainly addresses the um, the bandwidth, because we've gone from we've gone from about two gigabytes per second of bandwidth per per dim to um, uh, what are we running now? Thirty four hundred. I think that's clocking one twenty eight at a time. Um. You're running like what eight gigs a second or like ten gigs? A we we've like five or ten x our uh, memory speeds, our throughputs. We've like five or ten x that in the past couple years, which is insane. But the latency is still the same with respect to the processor. It's pretty much always been about seventy to uh, one hundred twenty cycles for our memory access, and that means that I can perform unlike a modern machine with AVX five twelve. I can do, uh, on a single core, let's see, I'm going to say, is, let's say memory takes 100 cycles to access, which is pretty good for a server, um, I can do 2 times 2 times 16, I can do, in the time that it takes me to read a value from memory, I can do 6,432-bit floating point operations. Like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> memory is so incredibly slow. I don't think people realize that. Like, memory is just unbelievably slow. It's an integration thing. When do we move memory on package? We have to start doing it. We did that with the Xeon Phi's, but that was mainly for bandwidth. The latency was actually worse of the on package memory. We also have to figure out how we do NUMA nodes and how local we make that memory. So one of the biggest issues is if you have a thousand cores on a processor, if you want to have a bunch of them have their own DRAM, you want to intersperse the DRAM such that there's the least amount of wiring between them. But then at that point, do you have exclusive RAM to certain cores? At that point, it's just cache. It's just like cache in DRAM. Or do you have some bus that allows people to access another core's DRAM? It's really complex because you end up with so much wiring uh, and so many layers that you can't really make it work. So, do you do anything with FPGAs? I've been leveraging the, them to perform block calculations, trying to reduce the bottleneck and loading and feeding them. Um, 
I don't have the strongest use for FPGAs. I was thinking about writing, uh, implementing an FPGA core for my IL, my my um, intermediate language that I use for my emulator. Um, and that would be a way to get performance gains because I'm pretty much out. I pretty much... I, I legitimately don't think it is physically possible to get a 2x speed up out of my IL anymore. Um, I don't think there's literally anything I can do, assuming like perfect solving for x86 processors, I actually don't think I can make it faster. Obviously in some like crazy loops and things I could optimize those, but in already optimized code, I, I actually don't think I can really do any more than a 2x. So I've been looking at how I can make that faster. Uh, and I think an FPGA would probably be slower, but I might do an ASIC. So I'd maybe have someone spin up an ASIC on like 22 nanometer would probably be affordable. Um, the biggest issue with FPGAs and ASICs is memory, right? The, the, the problem is everything that, like an emulator, which is what I would want to do in an FPGA, an emulator is basically random memory accesses, and you would need caches. And I'm sorry, there is no FPGA or ASIC that you make that's going to fit more caches than a modern Intel processor. You're just not going to, you're just not going to be able to compete with that. So, I don't know. Like... I mean, in theory, I could do something that's really low on core count and really high on caches. Uh, but it would be probably 8x less performance than x86. For, like, the caches would probably be, like, twice the latency. And the cores would probably be, like, half as powerful. And I'd probably be only, only able to fit, like, half as many cores. So it would be really difficult to do. And AMD processors, AMD doesn't support AVX 512, so I don't even really think about them right now. So, until AMD has AVX 512, I just don't, I don't even care about them, unfortunately. I do like, I do like the competition in the marketplace, but, yeah. Just the nature of soft logic, gonna be slower. Yeah, you, you really only, your only benefit from soft logic, typically, is that, well... I mean, maybe I'm wrong here, but your only benefit is if you're using such a small subset of the architecture for whatever you're doing that you can hard code it and then duplicate it so many times. For like Bitcoin mining, for example, you can, you can implement only the hash functionality and you can waste no die space with instruction fetch or instruction decode, all kinds of loop logic, caches. You can just get rid of all that shit because you're just doing streamy, streaming hashes. So, I would say FPGAs and, and ASICs, custom ASICs, are always going to suffer so much when it comes to memory latency. Uh, you can definitely get, like, the, the best theoretical memory bandwidth that the world has to offer right now into an FPGA. That's not a problem, but getting it to be random access latency is very difficult. So, Rosa Asher's doing rounds, two hours for a counter. Can you abort a hash? Is that possible? Can you stop computing the hash when you've determined, like, the second the bottom three bits don't match because you know it's not a match anymore? I don't know what Bitcoin necessarily requires, but um, I would really like to see clockless architectures. I think if we can somehow make clockless work... We would have to, if we can make clockless work, I think we could have some really big speed ups in tech. Because like your, um, your processor right now, like your transistors are probably running at the terahertz level, which means that a 64-bit addition, you can probably do like probably 20 gigahertz plus range of like 64-bit additions. You just can't you can't guarantee that the operation is complete or that it's at parity with other half-cycle operations or whatever cycle width you have. Um, obviously, everything's pipeline, so your processor is actually dispatching like eight instructions a cycle. So I think x86 can do 12 instructions a cycle now. So like in theory, you can actually execute on an x86 processor. Uh, you can probably push the like 
40 billion instructions per second on a single core. Um, typically, I multiply it by two. Like even in a general purpose mixed memory, non-memory mode, you can typically do uh, two instructions per cycle. So if you have a five gigahertz turboed processor, you're running about 10 billion instructions per second, which is pretty fucking incredible. Um, I think that's where things get really mushy between comparing like MIPS and ARM and RISC V, because people are like, oh yeah, we could do a, we could do a, a four gigahertz uh, RISC V processor. It's like yeah but you're running two cycles per operation, right? So, but yeah, I would like to do more FPGA dev just because I do think it's a fun mindset. I think hardware, hardware description languages, I think are just a really fun environment to be working in, 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 in my humble opinion. Oh, I got to restart the song because it's really good. Okay. Anyways, back to our send logic. I love I love tangents, to be honest. I love engaging with chat. I love answering questions. Um, this development's gonna happen at the same speed regardless. Like, it gives me time to sit back and think about what I actually wanna write so I can just come back and start writing code the second I'm back. So it really doesn't really affect the speed of which I'm doing development. You have looked at uh, FP open source FPGA tools? No, but if I plan to do FPGA dev, I will only do that at this point. VHDL or Verilog? VHDL, because it's more like uh, C. <laughs> That's the only reason. Uh, open FPGA tooling becoming sick? Yeah. I'm super excited for that because I would love to... Um, I want to be able to do FPGA dev in, envir in an environment that isn't fucking a 15 gigs. Like, the, the last time that I installed, I think I have an Altera. Yeah, I have an Altera system. Last time I downloaded the, like, Altera software, it's, like, fucking 15 gigs. It's, like, I just want to make Hello World in an FPGA. I don't need a 15 gig application for this, I don't think. Maybe I do. <laughs> it was nuts. Whatever their uh, designer was, I forget what their software is called. I think it may have creeped to 20 gigs now. It's just fucking crazy, man. It's insane. I don't get it. Pack it. Pack it. Quartzus. Yes, that's what it was. Fuck that software. Uh, we're going to have an option. It's going to have a packet. So right now, our sends are synchronous. We will relax that shortly. But right now, they're synchronous. Uh, it just makes it easier to think about and reason about. Uh, it's much lower risk. So what we're going to do is TX buffers is actually going to start out as a vector of nuns for uh, TX descriptors um, dot len. So this will cause us to all the TX buffers will not be allocated. So by default, we'll allocate the Rx buffers so we can immediately receive and buffer packets. And then TX descriptors are vacant. And the TX packet buffer will be filled in when we want to actually do a transmit. And to do that, we'll go to... Uh, we'll just get rid of that temporarily. So we'll go to send at 312. So we'll compute the tail index for this transmit. We're gonna fill in the TX descriptor. So we set the command, we set the length, and we also will write the mute self dot, um, uh, this is TX descriptors. You know what, we should just reconstruct this whole thing. So we can do one AVX5, uh, AVX write, or actually SSE write to this. Cause it's the TX descriptor is two 64 bit things, which we can actually write in one write. That, that'll be faster than doing individual writes. Um, so we'll do a write of a legacy TX descriptor. And everything's default. Default, except for the length, which is the payload.len as u16. And then the buffer, which is the packet uh, fizz adder. Dot zero, and then we'll have the command, which will be the one shift one and one shift zero. I think that's going to compute the FCS for us, the frame check 
Uh, that's the checksum on the Ethernet frame. We don't have to copy it anymore. We're going to have no copy on our send path. We'll bump the tail pointer. So we're going to we're going to fill in that descriptor with a new descriptor with the physical address of what was passed in. We'll fill in the command, we'll fill in the length, and then we'll bump the tail descriptor and payload, or this is packet. And let's take a look at packet. I think packet we have deref'n into, packet doesn't deref'n into anything yet, does it? So we'll do dot raw. Okay, no len on this. Oh, oh yeah, we do want that. Uh, packet dot length. Uh, pub fn len self u size. Uh, get the length of the internally held packet. Self dot length. We don't want to make that pub because we actually check on the setting of that to make sure it's inbounds. Okay. Now we just have a send at 387. Oh yeah, all this code is going to move into the trait. Delete. Uh, fn send. Done. Okay, uh, 359. Okay, we have to update the trait. The trait is expecting that old implementation. This will now take a send. It's true. It's true. Packet. Uh, packet. Okay. Um, my problem is that I don't really know where to start from writing an emulator, a kernel, a driver. What kind of device? Uh, how to learn all this low-level stuff. It's also vague. Ooh. Um, did you answer what languages you know? I don't know if I asked that, and I don't know if you responded. I see you're sending that message. I did miss it. Oh, I can... I work mainly in Go and Python, but I can do C++ and Rust. Um... I'm going to get comfortable with writing some Rust in a and looking at the debugger output to kind of see like the shape of things in memory. And I think a good thing to probably write for low-level dev to start off would be maybe a um, maybe like a, a Wireshark network packet or something. Uh, oh yeah, writing BPF is a good first step. Yeah, something like that. I would write something that like parses uh, raw data, where you're dealing a lot with a byte stream that you have to convert into a structure that kind of depends on the different states of things. And then after that, you would probably want to get into, if you want to do kernel stuff, OS stuff is kind of unique, but it's typically that. It's you're getting structures from uh, drivers or from tables, and then you're parsing them and converting them into uh, different ones. 200, clones not implemented for packet. Oh, uh, yeah, Rust has that limit. It's so stupid that Rust has that, but we can get by. Um, we actually don't want to clone that packet, so we'll go to 200, and we'll just do this. It's equal to vec new, and then for this in 0 dot dot tx descriptors dot len, tx buffers dot push none. Okay, so that's going to create all of the descriptors as none. And then down at send, we will get the descriptor, fill into TX descriptor, bump the tail pointer, set that it's in use. You know what, we're actually not using TX packets yet. These TX buffers, we're not using these at all. Um, we will eventually, when we actually handle buffering of packets, but right now, everything is synchronous. Uh, 193 doesn't have to be mute. TS, TX descriptors. Pass that in. That builds, and there's no warnings or errors. So let's check out our send logic. We're going to compute the tail index. Um, we're going to write the TX descriptor for this physical address. Write the command, write the length. We're then going to... Uh, Write volatile to write that in. We'll bump the tail pointer on the network card. We'll up to the TX head. And then we'll wait for the NIC to actually transmit the packet. So that's where we're losing that synchronous. 
this and then what we'll do is self dot release packet and here is how we free the packet and we'll free it and this will uh, put the packet onto our free list so now when we send a packet it'll go onto our free list until the free list exceeds its size at which point it'll just start dropping them back to actual uh, memory okay so assuming we're reading and writing a lot of packets uh, we'll just be using that free list and it has we can set that size to whatever we want it to be. Now, this means that we should be able to send a packet. In this case, we'll do um, let packet is equal to self dot allocate packets. This will give us access to a packet, and then we'll send a packet. So that should work. Um, oh, we don't have self yet. Allocate a packet and send it. Nice. Does fucking work. Now, this is sending. Every time we receive a packet, this is going to send a packet. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to um, nick.send packet. So this is what I can't do is I can't reuse the same packet. Fuck. Is Brian's OS dev tutorial still about? It is. Yeah. I don't know how accurate it is, it is anymore. It's definitely a little outdated, and it's very x86 centric. Um, I think doing, uh, I think doing MIPS or Risk Five might be easier at this point. Risk Five is literally designed to teach people OS Dev. Like that's why Risk Five pretty much exists, is to teach students both the hardware side of things for hardware students, and to teach OS developers how to make operating systems and low-level code. Is designed by I think Berkeley uh, as a teaching tool so that would be a decent place to start that being said while it's simpler and the resources will be more modern um, the resources might be more sparse but I will say that old documentation from like old tutorials from prior 2015 are a lot harder to read. We've definitely changed how we communicate technically now and we've changed the stylization of things like blogs um, so, yeah. Ask me to teach a class on network security. I'm tempted to have them write uh, protocols early on. I don't want them to feel like the network stack is some magic that no one can touch. Yeah, it really isn't that crazy. Like, really isn't. Okay. Here we're going to packet lease. I see. What I think I can do here... Aha! Uh -huh. Pub FN take. Have a good one. See you around, man. Yeah, get some good sleeps. See you. Glad to, glad to have you here. It is already 6 o'clock here. Holy shit. Time's flying. Damn. Okay, we're going to implement a take. This is going to take a self. And this is going to return a packet. And this is going to uh, take the packet from the lease without giving it back to the device. And this will allow us to do this, self.packet. Um, oh, and then self.packet, if I own it, which I do, I can do into inner, and that's safe. Oh, that's on in, uh, manually drop into inner. So now we can handle the situation where we received a packet and we want to modify the packet and send it back. So we'll do packet.take. Uh, and that's, uh, we got to do this. So do packet take, wrap that up. And now we can receive a packet and we shouldn't have to worry about, um, oh, packet take associated item. Do we want to do an associated item? Yes, I think we have to because this isn't valid, is it? Is this valid? Can you do a self? Can you do a packet.take? I don't think so. Yes, so we have to do an associated. Okay, that's what I thought. So here we'll do a packet. Take this. This will move a packet into here. Packet.packet. .packet. And that's a self. Oh, do we just want to do this? 
No. What am I what am I what am I doing wrong here? I'm I'm doing something stupid. Um take. Oh, we implement DREF. Oh, um Oh shit. Thank you, Harold of the Rocks. Thank you for the sub. Fuck yeah. I really need to apply for Twitch partner. Um, and then once I get Twitch partner, I'll hire someone to make a bunch of uh, um, emotes and stuff. Packet lease. Packet lease. Oh, packet lease. You're totally right. Thank you, guys. Self. Ooh, emotes? Yeah, I don't know how many I can get. And then also uh, sub badges, too. Packet, packet, cannot move out of here. Uh, manually drop. Um, cannot move out of here. Move occurs because that has type manually drop. Into inner. Oh. Oh, God. No, packet on the packet lease. That's on a self. We get the packet. That's a manually drop. And then we into inner on that. Um, is it because I'm moving out of that structure? What if I what if I destructure it? Um, can I do this? Wait, am I just doing something stupid here? Move occurs, has type manually drop, which does not implement copy. Is this only impled where T is copy? No. Into inner, packet dot packet. Um, let packet is equal to, I think I can do this. If let, Um, if I break myself, packet lease owner packet is equal to pa sell uh, packet, manually drop the packet, where I destructure that, and then else unreachable. I'm going to go take a break as well. See you around. Hell yeah. Thanks for stopping by. Those are moved out. Why can't I move out of there? Because it implements drop. Fuck. Fuck. How do I leak a type? Can I do that? I know there's forget where I can forget a type, but forget doesn't return the inside part. If you want to leak memory, use box leak. If you want to dispose, that's what I want to do. I want to leak. I want to leak something. Um. Hmm. I could I could put it back in an option. Then I could take it out. And then that would drop that. And then this. Drop handler would only do it if it's not taken out of there. Yeah, because we can't move out of there because it implements drop. That makes sense. I'm glad Russ stopped me from doing that. We're going to put this back in an option. Yep. So this is a sum packet. This, we're going to owner release packet self.take. Uh, if let sum packet equals self.take, uh, self.packet.take will release the packet. Otherwise, we have nothing to do. OK, OK. And then this is as ref unwrap. Oops, dot packet, as ref unwrap. Then this one is self as mute, packet, as mute, unwrap. 
manually drop. Then here, what we're going to do is if let sum uh, take the packet from the least without giving it back to the device. Okay, so we'll do uh, self dot uh, lease packet take unwrap. It hasn't been dropped, so that'll always be present. And we need to make that mute. And then that'll get dropped, and then it'll be none type, and then it won't actually release that packet to the NIC. Beautiful. Uh, 280. First mutable borrow occurs here. Second occurs here. Ah, uh, yes, I think I might need to do this. Let packet is equal to packet lease take packet. So that's going to get access to the packet and drop the packet lease. And then at this point, I should be able to send the packet. Fuck. Really? It's borrowed there, but then we drop the type. We return a packet. We take that out. We received a packet. What? Because that'll cause that to get dropped here. Because we passed in by moving it. Oh, because it's still borrowed on the other side of the let? Because technically here it's still borrowed on the else for the none? I think that's the issue. But I feel like this would discard it. I feel like this is fine. I think that is the none, isn't it? It's due to the if let. If I did a map on this, if I do a map on that, am I fine? Because I think I am. Mm. No, I don't think so. What? Hmm. If I do let packet is equal to packet new, We'll make a new packet. Okay, that doesn't work, but I should be able to do core pointer core mem drop packet. And this is not gonna work for some reason. Assign to attempt. Okay, let's try it. Nope. Um, oh, that is an option. Here, let me try this. This should work. Okay, that is bizarre. Oh, mute. Really? It's borrowed there. It's then borrowed here. Might be used here. Oh, it might be used here when it's dropped. Ooh! I see. I think I can do this. Can I, is this valid? Um, ex, uh, we're gonna take the packet. Yes! Okay. So it is possible, we can express it with safe code. Thank fuck. 
So that'll that'll get a packet, it'll take it out. And then that means we never actually have it in a we never have that holding a non-droppable type or a type that has a drop which requi requires that reference. So we'll take it out here, we'll map it. Now we have a temp which is a packet and then that'll give us ownership of the packet and then we give that back to the network card. Okay, so this should this should basically echo every packet. Okay, Ethernet FCS is invalid. Um, zero should be that. What do we send? We send eight times ten. We then echo it back. We're going to modify something at 30. We'll put Bs in there. But yeah, I'm pretty sure this is echoing it back. So we'll say uh, packet.raw hex 30 is equal to a, a B. Actually, we'll put a Z in there. Uh, I cannot borrow as mutable. Huh, mute packet. So we own that packet, and then we give it back to the NIC. Okay, and then here we go, and that's going to, every time we get a packet, yep, it puts a Z in there at 30, and then sends it back out. Look, look at this shit, every time, every time this sees a broadcast message or a message to itself, it just fucking dupes it on the network. <laughs> oh, top kick. Uh, destination broadcast. Ooh, why didn't we dupe the broadcast? Are we not doing it for everything? I think it's still going. Yeah, it does. Okay. So the problem is the checksum's fucked. Should be that. Oh, the receive side is not stripping that. Ah. We're going to set the length to packet.len minus four. And I think I have to do that in another line of code. No. Okay. Packet length minus four. We're going to subtract that off. Oh, we should reboot it. We subtract off the FCS, and now it's working. Okay, so the receive has the FCS still present. Ooh, what's going on here? FCS status. Well, this packet looks fucked. Oh, we ended up sending something way too big. All right, I'll be right back. I'm going to hit the head. All right, so are those being broadcast? Yeah, so we see the dupes. 
Yeah, and that's putting a Z. It's just smashing a Z in there. Oh, I see. That's probably the original. And that's the one that we send. Yeah, it is. Ah. This to here. So we've got a... Okay. Huh. So I'm gonna just send a single packet. Break. Now let's see. It seems like we saw one of them where it was not correct, but now we can actually see our latency. Um, right? That sends a broadcast, and we should echo that. Ah, bad UDP length. Okay. Wow, look at that latency, though. Fuck, yeah. So this is the real packet, and here's our echo. Wait, no, that's not our echo. Wait, we echoed the wrong thing. Ah, okay. Something's, something's broken. Nice. I was wondering why things were not correct here. So, let's take a look. It looks like our receive is incorrect. So, we ended up getting this packet. Um, yeah, we got this packet, and then we echoed this packet. And then here, we're echoing the wrong packet. It seems like it's... It's sending... It's receiving, so something's broken in receive. Okay. Check if there's a packet that's ready to be read. We start off with the packets, the Rx buffers are all full, right? Rx buffer, default, go through, create the buffer, put the physical memory in there, okay. So those should be all present. So I'm actually just gonna put the print Um, yeah, I just want to print the packet, whatever it got, the raw packet, and I'm going to get rid of the length being, uh, length on packet, I think we're going to do a pub fn raw, let's take a self, it'll return the raw bytes sliced down, so uh, get the raw packet contents. And this will be self.raw dot dot length. Um, self dot length. So that will return a reference to the raw packet contents. That's going to break a couple pieces of code, a couple spots, I think. Uh, 284. This len should be raw dot len. And then at. 364, this should be raw.len. Okay. So that allows me to get access to the raw data. So I'm going to do rx of packet, and then we're going to print the packet contents that we rx 2 x question mark packet.raw 283 packet.raw Does an empty slice have a pointer? I think it does. I'm not sure if it does, actually. But anyways, this will print the bytes. Reset. Okay. Send. So there we got a packet. It was four ones. And eventually, this will... There are four ones. Four ones. Oh, no four ones, that one. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's wrong every eighth. It's something about that eighth entry. Um, Rx desks. Okay. Um, 
So we're gonna go through at the head, if it's not zero, if the packet's not present, turn none. We're gonna read the length of what was read, and then gonna allocate a packet, and then gonna swap that packet out. Oh, we don't update the fucking pointer. Jesus, guys. Jesus. Thank fuck. Okay, that was an easy bug. Uh, pointer, right? Address, do I call it address or pointer? Buffer. Buffer, self dot, this is the new packet. Oh. Um. Yeah. We got this, oops. I mean, technically, I should get the let new packet fizz is equal to packet dot fizz adder dot raw dot fizz adder. Get the physical address of the uh, new packet, and then we're gonna smash that in to zero. And I th uh, new packet fizz, and then I think everything's default default, which is zero. Right. Uh, default. Legacy. Rx desk. Let's take a look. Here we create them. They're default, and then we just fill in the buffer. Okay. It's totally what it is. So we'll fix it. What keyboard do you use? I use a um. Das keyboard, Cherry MX Blues. I have a, a keyboard macro too. Uh, so we're gonna go and, oops, dot, dot, dot. So we're gonna write in a new descriptor at that location. And we got all the information we cared about. Yeah, we got the length. And then we'll write in the descriptor, bump the RX head. Okay, 343.0. All right, we fixed it, guys. I'm pretty sure. Reset. Yeah, we, we fixed it. Okay. Well, that was a doozy. <laughs> that was a doozy. Okay, so now this will be echoing packets back. Do we need to do this set len then? I think we still do. Let's try this. Reset. Because so I think these are all wrong. Yeah. It's unconditionally wrong, okay. So we do need to subtract four. So we know that the FCS is part of what was received. But let's look at our latency. Ooh, that was bad. That was bad. Wow. Wow. That latency is trash. Um, what? Why is that so bad? Four, four point, uh, four point four millis. Is that just because it's in a VM? Oh, it's because we're printing. Because we're fucking printing. And we'll get rid of this. We'll just send the invalid one. Ugh. We're fucking printing the packet, guys. Took four millis to print that. Okay, here we go. Boom. Oh, yeah. There we go. Now it's point... Wow, that's actually pretty fucking good, then. Yeah, buddy. So let's copy. How do I fucking copy the time? We'll just stop that and we'll do Python. Uh, 0.59563933 minus 
No, I typoed that. Five, seven, five, six. Five, oh my god, I'm so, what am I doing? All right, we'll do these, these are easy. Uh, eight, seven, oh, one, seven, four, eight, four, three. Eight, seven, oh, oh, five, eight, six, nine, two. Oh, how many millis? Okay, negative, negative 869 millis, apparently. Wait, how? Oh, because the multiply happened first. Yeah. 0. 0.1 milliseconds. So 100 micros. That ain't bad. So 116 microseconds. There's micros. 116 microseconds. And this is in a VM, so that's probably the VM cost, to be honest. Um, that ain't bad. Okay, okay, okay. Send a packet. And what else can we do here? Oh, shit. Uh, well, that moves the packet. Um, huh. Uh, okay. Is that, is that not working? Oh, we stopped wire shark. Oh, fucking hell. Boom, boom. Yeah, there's, there's a clean one right there. Oh, yeah, look at that. Latency. <laughs> I think Wireshark just wasn't warmed up. But, yeah, it does look like it's about 100 micros, which is not bad, to be honest. Um, okay. And we need to update the length. So let's see what happens when we do that. Oh, and we can mark this... Some of these we can do inline. The perf does matter on, on these quite a bit. Gotta bounce check that. Len. Okay, so we're gonna set the length. So now we're not gonna have those errors anymore. Okay, so there we go. These packets should be identical on the RX and TX. Um, I guess on the transmit side, we see the actual transmit, and then it gets padded out. But, yeah, they are identical. It's just padding. Um, ooh, what's that LU, actually? What is it? What are those bytes? Oh, that's the checksum for what? Oh, unverified UDP checksum. Okay, let's add all these checks in. Uh, protocols, IP. Um, validate the checksum. IPv6. Okay, we'll validate that checksum. And then we'll validate the UDP checksum as well. The fuck is U? UDP, validate the checksum. Okay, so now we're going to see checksum failures. Because we're not recomputing that, and then we're, I guess that's getting padded. Mm. Wait, what? This. Um, why wouldn't the checksum be the same? The padding's on the IP, right? So, correct. The IP checksum is correct. Total length is 38 for both of those. Oh, is this the outbound? Is that the send, not the receive? If I pause this... Yeah, UDP checksum invalid. Okay, so it's the send side, not the receive side. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, on the send side, 
the Nick is actually doing the offload, so we can't actually see. We can't see the outbound. <laughs> and that's the issue. Does the compiler actually not inline function small enough by itself? Um, it, it'll definitely inline that, but it's mainly a hint because when you do inline, it makes it accessible. It makes the uh, IL accessible to external crates. We're not really going to be using this from a crate, but if we were, um, whenever you access something across a crate boundary, like a library boundary, uh, if you don't mark inline, it will be a function call. But if you mark inline, the actual LLVM intermediate representation for that function will be embedded in the library such that you can pull in the library and still inline functions. It's really cool. Um, in this case, we're, yeah, we're never going to hit that. But uh, it also, to me, inline adds readability in terms of the intention of like, this is meant to be really fucking fast and really simple. These should not be complex operations. But yeah, I think this is working. Yeah, the response is valid. And this is saying should be D332. And then here it's D332. So on the outbound side, it's correct because we receive it. Basically, Wireshark is actually hooking in the hooking on the kernel side, and the network card is what is doing that packet checksum calculation. So all right, now um, I might want to I might want to write the um, uh, bup, 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 bup. okay, and send that. That'll echo everything, and apparently. It includes the FCS in this case. So we receive it with the FCS. Uh, reset this. Will the inline force the compiler to inline? It's only a hint. You can do inline's open print always, which will kind of force it, but it's still not 100%. All right, so this is saying FCS is wrong. Oh, yeah, because that's sending four additional null bytes. Uh-huh. Okay, so let's check that out on our side. Um, and we'll add that to the spec. We should say um, the received packet length should not include the uh, FCS, right? So we're going to say we don't want the FCS to be included. That also means when we send it, we don't want the FCS to be uh, part of what's sent. And then we can verify what we send by this. We'll print the packet. Now we'll print the packet. And this will allow us to see how many bytes we have. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ugh. Oh my god, why is the network so loud? Dude, just give up on the art, man. It's not happening. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 12 bytes of padding. So, yep, and that's 12 bytes. Yeah, because we're receiving it with 12, and then we're literally sending that, and that'll affect the FCS. So what actually got sent to us doesn't have those four bytes, if I'm not correct. So what we'll do is we will pad this. We'll add 12 to this to make that 20, 22. And that should be a perfectly sized um, protocol add win. What the fuck? Um, send, and then we receive it with the four bytes, and that's supposed to be the FCS, and that makes sense. So yeah, that's sent. That's a 16-byte boundary on the send. We receive with four extra bytes. Should be the FCS, but let me check that. We're gonna go into the receive. And let's see the descriptor base address head. 
Receive control. Okay. So what we'll do is receiver enable. Store bad packets. We have that set to zero, I'm pretty sure. Uh, here we go. We accept broadcast. No unicast promiscuous. No multicast promiscuous. No long packet acceptance. Whether it's LP is accepted. When it's clear, it discards them larger than that. When it's set, what is 1522? I know 1516. Or 1518. Oh, that's with the FCS. Oh. Where's that diagram? Uh, I just wanted the Mac header. Uh, link later, maybe? 802.3 will probably tell us. Ugh. Mac header. It's not Mac header, it's the Ethernet frame, but whatever. So the FCS is at the end, and there's somewhere that said the size. Yeah, 1518 includes the FCS, so what's the 1522 number? I don't know what 1522 is. Huh, anyways, loopback mode off. Receive descriptor, this is for the interrupt. Multicast offset, don't care. Broadcast accept, so we do want to accept broadcast. We set the length to 2K. Uh, 16, or this is two kilobytes RX buffers. Broadcast accept. VLAN filter, canonical form. Discard pause frames. Do not pass Mac control frames. Okay. Buffer size extension. Oh, strip the CRC. Controls whether or not hardware strips the Ethernet CRC from the received packet. It's not transferred to the host memory and it's not included in the length. Okay, so we should be able to do one shift by 26 and that will disable reading that. And now when we reboot, it'll the Ethernet frame will be correct. Here we go. And there we go, the ethernet frame is correct because we're stripping that. Perfect. So this will be, um, we'll want to make constants for these, but let me make sure these are all valid. What else do we have? That's it. But yeah, we definitely want that. Strip the ethernet CRC. It occurs prior to any checksum calculations. The strip CRC is not transferred to host memory and is not included in the length reported in the descriptor. Okay. And then the checksums, I think, are calculated. How do we program that? Um, when set, it stores bad packets. CRC error, symbol error, Sukin's error, Length error, alignment error, all this shit. So, basically, we'll only get valid packets at this point. So we'll say, um, strip CRC, accept uh, broadcast packets, um, strip Ethernet, CRC, accept broadcast packets, and enable RX. Okay. That sounds pretty damn good to me. Strip the CRC. Two kilobyte RX buffers, accept broadcast, and enable RX. So now we don't see the CRC and we'll drop those bad packets. So we would just never see them. If we sent one with an invalid Ethernet CRC, we would just never see it. So we don't even have to worry about that case. Um, so what we're gonna say is, should not include the FCS and the FCS should um, be validated by the driver. Um, should be validated by the driver. Okay. So if that gets an invalid packet, then it'll just drop that and we won't get it. 
sending a raw frame, we don't include the FCS because it'll be computed. Now, what we could do is enable TX. Um, oh, that's in one of these bits on the actual TX entries, this. This is the compute, the CRC, I think. So let's try this. Oh, oh we didn't reboot, okay. So I expect to see an invalid here. I just want to make sure I understand where all those bits are coming from. That is looking valid. Hmm. What is that bit in this? That's in the TX descriptor. Let's go up to uh, transmit descriptors. Then we care about the flags. Check some offset. Ooh to insert a TCP checksum if this is enabled. Okay. So there's some bits in here that allow us to enable certain checksums. So here's the status, yeah. Interrupt delay enable, VLAN packet enable, extension, don't care. Report packet sent, don't care. Report status, don't care. Then we have insert checksum. This is insert FCS. Controls the insertion of the FCS and CRC field in normal ethernet packets. It's only valid when end of packet is set. So I'm not sure why that's still getting set. Maybe the emulated hardware um, automatically does that anyways, but we'll set that. That'll insert the FCS. And I don't know if that FCS will get appended or if it will overwrite it. Like, do I need to give it the bytes for that FCS? I actually don't know. So we'll probably search for that. Insert checksum. When set, the ethernet controller needs to insert a checksum at the offset indicated by the CSO field. Checksum calculations are performed for the entire packet. Starting at the byte, uh, for the entire, starting at the byte indicated by CCS, it's ignored if CSO and CCS are out of the packet range. IC is only valid when EOP is set. So that starts at CSO, starting at the byte CCS at this offset. So that's the start of the checksum and that's the end. I think that's only for TCP. Um, compute the offset back out the, let's compute this offset to back out the bytes should not be included in the TCP checksum. It's in bytes and must be in range of that. Short packets that are padded, the CCS must be in the range of the unpadded data length. Makes sense. A value of zero B indicates the first byte in the packet. Must be set in the first descriptor of the packet. Okay. And that's only for TCP? What about UDP? Oh no, I spilled my wine. Fuck. Be right back. Damn it, my wine.
All right, so uh, check some offset. And we were looking for how that works for UDP packets. So I'm not sure if we're going to be forced. We might have to. See, so length minus one. TCP checksum. Okay, so let's see if newer network cards support something different. I think the bits of the receive side, let's take a look at receive register, inline functions, receive functionality, receive descriptors. Okay, so this has descriptor done, end of packet, and we want to check those basically. IPv4 checksum calculated on packets. UDP checksum calculated. UDP checksum are that calculated on packet. IP or that payload checksum. Um. If those are all zero, hardware doesn't provide checksum offload. Special case does not provide EDP for an V4 equals that. Hardware does not provide UDP checksum offload for IPv4 packet with UDP checksum. Okay. Hardware calculates the checksum offload if IPCS is active. Um, so do we set those? No, those are status bits, aren't they? Yeah. So we have the fragment checksum, the status, and errors. And then errors, Rx data error, okay. IPv4 checksum error, UDP checksum error. Um, they're only valid when they're performed. These along with other error bits are only are valid only when EOP and DD bits are set in the descriptor. Receive checksum errors have no effect on packet filtering. Okay, so they don't filter invalid packets. If checksum offloading is disabled, then I, the IP and L4E bits are zero. Rx happens if the CRC error is detected. Um, posted host memory only when store bad packet is set. Okay, so we don't have store bad packet. We don't have to worry about that. So what we need to do is, I think we just start right in the network stack, guys. I think we just do the, we do the checksums ourselves and then we worry about the offload and seeing if we can improve those. Um, but basically we'll just by default take complete raw frames and then we will validate and compute all the inbound and outbound checksums. Um, I think that's gonna be the easiest way for now. Hey, how's it going? It's going pretty good. How are you doing, Semaphores? Good name, by the way. Okay. So what we're going to have is this is going to get the raw packet contents, and that's exactly what that does. Now, what we want to do is we want to implement using get raw. Um, actually, I'm going to do pub fn fizz adder fizz adder. Uh, gets the physical address for the packets. And in this case, we will have self.raw.fizzadder.fizzadder uh, on the fizzcontig, I think. What is that Z? Oh, I'm recording. Okay. 
Uh, so, what we're gonna do... That's not assigned to anything yet. Fizz adder. Get the physical address for the packet. And then 370. Anywhere that we do raw fizz adder, we'll just do fizz adder. What is that Z? If I hit escape, it inserts a Z. What the fuck did I do to my Vim? I'm not in macro mode. I don't think so. I borked... I borked my Vim? What? It's putting a Z in front of every command that I do. What, 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 what's the solution to this? Why does it put a Z on everything? What the fuck did I break? Perhaps restarting Vim? I know that would work, but I don't want to do it. But I can. God damn. Source... E1000, SP kernel source net. All right, packets, packet. Okay. What have I done to my Vim? You got wine on your keyboard? I did get wine on my keyboard, but it wasn't that much wine. It's not that much wine. God damn it. Was it that much wine? I don't think it went into the keyboard area of the keyboard. Like, the Z key still works. I don't know. There shouldn't, there shouldn't be any controller there. There shouldn't be anything that would be affected by that. It's a terminal thing. Oh... Yeah, I'm gonna go with it's a terminal thing. <sighs> Cause if I if I hit escape, it doesn't insert Z's, right? Uh, kernel source E1000 kernel source. I don't know what terminal mode that is. I don't know what I just did, but it was impressive. Okay, please fucking work. Oh my god, it works. Oh my god, we have a terminal. <laughs> okay, packet dot raw dot length uh, 334. This is packet dot fizz adder. Packet dot raw 367. Oh, yeah, let's take that, uh, have that take a self. Keyboard is drunk. Dude, I have no idea what I caused there. I've never seen that before. That's definitely new to me. Uh, 186. Uh, ziff. We got, a, we got a ziff statement. That's standard. Most people do ziff statements. It's, uh, it's um, better for, uh, for something. Page tail fizz adder. Okay, uh, packet doesn't need to be mutable. Yeah, of course not. Um, this is just test code, anyways. Clean that up. Run this. Okay, now we can reboot, and it'll work. And then we Python, and then we'll every packet that we get will echo back. It's a really cool feature. Oh. And yeah, everything's, it's, it's identical. The packet we send is identical. Okay, we did it. We, we fucking, we sent and received a packet. Okay, nothing's pub on this. And this is a, a physically and virtually allocated packet that can easily be uh, put into and taken from DMA buffers directly from Nix. Uh, the... Memory will always be four kilobyte aligned and contiguous in physical memory. Okay. 
Ziff means zebra. <laughs> Has a 50-50 chance of doing what is expected versus not. <laughs> Zim proof. <laughs> Zipped if. Yeah, it, it just it compresses the, uh, the input to the if statement. Or something. That's exactly how it works. <laughs> uh, reset. What are we doing now? We're writing a network stack. Yeah, we're just going to do um, pub fn, I think, UDP self. I think we'll do everything on packets. <laughs> Compresses the input to the if statement. You, you know, it makes code uh, use less memory. So this is returns the UDP payload from the packets. Wee oui, wee. Oui. Well, we need to parse. We kind of need to parse everything. So I think we'll like. I need to parse out these fields. So we'll want to parse out the MAC header and then the IP header. What's uh, what's an IP header look like? 20 bytes, right? 20 bytes, and then options, which we won't use. Fuck options. Well, something might send us options, so we probably should handle it. Um, okay, here we go. If IHL is greater than 5, what is fucking IHL? Oh, the header length. Oh, oh, it just tells you. Nice. Contains the size of the IPv4 header, which is four bits. Uh, four bits to specify the number of 32-bit words in the header. So, if it's five times four, that's 20. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, who is more hardcore, this guy or Geohot? Me for sure. Geohot and I did a, a CTF competition back like five years ago that was live streamed. We did a heads up CTF against each other. I gave up, but I'm leader. That dude's a fucking scrub. I'm just trying to start some beef so I can get some fame off of that. <clears throat> Geohot knows I love him. Um, UDP payload, I think we're gonna parse that shit. Do I care about anything in here except for the um, source and destination IP? I don't think so. So I think we're going to parse the source and destination IP. And this is, this is, this is remote surface here. We could, we could implement remote code execution here if we fuck up. So we've got we to gotta be careful here. So I think we're going to parse the IP header. We're going to grab the source and destination address. Um, and we're probably gonna parse those out into here. So we'll do like mm, I think we'll have parsed and The problem is the structure we don't know when you update the fields Um But I like this guy more. This is Assembly and Rust. Yeah, Geohot's, Geohot's mainly working on, like, actually making things that do meaningful things. And I'm just working on making things go really fast. Um, so, I mean, Geohot's not really too involved in the security stuff anymore. He's working more on, like, actual development side of things. Because he's running, um, the fuck is his, uh, comma AI. And that's taken up all his time. Actually, didn't he leave and then go back or something? I can't remember if he left and went back. Doing prod dev stuff, yeah. Which makes sense. I mean, that's that's where, like... That's where some, like, really big interesting problems are, to be honest. I'm working... I'm working on problems that people don't think are don't know are interesting 
That's where I spend my time. A lot of people think that, like, virtual machines and operating systems are all already efficient, and they're really not. So that's where we gain an advantage with massive perf and writing network stacks. So we're going to want to parse that out. And how do we want to do that? I kind of want to store it. Um... I could do like packet.parse and then Ah fuck it. It's on you to it's on you to cache it. So we're gonna do nested structures. Pub struct UDP header. Uh this will be all of the Mac uh, Ethernet. And this will have a source Mac. And we're just gonna expose the information that a user is gonna want. Uh, it's desk then source. Um, so we have the desk Mac and the source Mac. We'll say SRC Mac here. We have the source Mac address. We have the destination Mac address. And am I going to care about the ether type? Yeah, I think I do. Yeah, we'll say the type, U16, because our ARP stuff is going to care about that, and I want our ARP stuff to use these parsers, although the ARP stuff could actually just use the raw payload. Yeah, we might just do... Um, thanks, Adamant. Got that all fixed up. Thought about maybe doing a join stream with Doc Savage? I don't know Doc Savage. I don't know what he does. Pubstruct. I'm mainly a solo person. I really like working alone. Um, I don't work too well with others. I mean, I can, but I don't like to, right? Uh, source IP. <laughs> Destination Microsoft compiler would be interesting. Yeah, I, I think that's reasonable. Source IP, dest, IP. Honestly, we'll do dest so they line up character-wise. I32, U32, U32. So we'll have Ethernet frame. We'll have IP, which will have the source and dest IP. And then that's it. So we'll have a pubstruct UDP, which will have an A ref to the packet. This will have the eth frame, the IP header, these are just all the fields that we care about. Then we're going to have the UDP header. I don't know why we're parsing UDP right away. We'll, we'll fucking do it. We'll do the whole process. I ain't skirt. Shit's easy, man. It's just some packets. Just some packets. Source port, desk port. Um, source port, desk port. Technically, it's in this order. I think all of these are in that order. Is IP, it's source dest on IP. Dest source on Ethernet, though. Pretty sure Ethernet frames are dest source. Yeah, they are. So we'll have, basically, we will parse out the fields that you care about, and we'll validate everything. When did you start OS Dev? When I was 14 or 15. The nature of low-level security stuff is very committed, highly focused. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people, uh, a lot of people burn out from this stuff. This is some dangerous stuff to work with. Payload, U8. Do I want to have Ethernet have a payload? I mean, I can. We're not going to modify it in place on Ethernet, I don't think. Unless I want to give offsets to these things. Uh, desk source, source desk, Ethernet IP, desk port, source port, payload. Am I ever going to care about the payload on Ethernet frame? And I will, but that's a very special case that I don't think I care about. IP frames, I don't really care about it. UDP, I think this is how we're going to make it. This makes it a lot easier for me. It's maybe not as extensible, but uh, we're going to do just UDP here to make that easy. So this is going to return... A UDP, which is UD, uh, UDP. That's it. And this will take an 
this will return an option UDP. Um, this will extract the UDP information from the payload, validating all layers, and then probably should do Mac first, pub fn Mac self, I will say eth, uh, option ethernet. That one we don't, will actually return a structure. Same with this one. That's, uh, the A is implied there. So this is going to parse the ethernet header and return the uh, source and dest max. Destination max. Okay, so we'll do um, let payload is equal to self dot raw, let raw, and then here we have to do everything failably, right? Because these can actually fail. So we'll say if uh, ooh. Um, I think I can do this. We're going to return a sum ethernet unconditionally, return sum. Then we're going to say the source Mac, yeah, the dest Mac. This is going to be equal to self.raw dot dot six, and we'll do OXO and OX6 dot try into, uh, oh, and we gotta get that, because I'll panic, oops. Get that, if it fails, then we return none, and then we'll try into, which will definitely succeed, so it doesn't really matter, but then we have the source Mac, this is at offset six to C, and we'll set this to none for now. God, this fucking music's so good, man. Maybe it's just the wine. Uh, use core convert try into. You said you didn't want to nest structures, so an Ethernet frame would have a payload of it. Well, I don't want to. Um, didn't you say you wanted to nest structures? Yeah, I, so. I've done that before, but it can lead to some like really weird lifetime issues. Um, I think I'm just gonna do this because this is just so much simpler. So before I have previously nested all of the fields, but I think if you care about specific fields, I'll let you parse those out yourself. Uh, this is just mainly the summary. So when you ask for an ethernet packet, it gives you a summary on that. Uh, and I can actually reference, I mean, fuck it. Can I just parse the whole thing? I think the biggest thing is I can't return mutable references where it can update these in place. And a previous network stack that I did, you literally like, it casts the whole thing into these structures, which can be difficult when you have dynamic fields like the um, option fields on a TCP or on a IP header, uh, because you can't necessarily write to the same location every time. And then you end up with all these like unsafe Thing. So we're just going to parse out this information. The only situation, like in this case, the only situation where we care about the ether type is ARP. And for an ARP, we can parse, we can parse the, parse the ethernet header ourselves, right? Um, and this is basically, if you ask for a UDP packet, it'll give you this structure. It has the source desk Mac, the source desk IP, the ports, and the payload, which is really all you care about. How can you run Streamlabs on Linux? You cannot. Um, you can only do use OBS for that. So I have a, um, I built my OBS with a web browser, and then I have the web browser fetch the Streamlabs URL because the Streamlabs stuff is all just all of like the displays for like follows and subs are just uh, magic URLs that the OBS kind of pulls. Um, I think it's more complex than that. It probably uses like web sockets or something to see if there's new data. But it literally just outputs the result of like a browser uh, web page. <laughs> it's it's really weird. So I baked that in. There's a there's some stuff online that talks about how to do it. No problem. Ask ask any question anytime. That's what we're here for. I wouldn't be doing this live if I couldn't interact with the community. I'd just be doing it. 
can't you handle the payload of a UDP structure regardless um, if it matches? Uh, what do you mean by that? So basically, couldn't you handle the, any payload if it matches? Yeah, if it matches, you mean like, could I return this as mute here? Like a mutable reference to the payload? Or do you mean something else? Anyways, 91, try into. Uh, that doesn't have none error, so we'll do OK. So it'll try to extract those bytes into the desk Mac. This will try to extract those bytes into the source Mac. Uh, raw is inline, good. And then that'll give the ethernet frame. And then we'll parse the IP header. Uh, regarding encapsulation, any payload uh, that contains a valid UDP header and data can be handled using the UDP struct and functions. Um, yeah, so the UDP struct will allow you to view it, but it won't allow you to update it. Um, and the reason for that is I don't know the size of the IP header, and that will be dynamic, and I also can't capture if someone writes to this payload. So I think when someone wants to create a UDP payload, we'll actually create the whole thing. Um, we won't like do it in place. So that's, that's my biggest concern, because if I made this mute, then someone could update this payload field without updating the parts of the UDP header which matter, and I wouldn't know that that update occurred. It would otherwise re require recursive tree structures. Yes, that's what I've previously done, and it's just... It's so much code complexity to allow you to like modify something in place where that's never really an actual use case. Like almost every, like DHCP technically, you'd maybe modify in place, but who cares? Who cares about the performance of UDP, uh, of uh, DHCP? Um, so I don't think it's really worth the complexity. For UDP, so these will get access to them, and then we'll have like a dot create UDP, which will fill in the fields that we care about and kind of recompute that. In fact, we'll just probably have like a dot make UDP or like new under UDP, and you'll give it the UDP structure that you created yourself, and then it will make something and place all these in place and then compute the checksums. It won't allow you to do arbitrary packets where you would have like every single field controlled, but this is all you care about. In a programmer model, this is all you care about from UDP. If you really care about like some other obscure fields of the packet, fucking parse it yourself. Like, I think that's totally fine. Uh, I don't want to bloat the common path with handling of obscure parameters. Does something like IPsec have a separate driver or libraries, or does the code handle those payloads? Uh, I think that code would handle those payloads. I'm not going to do IPsec in here, so I don't even care. I'm not even thinking about that. Um, so I'm not even worried about that. To me, IPsec will just be drop packets. Yeah, if I wanted to do if I wanted to do IPsec, I would probably end up uh, doing that in a much different way. IPsec is absurd. Yeah, it definitely is. Okay, so we care about the version field, the IHL. What are these? Um, congestion notification without dropping packets, optional feature, optional features. You know what we do with optional features? We don't use them. Uh, total length, entire packet size in bytes, including header and data. The minimum size is 20 bytes, header without data. Maximum is 65535. All hosts are required to be able to reassemble datagrams of size up to 576 bytes, but most modern hosts handle much larger packets. So, yeah, we're... Do we actually want to support large IP packets? There's the length. Identification, what's this shit? Uh, uniquely identifying the group of fragments on a single IP datagram. Um, fragment offset. I don't know if I want to do fragmentation, but honestly, I might want to do fragmentation because it actually allows for some pretty performant operations. The problem is fragmentation 
Um, specifies the offset relative to the beginning of the unfragmented datagram. This would first, the first fragment has an offset of zero, plus maximal offset of this, which would exceed the maximum IP length of that. Yeah, that's fair. Um, protocol header checksum. That's just of the header, if I'm not mistaken. So, kind of need it for some things. Yeah, I. It's really nice for UDP because you can do like, you can kind of do large packets without large packet support. So if both sides support jumbo frames, then it kind of just works. And if you don't support jumbo frames, it'll get fragmented by the sender. Well, I guess the receiver, if they don't handle jumbo frames, you're fucked. Um, but I'm pretty sure our network card can actually do that for us. Now, I don't know if we can do IP fragmentation on the NIC, and I'm pretty sure we can. That being said, we want to be able to handle a network card that doesn't necessarily support that. It's for checksum offloading. We're not going to do that yet. So you pack it. Uh, that's checksums. I think we have to handle the fragmentation ourselves. Let me check a more recent one. Uh, receive data storage descriptors, head splitting, and replication. This yeah, this allows you to split some things up. Um, format. Fragment checksum. Uh, end of packet and descriptor done. So end of packet is set. Single packet case. I'm pretty sure we have to handle IP fragmentation ourselves. Are not supported by that. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's not mentioned as a free feature. So we have jumbo frames, IP offload, uh, multiple queues. We probably should set up multiple queues, to be honest. Decrease the number of locks that we need. Um, internet moderation, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Yeah, so I think we're just gonna we're gonna parse this naively. I'm gonna hit the head. I'll be right back. I might uh, I might heat up some food too. I'll be right back. Okay, so we're gonna write a really simple reduced stack here. 
But that's all we need for like 99.999% of situations. So we'll parse the ethernet header, that's easy. Now we're gonna parse the IP header. Uh, parse the IP header. And IP, I guess we're gonna skip the fact that it's ETH? No, I think IP will contain Ethernet. Makes more sense. Okay. Now, this is gonna parse the IP header. It'll return a struct IP. And then in this case, we're going to uh, let Ethernet, ETH is equal to self.eth. So if we couldn't get it, we return out none. So we get the Ethernet header and then you know, I'm, I'm, I will parse out this because it's just so little to add. We're gonna add the, um, we're gonna add the type, the ether type. It's just, it's just doesn't matter that much. So we'll, we'll get from C to uh, 14 DE. Try into, and this will be type. U16 from from LE bytes and we'll convert that okay kind of looks weird like that uh, get the bytes from 0 C to E and that'll make sure that we also have the full size Ethernet frame because if we don't have any of these bytes present we're just gonna return out failure And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to grab uh, raw is equal to self.raw. We'll just get access to that raw part, just in case that doesn't get optimized by the compiler to just not call that again. That also shortens up some of these, which I think means this fits on one line. Yes, it does. Beautiful. Okay. So parse that ethernet. Easy peasy. Now, IPv4. We care about the version... Um, it's always equal to four. Okay. So we'll parse out that version, which will be, uh, let raw is equal to self.raw. The version from an IP header will be at offset hex C because that's the offset. Honestly, I can have these have their payloads. As long as we're not modifying them in place. As long as we're not modifying them in place, I don't want to necessarily copy out more info, info than what I need, but I can have the payload for these because uh, we can have multiple references. AU8. And then we can parse from the next level, and then we will use offsets relative to the packet. So in this case, payload will be equal to raw.get oxe dot dot, which will succeed in every situation. But, um, oh, we need lifetimes on all these structures. Not a big deal, because we'll parse these out. And everything can use anonymous lifetimes, and it will figure everything out there, I'm pretty sure. IP, ref that. Okay, 109. Sweet. So, we get the ethernet. Then from the ethernet, we can get the version from eth.payload get. Actually, we'll just do like header. We'll unconditionally get 20 bytes. Um, IP headers, IPv4 headers, v4. I don't know how I typed a six there. IPv4 headers, always at least 20 bytes. So we'll get that. And if we can't get 20 bytes from the header, then we got a problem. Then, we will grab, I think we really only care about the options. There's some, I guess we care about the length. Um, so ethernet, this is only on a, what is the type on an ethernet frame? We can just look, literally easier to just look. IPv4 is OX8, uh, 
0800. Oops. So we'll go to uh, const IP, uh, eth type IPv4. This will be a U16 and OX0800, and this is IPv4 Ethernet. Ethernet frame type. Woof. I'll say if raw dot type not equal to eth type IPv4 return none. Um, and we can do this. Uh, if the Ethernet frame wasn't indicating an IPv4 packet, return none. Pretty obvious what that's doing, but anyways, uh, and we'll say parse out the eth. Ah, oh, fuck. Added that to the wrong spot. Here we go. If the eth type... Are you writing in flags to identify identify Martian packets? I don't think so. But we'll we'll see. We're going to do like pretty bone stock. We're going to like only handle pretty much the most basic uh, frames for everything. So like if if the all we're going to probably check the options and we're going to say if the options aren't all zero for basically anything that's dynamic, we're just going to say we can't handle this packet. Um we're going to be like really strict probably on what we handle because we're only going to handle such a small subset. So Ethernet, we fully parse. So this is done. This is a complete parser of Ethernet. Uh, there's no room for failure here. This is perfect in every single situation for Ethernet frames. And it's all failable. So if anything is out of bounds, bye-bye. Okay, so here we're going to check that. We're going to get the IP. We're going to get the header in one go. And then what we'll check on here is we'll check basically all these fields, um, ECN, DCSP. I think those, we can literally just make sure that they're zero. And that's probably what we're going to end up doing, right? So we've got the version, which is four, should always be four. So the version is a nibble, and then the IHL is a nibble. So we'll do let... Um, Gonna go, need to de-stress and whatnot. Have fun, go de-stress, feel better, man. Version is equal to eth uh, header zero and OXFF. Oh, I heated up some food, I'll be right back. Thanks for the kind words, Harold. Hell yeah. Got a small little snack here. Okay. We want to get, it's just F here. I don't know what I'm doing. Let 
IHL header zero shift four and here we'll grab and OXF. So this will parse the IP, uh, the IP version and header length. Okay, and the header length is in 32-bit uh, ints. 32-bit uh, values or something like that? I don't know. So we'll say if IHL is less than five, return none, and we'll say um, header length should never be below five uh, E32s. If it's less than that, we got a problem. We shift that over by four. What weird system is gonna be sending frames that aren't before? Yeah, I have no idea. And then here we'll say the version is not equal to, if the version is not equal to four, or I tell is less than five, and this will like validate the uh, IP version and header length. Okay. So that'll reject those, and then at the end, we'll just return none here. All right, so we've done that. Now let's look at the DSCP. I'm just going down the list. We're just gonna parse every single thing we see. I think that's gonna be zero. So you parse the version. Oh, the version is the top four bits. This is so fucking confusing. This is saying, there's a really weird way of doing this. The version isn't the bottom bits, is it? Or is this printing it in that way? Yeah, the version's the top part. Dude, what the fuck? Four and zero. This is describing it in such a weird way, man. Then all of these are zero. Um... Okay, that's the DSCP and the ECN. Allows end-to-end -end notification of that. It's an optional feature that's only used when both endpoints support it and are willing to use it. All right. Man, this is just wrong. I guess this is specifying the bit position in the stream, and then this is the bottom octet. It's, it's a really weird notation, but whatever, we'll make it work. So we validate that, and then here we're going to say, um, we don't support DSCP or endpoint congestion at all. If header one is not equal to zero, return none, right? So now we've validated these that this byte and this byte entirely. Now we're gonna get the length. This is the total length. And we'll grab this from header two to four. Try into okay. And this will be from U16 from BE bytes. Oh, these were BE, these should be BE bytes from big Indian bytes, from big Indian bytes. That'll parse the total length. Uh, so this is, uh, get the length of the header plus the um, payload. Okay. Identification, I don't think that matters, does it? That's like some sequencing stuff we don't really care about, I'm pretty sure. Um, let's take a look. Identification. I don't think we care about these. Primarily for uniquely identifying the group of fragments on a single data datagram. No, I don't give a shit. That doesn't matter to me. 
Okay. Next. Flags. Preserve must be zero. Don't fragment. More fragments. Okay. If DF is set and fragmentation is required to route the paddock, then the pa the route the packet, then the packet is dropped. Oh, interesting. All right, I'm gonna. Hmm. Okay. Reserve bit must be zero. It's three bits. Don't fragment and more fragments. For unfragmented packets, MF is cleared. For fragmented packets, all fragments except the last have the MF flag set. Last fragment has a non-zero fragment offset field, differentiating it from an unfragmented packet. Okay, so let flags is equal to header. Uh, this is at six. Yeah, because that was at four, five, and this is, this is six. Shift by five. One, two, three, four, five. And then we're going to end that with seven. You are a Nazi. Wow, that's, uh, that's really creative there. All right, so uh, get the flags from the packet. And then here we're gonna say reserve must be zero. If flags and OB 101, it's not equal to zero. And we're gonna say uh, bit zero is reserved as zero, bit one is uh, don't fragment, and bit two is more fragments. Make sure that the reserved bit and more fragments are clear as we do not support fragmentation. So if it's not zero, we don't care about the don't fragment, but the more fragments and the reserved as zero, we'll make sure those are zero, and we'll drop packets that don't match. Stepped away for a bit. How's it going? Pretty good. I don't know what you missed, but we uh, we polished up our network code. We made our entire networking stack uh, non-copy, so there are no copies in our networking stack anymore. Super, super cool. Okay, fragment offset in eight byte blocks. I think we just assert that that's zero. Uh, let frag offset is equal to U16 from big onion bytes, header from, uh, I guess it's a little bit complex. We read from six to eight. And OX FF, that's the bottom byte. One, two, three, four, one FFF. So that leaves three bits. So this will uh, get the fragments offset. And then if frag offset is not equal to zero, return none. Once again, don't support fragmentation. If the fragment, fragment offset is set, so we ignore identification. Now we got TTL. Which basically, um, that's mainly only used for routers, right? That's for the hops. Um, decremented on each route. When it hits zero, it's dropped. Uses these to see... Okay, we don't care about TTL at all. Protocol. We do care about that. And that's at byte 
eight nine. So uh, let protocol is equal to header, uh, and this is to try into okay. Then we'll get the protocol, which is at header nine. I uh, get the protocol, and we'll put that up in here too. So that's the type of the protocol for the IP. So we're parsing out, once again, parsing out the information we care about. Then we have a header checksum. We definitely want that, so we're gonna grab that here. So this is a header checksum, and I forget how they compute the checksums, but we'll, uh, I'm sure we'll be able to figure that one out. Oh, I gotta get some rings on my makers and TV. I'll be right back. Tell me about your days. How's it going? What's everyone What's everyone doing here? How did you end up at this stream? A lot of people here. Rust. Rust. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I'll give you that. One. Two, three, four. Okay. I don't know. It's been too long. I'm trapped. <laughs> this. Okay. <laughs> Probably just because Rust in the first place. Damn, I'm surprised how many people show up due to Rust. Kind of surprised. All right, um, this is, get the checksum for the IP header. This is that byte eight, nine, or eight, nine, 10, and 11. Eight, nine, 10, yeah, this is 10 to 12. So this will get the checksum, and we'll probably validate that when we figure that one out. Then we have a source and dest IP. Oh, those ones are easy. Let's uh, source IP is equal to header 14 to, or 16, wait. Oh, 12, okay, perfect. 12 to 16, U32 from Big Indian Bytes. Try into okay. And this is the dest IP. I uh, get, get the source and dest IPs, 20, or 16 to 20. Then, options. How many options are there? I guess we might just not handle any of these. What actually uses this? Nothing? I'm just going to say... If this is not equal to five, we don't support options, so we only allow 20 byte headers. If the version's not four or the header length is not five, then we get the source and dest IPs, and at that point we've parsed everything. Now we want to get the length. Uh, minimum size is 20, so this is let payload len is equal to um, this is equal to the length, the total length, checked sub 20. If that underflows, then we return none. So this is uh, compute the payload length. And then let's payload len is equal to, oh, if payload len is greater than, um, yeah, check sub that. Never seen someone write an OS from scratch. Fascinating stuff. Glad you're enjoying it. Hell yeah. Yeah, I don't know how, how common OS dev is. I think a lot of people have done it in university at some point or another. But other than that, I think it's relatively uncommon. Um, 
Compute the payload length. Yeah, we'll do this. If the payload length is greater than the ETH payload, right? If it's greater than the ETH payload len return none. Um, so here we're going to validate the payload length. And this is from total length. Uh, oops. Validate the total length. So if the total length is greater than the Ethernet's payload size, then we got a problem. Otherwise, uh, compute the length of the payload. So we'll take the total length and we'll subtract off 20. So if they supply something that's too large, error. If they supply something that's smaller than the header that they sent, also error. And then this is uh, as you size. That's always an upcast. Um, I mean, technically we can do this. Nah, eh, we'll do this as you size. It's fine. It's fine. I also got finished rewriting my Discord bot because I thought I could get away not having a database. Apparently, I couldn't. What is, what does Discord use? Is it uh? Isn't IRC under the hood like everything else? Total length. If the total length is greater than the Ethernet's payload, otherwise compute the length of the payload. And then at this point, we can return a sum IP. And this will have everything. We'll have the ETH. Source IP, dest IP protocol. ETH, source IP, dest IP protocol, payload, and that's equal to the ETH payload 20 to um, 20 to payload len. Payload length is zero, that's fine. So. If the total length exceeds the payload length, then we have an error. Subtract 20. And that's always in bounds then. So we can slice that. Weird bastard form of WebSocket I've seen in other quirks? Damn. That's fucking weird. Um, slice that shit up. ETH borrowed after move. Oh, yeah, we'll just put ETH at the end. Technically, we can implement clone and copy, but this works. They're actually moving it, so we know that's what's happening. Almost done with my snack here. No, it's slowing me down a bit. Um, okay, return out the parse IP information. And then here, when we receive a packet in our test, we can print packet IP. And that, uh, we'll add debug on that. on all these debug 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 IP method not a field oh yeah so I'll parse out the IP of that packet and this should give us some information about packets so we'll send a packet and yeah we have the destination Mac which is broadcast well god damn this network won't shut up We got a type 2048. Yeah, let's let's put this in hex so it's actually readable. And we'll pretty print it all the way through. Reset. Okay. 
So we've got a payload here, and yep, that checks out. That has all of our A's in there, exactly as you would expect. Well, now it's scrolled. Oh my god, those ARPs, man. ARPs are killing me. Okay, there we go. That looks like the payload. And let's see if that lines up. So this should be UDP starts at A9. Oh, that's not right. Flags don't fragment. We don't care about the don't fragment. TTL, source Mac, type. Yeah, 800. Oh, this is the payload of Ethernet. Yeah, so it starts at 0845. Okay. Uh, for the IP, wait. IP starts at 4500. Oh, oh, okay, perfect. Then we have the source IP, dest IP. Those look correct. We have the protocol, which is 11 hex. Um, where is protocol? 17. Yep, that's 11 hex. Then we have the payload, which in this case is the entire UDP A9E2 32OE 4C81. Um, is that right? I feel like I'm missing something now. I'm still a rough snoob. The more I work with it and the nicer it is. I started learning about theory from uh, Bartos uh, lectures on the category theory for programmers. So now Rust type system is making a lot more sense to me. Yeah. I really do like Rust type system. I think it's really fucking good. It took me a while to be convinced. But once I was, I was quite convinced. So the payload of IP, and that doesn't look correct. Oh, maybe we clicked on the wrong packet. But I think there should be more A's in there. Yeah. 4C... This is what was sent. Yep, 0932, 1E. That's the length. And then we had the checksum, which got filled in, and then we had two bytes of data. Okay, why are we stripping off too much of the payload? Oh, oh, I know why. Because where we calculate the length, we subtract off from the total length. We actually just want to use the total length. Um, make sure the... Uh, here we can say... If the total length is less than 20 or it's greater than the payload length, then we got a problem. But then this is the total length. Because it's 20 to the total length. And then this is correct now. Total length. So if the total length is less than 20 or it is above the end of our buffer, then we have a problem. And then here we'll reset. And there we go. We can see our whole payload to the byte, regardless of if there's padding. So if we if we get rid of if we have padding, so we'll go to 20. This should cause a packet to get sent with padding, and in this case. If you look at what's sent, um, I guess, is that not being padded out? Was it like 10? Oh, it's padded to a certain size, I think. So in this case, yeah, it's padded with um, more bytes. And we are ignoring those bytes. We're only looking at the ones that are actually sent, which is 10 different bytes. Perfect. Okay. Not too surprised. Uh, this parsing is relatively straightforward. So here you're gonna go. Let IP is equal to self dot IP question mark. Uh, parse the IP information from the header. And this is parse the Ethernet information from the header. And then for UDP, we just care about source port, desk port, and payload. We got to do the checksums too. We haven't done checksums yet. So we'll get to that. Fucking hate checksums, even though they're really easy for these. I think we have to use a unsafe 
some unsafe in Rust to do it. Maybe, uh, we don't have to anymore. Last time I wrote this, I had to use unsafe, but I don't have to anymore. So we're gonna look at uh, UDP, UDP Wikipedia. And UDP is really easy because it's fixed. It's always that size. So header is equal to ip.payload.get0 to uh, eight bytes, right? It's eight bytes? Yeah, it's eight bytes. And then we'll get those. So uh, get the UDP header. We did that up here with IP as well. We did everything on header, not payload. Same here. So if we don't get at least 20 bytes, we have a problem. Down here, if we don't get at least eight bytes, we have a problem. Then we're gonna compute the um, source port is equal to header zero to two, try into, okay. And this is U16 from big Indian bytes. This will be the dest port, uh, port uh, parse out the port information. And this is from four to uh, two to four. Is this Rust? Yes, this is. Then we're gonna get the length, which is a U16. Uh, this, we're just gonna par parse the header. They're all U16, so it's easy. So this we can do length, length, and we have the checksum. And this one is four, six, six to eight. So I'll parse out the whole header. Then we'll return a sum UDP uh, source port, desk port, IP, and then payload. The payload is self dot uh, IP dot payload from eight to length as you six you size. Okay, so we'll slice that out. Um, source port length, length of the UDP header and the data. Minimum is eight, so we'll say if the length is less than eight or the length is greater than ip.payload.len, um, and this will validate the header, or validate the length, as you size, so if the length exceeds the IP payload, then we have a problem, return none. And then at this point, we return out the UDP. So uh, return out the UDP information. So it's pretty minimal on copies. And now what I should be able to do is I should be able to print packet.udp is pretty printed. And this will Show the bytes. U16 converts the bytes from the unsigned int. Yes. Okay, there's the payload. Those are totally our bytes. Fuck yeah. Source port, desk port, source port 50, or desk port 50, source port, who knows what that number is. It's probably correct. And then here are the uh, 10 bytes. That is our payload. So now we can receive UDP packets. So we need to do the checksum. It is used for error checking the header and data. It is optional in IPv4 and mandatory in IPv6. Carries all zeros if unused. Ooh. Well, the whole thing has been FCS, so we're gonna ignore it. <laughs> it's optional in IPv4. And we're doing IPv4, so bye-bye. Um, checksum is optional in IPv4, so we ignore it. Carries all zeros if it's unused. I guess technically we should maybe check. Um, but if it's, a, if it's optional, carries zeros if unused. But if that, I mean, you just ignore it. You just ignore it because if it's, you could have a checksum that validates to zero. And would that mean I ignore it in that situation? No. 
So I'm pretty sure we can just ignore it. If it's provided, you still should check it. Shouldn't you still check it? I mean, I can. Um, it's just, if it's not used, right? There's, I'm pretty sure it's just up to implementation to not use it. And I don't think many people use it. Let's see. Oh, it looks like it's being used here. So we could say if it's non-zero, we could check it, but you can't have a checksum that resolves to zero. So we should either always check it or always not check it. Um, optional and not used are different? Yes. Uh, but I, I'm pretty sure anything's just going to ignore this. I'm pretty sure like Linux ignores if you send it an invalid UDP checksum packet. I'm pretty sure everyone ignores it. So we can see uh, Linux UDP checksum. I'm sure it's a tunable thing. But let's see. They would be dropped. Uh, I don't think that's the case. I'm pretty sure that's not the case. But we, we can check it. It's just expensive to calculate. Um, I'm pretty sure Linux will drop, will, uh, accept that packet. Field carries all zeros if unused. Let's go to the spec. Check some. Padded with zero octets. Okay. So it's the 16-bit ones complement of the ones complement of the ones complement sum of the pseudo header information from the IP header, the UDP header, and the data. Oh yeah, we need to make a pseudo header for this. Padded with zero octets at the end, if necessary to make a uh, a multiple of two octets. So you gotta make the pseudo header. It's really stupid, but it is what they do. You put the IP headers in there. Is the same as what's used in TCP. So we can compute this, but I'm pretty sure we can ignore it. Let's see what it says. Um if the computed checksum is zero, it's transmitted as all ones. Oh, never mind. Okay. Zero transmitted checksum means the transmitter generated no checksum for debugging or high level protocols that don't care. Okay. Oh, interesting. Never mind. So there is no zero. That would make sense. All right. So let's fucking do it. Uh, so first we need to. We need to. Um, that's an interesting way of doing it. So I guess we'll say, if checksum is greater than zero, uh, sender used a checksum, thus, uh, here we'll say, uh, check if the checksum is used, and here we'll say if it's not equal to zero. Uh, if the checksum is used, it is non-zero. Um, thus we should, should check the checksum. Oh, you know where that we're going to be sending zeros for fucking sure. <laughs> when we're transmitting packets, we're going to send some. We're going to be sending zeros all day long. Fuck that checksum. It's just so pointless. It's just so pointless. The whole fucking Ethernet frame is checksummed. Like, who cares about why are there why are there why is there a checksum on the whole frame and then checksums on individual fields? And I know why. It's because you can have a carrier that isn't Ethernet, but over Ethernet, which is all we support, the entire packet is checksummed. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure we can just ignore this, and we'll probably just default to not checking it because this is going to be very expensive. But we'll say, um, but yeah, it's, 
the only way the checksum could be wrong is literally if the sender incorrectly computed it or sent like the wrong data, but it wouldn't actually detect corruption, right? And the IP checksum is one thing, and the IP checksum is actually mandatory, so we do have to check that. But the IP checksum is over the fixed size of the header, whereas the UDP checksum is over the entire payload and this like fake header. So you have to make this fake header, you have to then pad everything out, uh, you have to pad the zeros, and then you have to compute the checksum over the whole packet. So we're gonna have a loop that's for the size of the packet. It's it's fucking crazy. Uh, if the checksum is non if the checksum is used, it is non-zero. Thus we should check we should check the checksum. Okay. So then we will uh, source address in this ordering. And it's computed as the ones complement sum of the ones complement of the ones complement sum of a pseudo header, the UDP header, and the data. So we're gonna put the pseudo header on it, and then we're going to. So we gotta we gotta check some this. <laughs> it's really fucking stupid. But we gotta check some this um, protocol. These things come from the IP. And then the UDP length is the, I don't know what the UDP length is. Anyways, it is, so I'm pretty sure we just not everything. So we're going to do, uh, let me check sum is equal to zero. So start the, the check sum. And then here we'll do check sum plus equals, uh, equals check sum wrapping add. And we got to get the source address. So we'll do not u16 from le bytes. Um, yeah, we got to convert the like source and dest into those. Oh, gross. Let source IP. Oops. But source IP is equal to uh, IP dot source IP dot two be bytes, and then this is the dest IP. So I get the dest IP. Let's proto is equal to uh, really the protocol is a U eight. Okay, it is. Protocol in this case is going to be. OXOO and then the protocol. So it's just IP dot protocol as U16. And then the length, the UDP length. What is that? What is the UDP length? Is that the payload length for the entire UDP thing? I think so. So that'll be, um, I think it's just length in this case. We can literally just use the existing length. Let length is equal to length. And this is the um, this is the pseudo header. Then we're going to do checksum is wrapping add u16 from le bytes of the source IP 0 dot dot 2 try into question mark. So this will uh, add the source IP to the checksum. This will be two to four. Add the dest IP to the checksum. Dest IP, this is from four to six, and then six to eight. Checksum equals, oh, uh, beginning bytes. One's complement of sum of that, blah, blah, blah. And then we pad with zero octets to the end. So far, we don't have to worry about that. Then here we'll do not u16 uh, checksum wrapping add not. We have the proto not length. Okay. 
uh, finish up the pseudo header with the protocol and length. And then here we can do four, four I, I in zero dot dot IP dot payload dot len dot step by two, go through every two bytes field. And then we'll do a, um, uh, here we have to actually, oh, it's gross. Checksum is equal to checksum dot wrapping add not of u16 from big Indian bytes. And then from here, the what we're converting to big Indian bytes in this case will be the ip.payload. You know, I'm gonna do, I can actually probably make this a little bit faster. ii dot dot ii plus two. This can go out of bounds pretty easily if there's not padding. Uh, try into, yeah, we gotta, we gotta do a get on this. Ah, gross. Um, go through the length. We want to one byte. We want a two byte align the length. So at that point, we're going through and not one. So we're gonna go through the length step by two bytes at a time, and then here we can actually do that. Try into uh, dot okay, that'll never fail. And then here, um, and this is go through each two byte pair in the payload, go through everything, step by two, we can access, we know that that's in bounds because we rounded that down. So either it's mod two or we skip the last entry. And then we'll say if ip.payload.lin and one is not equal to zero. Um, finally, add the check, uh, add the, uh, this is the, what do we want to call this? It's like the, it, the spilling byte, the, the overflow, um, add the extra bytes if there was a non mod two payload size. So if the payload, we'll say if the payload two is not equal, mod two is not equal to zero, then checksum is equal to checksum wrapping add not, uh, and we're doing it in network order. So I'm pretty sure it is just ip.payload, ip.payload.len minus one. Oh, fuck this shit. ip.payload.len shift, uh, as u16 shift by eight. I think that's correct. Oh my God. Fuck. Oh, uh, U16. Uh, try into. Okay. Just gotta move those. And these need to be try into OKs, but we can fix those pretty easy. That's no problem. Hello again. What's up, Harold? How you doing? Okay. Okay. Okay, we're checking a, uh, a checksum on a UDP header, which doesn't necessarily need to be checked. 238, we need to wrap that. And some more parens. And then we'll knot that on the same line, otherwise it's very confusing. So we'll invert that, that's the remaining bytes. And then we should have a checksum here. Print checksum. Uh, assert checksum is equal to Ah, oh, we shadow it. Fuck. Um, our, we'll say original, the original checksum. 
uh, check some mismatch. And we're just gonna assert, we're gonna see if we can send this some shit. If we can, we probably got it right, but I'm guessing we probably fucked this up. Oh, uh, we gotta not it, but let's just see. I do want this to fail. Um, if checksum, if the original checksum is not equal to zero, then we do this shit. Reset. Okay. Ooh, index out of bounds, 219. Whoa. Oh yeah, dest IP, zero to two. That makes sense. That's why we write Rust, guys. Okay, send. Checksum mismatch, perfect. Now, we're gonna not the checksum. This, hopefully, is correct. Fuck. Is this not how we do checksums? You can support muxing? What do you mean by muxing in this case? Like multiple ports over the same, over the same card? Yes. Um, get those bytes. Zero to two. From Big Endian. From Big Endian. Multiple channels within a dgram? How? You mean just by the ports? EDP doesn't have any information other than the ports, right? Um... Okay, source dust, proto, compute all that stuff. You, the UDP header uh, doesn't have anything other than the, the source port, desk port, the size, and the checksum. There's no option bits or anything, so I can't imagine there's anything else that can happen at this layer. Unless some bit in the IP layer changes the shape of a, of a UDP frame, but that would be really fucking weird. Possible weird. Okay. Um, length. Ooh. I think that's what's killing us here. The protocol. We got a two big Indian bytes, these bad boys. Uh, two big Indian, I think. It's just two BE. These guys. I think that's where we're probably off. Reset. Fuck. God damn it. I have no idea where I'm off on this checksum. Wrapping add. Oh, maybe the checksum starts at some value. Um, wrapping add. The dust IP in that order, zero to two, two to four from Big Endian. Oh, do I have to Endian swap this whole thing? Let's just see if we're close. Uh, reset. Oh, deadlock detected. Oh, I yeah, I can't print in this location, but we'll just assert on the... We'll throw it in the assert. Check some. Arrange, check some. Okay, reset. Ooh, 22E6, 22... Those do look close to Indian swapped. That would be that the the high parts fucked. Do we do this one wrong? Oh, technically I should just do this. I should convert that to a U16. And this should be uh, two big Indian.
I don't think that's the issue, though, but that is technically more correct. We shouldn't assume the Indian this, even though it's a 64-bit kernel only. Okay, that, like, dramatically changed it. What? How is that different? Get that. Convert it. Um, the fuck did I break here? Have to take the one's compliment at the end? That's what I'm printing out. Hmm. Check some wrapping ad. Source IP zero to two, then two to four as big Indian. Then we do big Indian on these two bytes and these two bytes. Then we have the protocol. Oh, I guess this is always the protocol is always lower. So that's technically wrong. The protocol we want that to be in the low part. And then on a big Indian system, protocol is already in the right spot here. Then the length, I'm guessing we want a big Indian the length. Okay, let's see if that got us closer. <laughs> Dude, it's so fucking hard to debug these, man. So fucking stupid. What a dumbass checksum fucking thing. Why, why would you put a checksum on a packet that's checksummed? What's the point of an internal checksum? I'm telling you, man. The whole fucking Ethernet frame is checksummed. Why is this a thing? Um. <sighs> wrapping of that. Is this supposed to be big Indian? It should be, because these two, it's prefixed, and it's the source address as big Indian bytes. That's exactly what I think it should be. So we convert that to big Indian bytes. That's just as it is. Go through, zero to two, two to four, zero to two, two to four. The protocol as a U16, which makes sense in this case, because we're promoting an eight, so we're zero extending on all architectures. We're just zero extending, regardless if it's big or little, little Indian. Then we convert the length to big Indian. Um, oh, do you not convert the length? Yeah, maybe I'm, maybe I'm Indian swapping too many of these things. These ones I think I do need to Indian swap. But the length, I've already loaded from Big Indian. Ah, that might be it. It's probably not. There's probably like four other instances of us fucking that up. Um, let's see if we can get a different one. Yeah, god damn it. Fuck this shit. Now I gotta think about indian -ness. It isn't required over Ethernet. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Um, source address, I think this is correct. The, the ones complement of the ones complement sum of the pseudo header of the information, a pseudo header of information from the IP header, the UDP header, and the data padded with zero octets at the end if necessary to make a multiple of two octets. Unless this is a different fucking length, but that is the length we got from the UDP header, which we've already done the big Indian conversion on. And then we do that somewhere else. Proto, that's fine. Then we're going through each two byte pair. Um, means adding the values together and then the carry bit to the first bit. I mean, I'm inverting each of the fields and adding them. 
does length include the header? It, it should, but they don't say, right? The spec doesn't say, right? Uh, oh, including this header and data, but the checksum doesn't mention if this length does, but I'm guessing it's the UDP length. So we get the UDP length as from big Indian bytes. So we have that already in the correct shape, in my opinion. Let me let me just let me just look at the fucking UDP checksum shit. How is it computed? Here we go. Teach me. Teach me, Linux. Oh my god, dude, this is so fucking bad. Why is this all in bits? Ah. Uh. What? What, what, who, 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 who visualizes memory layouts like this? What? 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 <laughs> oh my fucking God, this is so bad. Just give me the damn code. There we go, GitHub. Ha <laughs> ha. It'll just H tons everything. Wait, while account is greater than one, go through some that, ooh, that's not inverting them. It inverts them at the end? Wait, what the fuck? Did he check some? Okay, anyone who uses the register keyword is, is nuts. Um, that's just derefing it as shorts. If there are any bytes left, but then this is who writes code like this? Fold the sum to sixteen bits. Yeah, I think that's the case. It's not. It's not the. Yeah, it is a thing in C, but no compiler uses it, except for like a compiler from nineteen eighty five. Pretty much nothing is going to honor that keyword. It's just going to throw it in the trash. But yes, it is very much so a C thing. All right, I got to manage my Tibby character. Yeah, I think this is just showing, showing that we sum all the bytes, sum all the things. This is doing one Indian swap at the end. So I think what this is trying to do is this is trying to compute the checksum um, as little endian and then convert it once at the end to kind of save some cycles, which makes sense. The register keyword just makes things fast. <laughs> it's the it's the fast flag. Anytime I see someone using the register keyword, I just I just think of someone who like just for the first time read like the C language spec and they're like, oh shit, we can use a register keyword to make things go extra fast. No. No, you can't. Okay. Can we have the checksum for the count byte starting at address? Once complement of the once complement sum times. Oh, that's just the end of the, okay. So this is going to go through while there are more than two bytes. Sum up those. Okay. And that's on adder. What? Okay. So then wait, what is this? Oh, that's for the IP header. Oh. Okay, for the UDP header, this gets the payload. It then gets the top part of the address, bottom part of the address. What the fuck is this shit? The length is uh, to network. HTONS, IP proto, UDP. Um, 
dude, why is this code so fucking poorly written? Who writes code like this? Why would you use htons here and then here you manually fucking specify the, like, this would not work on a, on a big Indian system because you're assuming that that's the top part. I, God, who, oh my God. Wrapping sum. I'm pretty sure it's the sum of one's complement. And that's what it looks like it's doing. It's grabbing the top part of the address, which in big Indian would be the low, would, well, it doesn't matter what order you do that in. No, none of the ordering matters on any, any of this shit. So what matters is the Indianness of what it's working on. So if I did, is it, do these need to be little Indian because I already did the swamps? Now I'm just guessing. I'm just trying random things and seeing if it works. Nope. What the fuck? Does the spec have examples? No, it's an RFC. RFCs don't give examples. Or a clear documentation. I just say it is the ones complement of the ones complement sum of the pseudo header. And it doesn't tell you the ordering, endianness, or any of that stuff. How you handle overflow. So yeah, it's pretty it's pretty nice the way the way that they do that. It's it's really cool. So I love it. Super, super nice. RFCs are great. So, uh, sexual source kernel. Uh, kernel net. Uh, source BSP net EDP. Okay. You know, I think I just ignore the checksum. Yeah, I do. I always ignore the checksum. Um, in this case, the bytes on the wire. So this is going to put the bytes on the wire like this. And this is then going to convert it into a little Indian that represents that. So if, if it's 4100, we would get 4100 here. I'm pretty sure those are correct. The proto, um, checks them for all the words in a buffer. EDP. Length minus the IPv4 header, raw checksum. Um. Source address, desk address. Fluent in one's complement arithmetic. Maybe I'm not supposed to be nodding all these things. Pretty sure these from Big Endian is correct. I think these are correct. Oh, I fucking hate checksums, man. I hate checksums that are Indian this sensitive. It's just so fucking stupid. Um, source desk IP. We have those bytes. We two big Indian bytes them because we previously from BE bytes them. Uh, 
Um. Like, Harold, I know that I can put this in a Python script as bytes and parse it. That's fucking easy. The hard part is I already have some of these things parsed out, and they're already in a different endianness. Like, I've already handled some of that stuff. Right? I, <laughs> I guess I'm not too concerned about if I had the entire thing splayed out as bytes, how I would do it. The problem is some of these things are already parsed out as not bytes, and I need to make sure that they're correctly uh, formatted. So in this case, if we have the source IP and zest IP, um, and we can't print here, we can panic though. <clears throat> we have the source IP and the dest IP. Those will be in the correct order that they are on the wire. And I guess we have to slice these. Um, ah, oh, fuck. What's this? Hex, and we'll say O2 on these. So this will print. Yeah, and those are in the correct order. So we grab the first two bytes and we treat them as big Indian, unless this somehow does little Indian, but I don't think that's the case. And the ordering doesn't matter. I'm pretty sure these first pairs are correct. Thinking about taking a known value, using that to verify the piece of the code, yeah. The hard part is I need, I don't need the like final part. I mean, I could, I can just literally grab um just need a UDP packet. Here we go. Oh. I think I have to zero out the um I think I have to zero out the checksum. Yeah. Yeah, I think I have to zero out the checksum. So let's grab Yeah, but now I have to make the pseudo header. Oh, it's just so fucking stupid, man. It's so convoluted. What is the point of a pseudo header? What Is this validating the UDP or the or the IP header? <laughs> For some reason, they think that you should have the the IP header as part of the UDP checksum, even though there's a fucking IP checksum. Like, why would you do that? What is the point? It's so fucking hard to test. It'll take me like five minutes to get something up in Python because I'll have to manually handcraft the fake header because I can grab these bytes, right? I can copy these. That's, ugh, that doesn't have the data. God damn it. Copy as escape string, you son of a bitch. There we go. Okay, so that is a UDP packet, starting from there. Yeah, but we definitely have to zero out that checksum. So we have to be, we have to be aware of where that checksum is. Um, okay, got these, and then we can do uh, struct. Yeah, it's fucking so stupid. There's no window. You can't do windows in 
Python, and we have to construct, we have to make a fucking, we have to make an actual program, because it's too complex to do in this. Foop. I hate this shit, man. It's so fucking stupid. Like, why, why are you doing checksums on a verified medium? Like, I, I understand that you can do UDP over something that is not, uh, not Ethernet, but can you name me a single protocol that doesn't have any transmission checks? Because at that point, the whole f protocol is fucked. Like, if you have no transmission checks on your protocol level, on your, like, frame level, then why do you even care about the internal data? Because it could be fucked. The checksum itself could be fucked, right? Like, it's just such a stupid concept. So here we can go for offset in range zero to len foop. I swear to God, if that is not, I swear to God, if this is not, it is two byte aligned. Okay. Go through every two byte offset. We got to check some. We're going to start with zero. We'll do check some plus equals the range uh, of foop for offset to offset plus two and then we'll do a struct dot unpack from a big indian half word we'll add that up and now we have a checksum uh but we don't have it and here we do and oxfff so we don't know if we have to invert the fields. We don't know if we have to invert the end. We don't know how we include the header. Um, so I have to figure all of that out. I just want to write fucking code, man. Wrap it in a byte array and do decode. Yeah, that just gives you a list of all the things, doesn't it? Okay, check some. And then I'm guessing that I probably have to zero out the actual checksum field, right? So in this case, it was 4C75, so these two. I'm guessing I have to zero out the checksum field. So when I'm processing it, I have to be aware of where I am. And then I also have to add this fake header. So we'll do, um, we'll take foop is equal to byte hex the source address which is C0A86501, then the destination address, which is C0A865, FF, then we have to give it the zero, a zero, just a byte, and then the protocol, which is 17, which is hex 11, then we have to give it the UDP length, which I'm guessing is literally the UDP length, which is also included in the UDP header. Um, so that's nice. So good thing that we have the header and we have the length from the header and this other length. I'm pretty sure they just threw it in there because they're bored. Now we can compute this checksum. And this is saying it should be 9430. So now we just start randomly putting inverts uh, one's complement on things. So we'll just do this. So just be randomly one's complementing things. 94 to 30. Oh, that's really close. That's really close. Um... Should be 94, 30. Okay. 9430. But aren't we supposed to invert the whole thing at the end? We're supposed to like not this. We'll do this. Okay, and then I don't know if I'm supposed to be inverting these, so we're just gonna have to guess. 9434, okay, it's close. Uh, definitely treated as big endian. So we go through C0A86501, C0A865FF, 
we got a zero, then we have the protocol, which is 11, and then we have the UDP length. Oh, that says big Indian. The UDP length is big Indian in this case, right? Uh, yeah, that is correct. 1200 or 0012 is Big Indian. Um, and then we, if we not everything, we have a problem. So that's wrong. If we don't, if we only not one of them, it's close, but it's still wrong. 9434. Okay. Um, 6501, 65FF, 0011, 0012, which is the length, unless it uses a different length. <laughs> I don't know what that length it could be, but it could be using a different length. It's not very clear. Does the IP checksum count the next header? No, the IP checksum is only on the header itself. It's not on the whole packet, the whole payload. 0012. What is this length? What is the UDP length? It doesn't tell you. And the UDP length. I'm guessing that's the length of the UDP payload. I'm guessing, but I have to guess because it's not very fucking clear in the spec. Unless these are supposed to be FF, it doesn't tell you. Um, EDP length is 24 and 25 of the whole EDP packet, yeah. And that's these, right? It's just these two. So... Um, so I have the UDP length. It's so fucking weird, man. Unless the checksum's not supposed to be zero, what are you supposed to have the checksum as? Zero? I'm guessing, I'm guessing you put a zero in there, but this does not tell you at all. <laughs> Which is great. It's the one compliment, one's compliment of the one's compliment. Which, the way I would interpret that is you do the one's compliment of the one's compliment. But that makes it, I mean, it, closeness isn't really a concept. The checksum has to be zero. It's not included in the pseudo header plus data. Okay. So we're doing that. We have that as zero, and then we're off by like four here. I don't know if that's incorrect. I don't know if that's coincidence or actually the case. But we did clear out the 4C75. Yep. We have the length is 12, which is the same length that we use here. We have the 0032, which is the port. We have the destination, which is D8CF. And then we have the pseudo header. And that means that we're doing our inversion or our sums wrong, or we're not supposed to be treating it as big endian. Or one's complement sum doesn't actually mean that you one's complement it and sum it. Maybe it's just you add it. Maybe you don't xword it at the end. In which case, I think this was close, but it's still oh actually that's the that that one is off. Maybe the checksum starts at a different value. <laughs> like, maybe it starts at FFF. It, it's just so fucking unclear. It doesn't tell you the initial value of the checksum. It doesn't tell you what you're supposed to pad with. It doesn't tell you what you're supposed to put as the checksum bytes. It doesn't tell you the endianness of what you're supposed to be doing for the operations. It doesn't tell you what the once complement sum is. It doesn't tell you about the one complement at the end. I'm guessing you invert everything. But it's like... How the fuck did people ever implement this spec? <laughs> I'm pretty sure someone did and they're like, okay, that's the version that we're gonna go with. That's the interpretation of this. 
But to me, a one's compliment sum, a one's compliment of a one's compliment sum just adds MSB carry to LSB. Um... Oh, so I actually have to... Oh, so you're telling me if there's overflow, the overflow has to carry over. I see. Is that it? So what I need to do is I need to get the value, and then I need to add it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think this is what it is. Checksum plus equals that, and then the checksum. I see. Checksum computation, EDP page. They're all summed using one's complement arithmetic. The carryout is produced, swing that around and add it to the LSB. Okay, that makes sense. So then what we have to do is we sum up everything and then we copy the carry, which is checksum is equal to, I guess, I guess I'm not too familiar with one's complement sum. Uh, and no, we gotta do this. And then we plus uh, checksum shift 16 plus that, and that's the checksum. Okay, and then, and then the ones complement of this whole thing. That should be it. Nope, got my prens wrong. There we go. Nine four thirty. Hey, we did it. Okay. So yeah, we ba we basically go through, sum everything up, and then we then a uh, one's complement sum. That's such weird fucking terminology. I guess I guess maybe maybe in 1975 when they wrote this spec. One's complement sum was like a, a common thing that people did. So then, can this overflow? Yes, it can. So what do you do if it overflows? The one, what do you do if adding the checksum into the checksum causes a, a, an overflow? Is that? Um, swinging around, finally the sum is once complemented to yield the value of the UDP checksum. Um, um, so if we were to, if a carry out is produced, it's added to the least significant bit. Yeah, so I think I have to, on the final one, I also have to do that. So if we add this, and that causes it to overflow. So here, here's the, the, the real logic, right? Um, the real logic is check sum plus equals, and then if we had a carry, we swing that around. F, uh. I actually think this is correct in all situations. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I'm pretty sure this is correct in all situations. So what that means is we will wrapping at that, wrapping at that, wrapping at that, wrapping at that. The protocol as U16, I think that's correct. Then the length as is. Then here we treat everything as a big endian, int. And then at the end, we read a single byte and then we convert it to big endian, which will byte swap it, which is what we want. 
And then at the end, we print that shit. So... We want to do this into a U32, I guess? So as U32 on all of these. Ah, oh, fuck. So U32, then we convert that, and then this as U32. As U32. Protocol as a U32. As U32 for the length. This as U32 that, then this. All right. So, and in this case, I'm just gonna break it intentionally. This will fail and then we can see, we can do the computation ourselves. In fact, we wanna do checksum. And let's see what we get. Reset. Okay, so, this should be, instead, we should have Python OX FFFB plus OX4, not, is that actually zero in this case? Yeah, it, it, it actually is in this case. So we fuck something up. Protocol is U32. Which is correct. Because the protocol is the bottom part. Yeah, so we want the protocol as U16, as U32. We zero extend that whole thing. Source and destination zero to two, two to four. From big Indian bytes. So you shoot those as big Indian and then the length is already been converted. And then here, go through each of the offsets, ii, step by two, i i plus two, convert that from big Indian, convert that to u32, add that up. Then that last byte, uh, panic, what? I don't know if I handle that case correctly, but we'll see. Okay, sweet. So we're not hitting that. So that's the packet that we're seeing, and we're supposed to have... Oh yeah, we don't, uh, we don't zero out that one field. So when we're processing this, we'll say if ii is equal to... Uh, if it's equal to six, continue. Okay, now we can do OX four C six C plus OX four. Invert this, hex that. B38, B38F, yeah, that's correct. Okay, so this is uh, skip processing the EDP checksum field. Uh, this will interpret it as zeros. <sighs> so fucking nice, man. And then, I don't know if I'm handling this correctly. We get a byte. And yeah, 2BE, because it would be 1100, which should be loaded as a 1100. We'll have it as 11, we'll 2 big endian it. And on a big endian system, it wouldn't change the representation. No, I think we always want to shift it. So these are fine, these are fine, and then this one, we want to pad it with a zero. So I think we can just do this, and this is actually correct in all situations. Uh, we'll do this, shift by 8. So we'll read the, the last byte 
and then we'll shift it to the left by 8, which is the big Endian interpretation of that by adding zeros at the bottom, which is the way that it would appear in the actual memory. Okay. So then, uh, let checksum is equal to checksum as u16 wrapping add checksum shift 16 as u16. Okay. And then we invert that whole thing. So this is uh, carry over the carries and invert the whole thing. Um, and then this should pass. Checksum is equal to the original checksum and this should work. Yeah, so that's working. Now, what we need to do is we can maybe optimize this a bit because this code, I'm pretty sure if we do everything as little Indian, can we? Do we have to treat them as big Indian when we do the arithmetic or can we do them as little Indian and do a byte swap at the end? Let's try it in our Python. Here we'll do, I think foop is what we called it. Yeah. So this should be 9430. So that's what's expected. Let's see if we can do it as little Indian. Obviously that's wrong. Yeah, that's 394. So we can we can do it as little Indian, and then we can swap the bytes, which is a little bit faster. Or technically we'll do native Indian. So I'll read those as native Indian bytes. This one's always correct, regardless of big or little Indian. And then here at the end, that's going to be wrong, and it's going to be the opposite. We got to just flip the two bytes, but we'll double check it. Um... From native Indian, from native Indian. Oh, these will have to convert to big Indian. Proto or two, yeah, two BE. Those are kind of special cases. Uh, and they need to be U16s that we swap. So this, everything native Indian, native Indian here, add them all together, wrapping at these, and this is correct, right? Get that as a U16, shift it by eight as a U32. Here we do checksum wrapping at, this should be basically the opposite, yes. F8, D3, D3, F8. So then in this case, we will then convert this whole thing to big Indian. So if we're a big Indian system, everything here is a NOP effectively, the 2BE. This 2BE is a NOP. All these uh, reads are big Indian. And then at the end, uh, that's a NOP. So on a big Indian system, this does the same thing as a little Indian system. Doesn't matter, it's a 64-bit x86 kernel. Okay, so now what this means is test.py. I can now add to my bytes. I can do um, random.rand int 0, 2 to, the uh, 2 to the 64, minus 1, struct.pack as a doesn't matter ending this quad word. And then imports struct. Uh, import random. Okay. So 
This will effectively go through every single combination and will eventually probably hit a failure. I need to get rid of these prints. Uh, we don't actually invert on the zero case, which we need to do. So that's what we want to do is when we get, uh, we want to get the UDP here is equal to this. Bam. Okay. Technically don't need to send it either, but reset. There we go. Check some mismatch. Perfect. Because if it's zero, we got to invert it, but that means the test worked. Um, if checksum is zero uh, at the end, uh, checksum is equal to not zero, else zero. So this is, if the check sum is zero, it should become all Fs. Oops, we can do this one liner. Okay, if the checksum was zero, then the checksum should actually be not zero. Otherwise, the checksum is the original checksum value. All right, so Wireshark's not happy. It's a lot of packets for Wireshark. Poor thing. Reset and run the test. And we got to check some mismatch. Fuck. We computed a B. And that's in the bottom part. So we added one additional carry. We added one additional carry. Um, so I'm gonna go back to this just for safety, but I'm pretty sure it's the same thing. Those are already as is. I'm pretty sure this will fail in the same way. There's some weird edge case. Um, any bytes? Okay, we don't do that anywhere. Reset. So we're adding an extra one in some cases. I'm pretty sure these NEs are fine. 2BE. And that would be happening. Yeah, it's always we're one ahead of it. And they're always in like the FF range. I think this is overflowing when we add that and then we're not wrapping that carry around. So I think we have to carry the carries into the carry, carry, carry. Do I just have to loop? Is there a good way to do that? If I add all the carries in, I think I just have to do it twice. Let's say FFF, add three carries. Yeah, there can never be more carries than, there's only going to be one chance that it can go over. So what we have to do is checksum is equal to checksum as u16 plus checksum shift 16 as u16 wrapping add those well technically it's this and OXFFF. So we wrapping at that. Um, and that's fine. So you have to do that twice. All right. And then Checksum is equal to not checksum as u16. So I'm pretty sure, yeah, we just do that twice. All right, let's see. Reset. Oh, fuck. 
Uh, oh, we gotta swap it. To be big ending. There we go. This pretty much instantaneously is going to regenerate uh, every possible packet. Yeah. And we'll stop that. Processing. How many packets are we sending? Yeah, we're sending like hundreds of thousands. So this is testing every single possible condition. And it looks like we're passing all of them. So I think this is now good. We're now checking that checksum correctly. <laughs> Woof. We did it, guys. We did it. We made a checksum. <laughs> okay. But yeah, this is this is checked like what is this? How many packets a second? Yeah. It's definitely tested every single possible combination. So we've computed that just fine. So here we can say if checksum is not equal to the original checksum, return none. And this is a checksum mismatch. So, but yeah, it's that's gone through every single possible combination. All right. So now what we can do is, yeah, that's an annoying thing, but yeah, I forgot you carry over the carries. It's the same as TCP. TCP does the same thing. Um, and sending. Yeah, just zeros. Yeah. <laughs> we know we're over a protocol where it doesn't matter. We're sending fucking zeros. Uh, we have to do the IP checksum now. Yay, IP. I don't know why. Ch I don't know why that checksum tilts me so much. It's just, it's so annoying, man. Uh, checksum. Okay, header checksum. Let's see. Um. Packet arrives on a router, it calculates the checksum of the header and compares it with the checksum field. If they don't match, it discards. Yep. Errors in the data field, blah, blah, blah. Okay, what is the checksum for an IPv4 header? There's a whole Wikipedia article. That's fucking weird. Calculating it. Um, header showed in bold. Yep. And the checksum is underlined. Every time a carry occurs, we must add one to the sum. Blah blah blah. So we can just add it all together and then add the carry. It's the same. It's the same thing. It's the same thing, isn't it? So. Uh, can we do any code reuse here, in an effective manner? Um. I don't know if we can. So the problem is this will compute. I guess we can just have, yeah, we can implement, uh, we can implement this. Uh, we can do fn uh, checksum or er, ones complement checksum. And this will take bytes. And this will produce the ones complement checksum for th this area. Oh, and then probably should just have a checksum maybe as the inputs, like the existing running checksum. Yeah, I don't know. How do we code reuse this? Well, we need to U32 the whole thing. And it's complement. Um, Because in the case of in the case of UDP, I kind of have that fake header, and I don't want to actually construct the fake header and append it. So I think I'll compute that checksum, and then we'll return this. And this is just the like tail part of it. Um, 
So yeah, I think we'll do this. So that's the pseudo header checksum and then the remaining part. And does this checksum invert? I don't think so. I don't think the IPv4 checksum inverts, does it? Uh, original checksum is not omitted. Add the carry bits. Oh yeah, you just want to make sure it's Fs. Isn't that what we can do for the UDP side of things? I think if I don't skip that, I can just assert checksum is equal to OXFFF, I think. We'll get rid of this checksum mismatch shit, but I'm pretty sure that's how that works. Uh, 98. Reset. Okay. Yeah. So in this case, it'll always be all Fs. Right? Because we're including that checksum field, that'll be included in the addition, and then it'll turn into all Fs. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So that assert is actually in there. Reboot. So, and that's passing all tests. So what we can do is we can literally just check some over all 16-bit fields in a list of bytes, I guess. And then we can use it for both generation and, because we're gonna need to create these as well. So this will be the uh, check sum. Uh, this is compute a ones complement checksum complement checksum over the bytes and I think flipping every bit yields zero which indicates no error and our case is always all F's right yeah Um, I think this, if the checksum is zero, it should become all Fs. Well, in this case, it doesn't matter. We can just assert that it's zero. Because we knew it was non-zero there. And then here we can assert that it's zero. This is now correct. Yep. So this is now correct. And this will generate everything, blah, blah, blah. And then you once complement the whole thing. OK. So we can actually reuse this logic quite a bit then. Um, pub or fn checksum. This will take start, the starting value. Then we'll have, and we'll just say, that starts out as mute. And these are bytes. And this returns a U16. Okay. How can we validate the IP header? It's kind of tough. Go through each two byte in the bytes.len. Here, if the bytes.len mod2 is not zero. Then we grab the last byte. So if bytes.len is zero, this will be zero. Zero to zero, this will be zero. And then carry over the carries and invert the whole thing. Okay. And then we return the checksum. Carry over the carries, invert the whole thing. And this is on bytes. Bytes. Oh, we're almost done with this shit. I'm so excited. Get me out. 103. Um, that'll always succeed. 
Okay. And here, start the checksum self checksum checksum ip.payload. Let checksum, and then this is a checksum in the actual UDP header plus payload. Okay, so that'll check some of that. And this should now work. Okay. Woo! We did it. We did it. And now IPv4. Uh, yeah, we just assert that it's zero. Same for there. Does Rust have a notation of constraints on what type can implement a trait? Uh, it does not. You could, so you can have, you can have, um, you can have your trait require a trait, right? So you can do, you can do trait, trait foo requires other traits. And now you require that you have this trait implemented. And I don't think you can do that. Negative bounds are not supported. Yeah, so you, you basically can say that it requires, you can require that your trait requires a trait, but you cannot uh, do a negative bound. You can't say that this cannot, like something that has this trait cannot implement it. Can you have empty traits to tag types? Yeah. Those are just called marker traits, and that's what, like, um, uh, that's a good example. Uh, phantom data, I think. I don't know if phantom data is a trait. I think it's a structure. But yeah, it's just a, you can, you can just have an empty trait and then implement that trait on your types. Just do, like, traits, whatever, impl, what, uh, whatever for u32 right and now you have whatever implemented for u32 yeah that's what like clone and copy are those like clone copy debug or debugs not but clone and copy uh, i guess those actually have implementations fuck um actually i think copy is just a marker Sized is just a marker, right? There's no functions on that. All right, compute that checksum, and then we'll do the same thing on the IP header. Validate the total length if it's less than 20. And then here, check the checksum. Assert that this is the header. Checksum starting at zero for the header. Ref header is zero. Okay, let's see if our checksums are good self. Let's see if our checksums are good for IP, and I think they are. I think it's the same. Yeah, so we're not getting that assertion, so that should be good. So if the checksum of this IP header is not equal to zero, return none. Down here, we'll say if this is not equal to zero return none. And at this point, we're parsing. We're parsing packets. So we should be able to put that print back in. Uh, print UDP. And that will now parse it as UDP. Yeah, we're getting all these UDP packets. And those have the IP and the UDP headers all validated on them. So, and those look good. Got the IP source Mac, headers, IPs, protocols, everything that we need. All right. Nice. Then we have some nuns. Yeah, so we'll see nuns. Whenever there's a non UDP packet, we'll see none print. <clears throat> so let's take a look. We just got to wait for some non-UDP traffic, but we'll see none if it's not a UDP packet.
And this parsing is pretty lightweight. God damn it. Now, now the network's silent. Oh, there we go. We saw some UDP stuff, and it sent the same thing back, right? So it echoed. Um, is that really the only network traffic we're having? <laughs> Break. So there's UDP, and what's our response time on that? Eight millis? Oh, yeah, we got the print. Okay. Woof. It's like, whoa. So now what we can do is we can parse that UDP. And then if it's UDP, if let sum UDP is equal to UDP on the packet, then we'll send the packet. So this will make sure that we only respond, we only echo UDP packets that we see on the network. And this will basically be a measure of the cost of our UDP stuff. So we can use the timer over here. So we'll reboot. And scroll this to the end. And now I can send these packets. Why is this not auto scrolling? There we go. All right, how quickly are we responding? Yeah, it looks like 150, 150 microseconds. Um, and then in this case, this is 100 micros exactly. So it looks like, yeah, it's a, we're about 100 microseconds. And that's probably bottlenecking on literally the network. Uh, it's like not, I, I don't think it's taking us th that long to parse. Well, it was 100, 100 before when we didn't do that. Okay, let's send U UDP packets. So to do that, we're going to implement stuff on net. So now we can get access to, once we get access to a network device, or we can then send packets. And then packets will have checksums. We can get access to Ethernet, IP, UDP. And now what we'll do is a new UDP or something, or like, um, uh, it'll be on mute self, I think is what we'll do. Yeah, we'll do uh, pub, pub fn create UDP. This is on mute self, so it's in place. And this will be uh, create a new UDP packet. It won't send it, right? This is all on the packet structure. So this is just parsing and, and creating these things. So on mute self, and we'll have to take in all the information. So yeah, so I think we'll do like pubstruct ethernet address, and that's just gonna be the source and desk. I think, or like UDP destination, I don't, it'll probably do this, probably do eth address, this is like the address of an ethernet frame, and then I'll do pubstruct IP address, yeah, but this is not a single address, this is for like a packet. Because we can just lie, right? We can just make all this shit up. We can send raw frames. We could, we could have this be correct and not fake these things out for... We might need to send to FFF, but I don't think we'll ever actually send from FFF. So, yeah, we could do that. EDP. Uh, create... Create EDP. This will take... Destin destination Ethernet address, dest IP, U32, dest port is U16. Oh, we don't have the concept of a source port and a source IP because we don't have an IP yet. 
Yeah. We can do like create EDP raw. Is it even valid to send from global broadcast? I don't think so, but we can do it. <laughs> There's nothing stopping us from doing it. Uh, Swerths, Ethernet, U8 for six. Destination, source, IP, dest IP. And then we'll have source port and dest port. Okay. All right. So now we'll make a new packet with source dest, source dest, source dest, port port IP IP, eth eth. Okay, so now we can make a new packet. And this will be relatively easy, actually. Um, Self.raw. dot dot six copy from slice so we care about ethernet here destination we'll grab the source we'll probably want to do yeah this is fine copy the source ethernet self dot raw zero dot uh, ox c to ox e copy from slice this is the ether type which is uh, ipv4 which is 800 right we have that as a constant e type nice Copy from slice this, and that should be a U16. It is. And this is two BE bytes. So we copy in those bytes. Uh, set up the Ethernet frame. Source e dest eth. Ref both of those. Then copy two beginning bytes of the eth type. Then self dot raw ox e um, let ip is equal to uh, self dot raw mute ref. So this will set up the Ethernet frame. We'll do this at let eth is equal to mute self dot raw to ox e. Just for some clarification, we'll say eth on these. So I'll copy to the ethernet frame here. Semicolon, okay. Then we're gonna set up the IP frame. Same, same sort of thing. Okay, this will be IP. This will be from OXE to OX What's 20 plus E? Um, 20 is 14 plus E. I should probably just do this in Python. Hex 20 plus E 22. <clears throat> okay, so now we'll set up, set up the IP frame, the IP header. Oh yeah, and that's on this. Set up the IP header, this, and we'll copy into IP. It's only a small amount of shit here that I care about. Uh, IP header wiki. IPv4 header. All right, here we go. So we got the version and the length. So we'll set that to zero is equal to OX 
04, 05. Um, I set IPv4 as version and uh, 20 bytes header. Right? OX0405. Yep, that's the version and then the length, which is 5. Uh, IP OX, and we'll need 2. OX01 is equal to 0. Um, no, what's the DSCP and ECN? DSP and ECN. IP OX2 to OX4. We can just say 1, 0. 2 to 4, this is the total length. And that's the length of the header plus the payload. Oh yeah, create UDP raw. This will be a message U8. So we will do um, let's sort of turn a, a bool, maybe an option. I don't know. We'll we'll just let it panic. I think when we do the copy, eh. Here we can say if message dot len plus twenty plus well twelve. Or actually, it's fourteen for the Ethernet frame. Plus twenty plus eight. Right, two, 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 eight. If that is greater than 15, 14, which is the maximum Ethernet frame size, 1500 bytes, right? Yeah. So if this is greater than that, return none. Make sure the, uh, we'll put that in print. Make sure the message fits inside a single datagram. So 14 is the ETH header, 20 is the IP header, eight is the UDP header, length is the payload. Make sure that if it is above 1514, it does not fit. So then we can set up the ethernet header. Here we can then compute the size of the IP header, which is um, 20 plus uh, we'll do IP size is equal to 20 plus 8 plus message.len. Copy from slice IP size. And this we can do as U16 to big Indian bytes. So uh, copy in the uh, total length of the IP packet, which is the 20 for the IP header, eight for the UDP header, plus the size of the payload as a U16. We copy that into two to four as big endian. Then we have the identification is zero, and this will do IP five dot dot six is equal to, or five, four dot dot six is equal to, eh. Copy from slice ref zero two. Flags and fragment offset are all zero. Yeah, identification, flags and fragments are all zero. And fragment offset, TTL protocol and TTL. Uh, actually, do we want to set a TTL to like FF? Um, when it hits zero, discards it. Um, hop count. Let's see. We. I don't know if I can put it to zero. If I set that IP, let's actually see what these are sending. TTL sixty four. Yeah, we'll do that and fragment offset are all zero. That is 
four. Here we can say two to four. This one will be from four to uh, just four to eight. So identification flags and fragment offset are all zero, which is true. Okay. Then TTL is at byte eight equals 64. Uh, TTL is set to 64. Seems to be standard. Then we have a protocol. Nine uh, protocol is UDP. In this case, we'll do IP proto UDP const IP proto UDP. This is a U8, which is equal to, I think, 11. Yeah, 11 hex. Uh, UDP protocol. Uh, UDP protocol for the IP header. IP proto UDP. And then a header checksum. Uh, IP... 10 to 12 copy from slice ref zero for two. And this is uh, initialize the checksum to zero. And then IP 12 to 16 is the dest uh, source IP two, LE uh, two big Indian bytes. And 16 to 20, uh, copy in the source and dest IPs. Okay. Then compute the checksum and fill in the checksum field. So we'll do checksum is equal to self checksum starting at zero and we invert that in the checksum thing. I think we do. Thanks for all the follows, Aaron. Lots of follows coming in. Fuck yeah. Almost, we're almost where we can send a UDP packet, and then we can start working on protocols, which are relatively easy. Uh, compute the checksum and fill in the checksum field. This is of just IP, and then IP 10 to 12, copy from slice, Check some two big Indian bytes. So that will send over the IP checksum. Okay. Expected option, we'll just return none. Overflowing literals, 0405. Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, it's just 45. Right? Pretty sure. Yeah, 45, okay. No DSCP and ECN. Set the total length. Copy that in, okay. Now we set up uh, the UDP header. Uh, UDP header. This is at a hex 22. Up until 22 plus eight, which is 22A. Okay. Now in the UDP header, we've got source port UDP zero to two, copy from slice, source port two big Indian bytes. We've got the dest port. We've got the length. Um, and the length, this will be let length is equal to, we'll say UDP size is equal to eight, eight plus payload.len as U16. Then I'll copy into there the UDP size. And then UDP eight, uh, six to eight, copy from slice, 
O2. This is uh, no checksum. Uh, not required for IPv4. Easy. Uh, copy in the source and dest ports. Uh, compute and copy in the UDP size plus header. Okay, 340 is not payload. I think data is what I call it. Message. Hey, it builds. Okay, and then this will be uh, some uh, success. And then at this point, we will do... And what's 2a hex Python ox2a? That should be equal to uh, 14 plus 20 plus 8. Quit. Okay, perfect. So then we'll do... And I'm going to actually change these. This is, this is going to be 14. This is 14 to 14 plus 20. And then this is going to be 14 plus 20 to 14 plus 20 plus 8. So it's just a, a little bit more clear where those are coming from. Still not great. And then we'll do self.setlen to 14 plus 20 plus 8 plus um, EDP size.len uh, set the length of the packet. Oops, not EDP size, message.len. Okay. IP proto UDP. Never used? Oh, yeah, because this code is never used. Header checksum 184. We don't need that. Uh, checksum. We just checksum it, and then here, if the original checksum is non zero, then we compute it for UDP. So what this should allow me to do is make a UDP packet. <laughs> so that's for receiving. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, eh. We're gonna do nick dot, uh, let meet packet is equal to nick dot allocate packets. So that will get us access to a packet. And then we'll do packet.create UDP raw. And this will have the source, which will be OXFF for six. Destination, OXFF for six. Source IP, which will be zero. Dest IP, oops. Source IP, which will be zero. Dest IP, which will be zero. Source port 50, 50. And then the message be hello world. And then I can do nick.send packet. Uh, unwrap that. You know what? We're just going to panic, I think, on this case. Honestly, we'll just let all this shit set up. And then we'll copy that shit in. And then on set len, I'm sure that len is less than or equal to uh, 14, 15, 14, and this. Set land oob. So has to be less than or equal to the size of a packet. So when we actually go to set the length uh, is where that will fail. OK, now we're not using that. But this should, in theory, I think we have a loop. So we're going to break out of the loop. This will send one hello world packet. It'll broadcast one hello world packet. And we'll see if we're computing those checksums and stuff correctly. And I'm pretty sure we are. Uh, okay, uh, left and right, we got issues on those. Left is zero, we've got an eight somewhere. Where do you set this up? Eight, four to eight, this is four. Yeah, four bytes. Okay, so that in theory sent a packet and it seems it did not. It might be getting discarded. Wait, what was that send? 
Oh, that's the Spotify thing. Okay. Um, data packet. Oh, that's TFTP. Okay, why are we not getting that? That means we probably fucked up one of these checksums. Is your IP copied from Slice? Checksum inverts it, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that inverts it. Starts off at zero. Zero to six. It's kind of weird. I don't know. You know, we can actually, par we can parse our own packet. <laughs> we can just call dot parse on it or dot EDP when we make our packet. Uh, so we'll do print. <laughs> it's, it's cheesy, but it does actually work. Uh, we'll print packet.edp. So that will print the packet that we're about to send. And it looks like it did parse. Oh, it doesn't look right, though. Source dest type 2048. I think that's correct. ETH, two big Indian bytes at C to E. Then we have a payload, and at parse that, source IP, dust IP, zero, zero, protocol 17. Then we have a payload, source port, or dust port, source port, and then the payload. Oh, we never copy in the payload. Um, oh yeah, and that would have failed. If we didn't compute these checksums correctly, if we, let's just add one to that for shits and grins. That'll print none. So that means that we actually computed the checksums correctly. None, yep, okay. So I'm pretty sure this does work. We're not copying in the payload, which is obviously an issue. Uh, so we'll copy in self.raw 14 plus 20 plus eight dot dot 14 plus 20 plus eight plus message dot len dot copy from slice message, uh, copy in the payload. Okay. So that now has the payload, the hello world. And maybe this is just blocking because it doesn't like those source dest IPs or maybe it doesn't like the sending from broadcast. Let's just try some We'll do all Fs for the IPs. Oh, we can just do not zero. So the IPs will be not zero. Okay. Didn't get that. Alright, let's use real source desk then. OX. Let's just grab one of these. Actually, I think we're guaranteed to have a MAC address at this point. So this is the source. So we can do self.mac. I think um, on an Intel Gbit. Oh, that's on Mac. Ah, I do have self.mac. This is just testing anyways. All this stuff's gonna get polished up and changed. And this is on nick.mac. Reset. Hey, there it is. Hello world. So we can, yeah, we just needed a, a source that was valid. So that's the actual source. Uh, we have the IP and port as all 255s, but we got a payload, which is hello world. And we should be able to um, let me hard code the MAC address of my own computer. We technically need to ARP it, but let's say this is coming from source here. This is the source. Copy as value. Okay, we can we can we can make do with that. Uh, 
for now you could set the locally assigned bit. What's the locally assigned bit? Oh, that is the IP, like use the, um, is that where you use the, like, in the MAC address? What is the, huh, what, what is that? I've, I've never heard of that. O2, oh. Placing X, so there are like a couple different things. Well, we have the actual MAC address that we're using, so that's not too big of an issue. And then we'll grab the IP. So my IP is OXC0192168, which is A, it's A something, right? A6? A8. A8, 6501, so that's the source, that's actually the desk, COA8, 6501, doesn't matter, and then we're going to send that from source port to destination port, Lido, okay, vimtest.py, sock.bind, 192.168.101.1.13270 print sock dot receive all. I think that's correct. Uh, receive from, sorry. Ugh. And oh, that takes up a, a buffer? No, the size, the max size in Python. All right, let's see. Reboot. Uh, that's sent to lead O on us. Okay. Is it just it didn't like that IP? We can change it to 11. We can change that to a B for the source. Unless it doesn't like not using an ephemeral port, but I don't think that's the case. Or maybe I fucked up the MAC address. Reset. Hey! Whoop, whoop! Whoop, 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 whoop! <laughs> we did it. We sent, we sent a packet. There we go, we made it! <laughs> we have done, we have done a UDP. <laughs> Hell yeah. That is a complete network protocol if I've ever seen one. What more do you need in an operating system? It's all you need. You got your UDP. <laughs> Ship it. All right, now we got to do ARP. ARP's really fucking easy. We got to do ARP and DHCP. So um, now we can send and receive from raw. And that's test code. We no longer need test code. So this network code is actually pretty solid. Um, no copies on send and receives, which is good. Well, when we do a UDP send, we have to construct that message. And there's really no, there's no way around that. Um, other than if we have someone directly create their message inside of there. We could do that. We could have someone place the message in there and then we wouldn't have to copy it. So like when you're making a message, you just create the message directly in the packet buffer and we could give you access to the UDP area of that. Um, yeah, we could say like message length here. This is U size. And then we wouldn't actually copy the, the payload in. Message len. This way, we can always wrap this with helpers that will automatically set it up for you, but we can't go the other way. We can't, we can't make non-copy out of something that copies, but we can make a copy easy version 
of an API for something that is non-copy under the hood. So at this point, we will initialize all these fields, but, and you can reuse the header if you're sending to the same location. Okay, so let's try and ARP something. Um, so do ARP wiki. And I think um I guess I have to do DHCP first, don't I? Because I need I need my own protocol address if I want to send something. Um Media address of the sender. And then our request is field is used to indicate the, yeah. So we'll have to, I think you can maybe do an ARP without that. And then, yeah, this is the target Mac and sender. Pretty sure it can be a static IP for the sender where you just like fill it in with nothing. Anyways, let's just get DHCP running. Fuck it. Like, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna do it anyways. So we'll do DHCP, we'll get a DHCP lease. Um, and this is all on a packet. So this is a, uh, a parsed UDP header plus payload. This is a parsed IP header plus payload. This is a parsed ethernet. Um, and this is the, uh, destination Mac address source. Mac address type of the Ethernet um, payload. This is the raw bytes following the Ethernet header. Okay. This is the um, Ethernet header for the packets source IP address, destination, IP address, uh, we'll say in network order, e.g. OXC0 do 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 is OX19 is 192.0.0.0. Yep. All right. I like clarifying that because sometimes people don't put comments like that and it's really confusing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Is it C0? I think it's C0 for 192. Yeah, it is. Okay, this is the uh, protocol um, for the IP payload. This is the raw bytes following the IP header. Uh, then here we'll have uh, IP header for the packets. And we have a desti destination port in network order. Do I want to say in network order? Or do I just want to say like, yeah, I think I do want to say in network order. Well, it's not technically in network order, is it? Like these IPs? Um. I think, yeah, this is a host order. We're just gonna say ho host order, because it, it is, because this, if we were to write this out, this would be wrong. So this is in host order, uh, e.g. Uh, 50 equals port 50, right? Destination source port. And this is the raw payload of the EDP packet. And this is the raw payload of the IP packet. Because technically, this is like everything afterwards. And then this is the actual payload that's been trimmed down by the size. We do that, right? We will trim down the size based on the length that was specified in the packet. Okay, yeah, so we will cut that down. Extract the UDP information from the payload, validating all layers. Then we have sending working, create a new raw UDP packet. 
pretty obvious what that's doing. It's a very raw packet because you specify literally everything. And then we'll make like a, uh, we'll probably do like helpers somewhere that will create a packet or like give you all of the parameters that you need. We'll figure out how we want to do that. But first we'll go into kernel source dhcp.rs. This is a DHCP cl uh, v4 client implementation. And I think we can probably do this one pretty fucking quick. Is there any unsafe code in here? Fuck yeah, no unsafe code. No unsafe code. Hell yeah. Obviously we have unsafe in our actual, that's on mapping, boxing up the MMIO space, communicating directly with the NIC, reading and writing the NIC, and then send receive. But yeah, we've got no unsafe code. You really, you only really need the length of all layers. Then the fields, fields can be filled in layer, uh, filled in later. Um, what do you mean for, for which function? Like UDP just takes the message length of what's actually being copied. And then, um, oh, and here we'll say, um, uh, it is up, uh, and this will be returns the index into the packets where the message should be placed. Right, so we'll create a UDP thing and then that will return where we should put the payload. 14 plus 20 plus eight. Right, return the index of where to populate the message payload. Okay. Yeah, it returns the index into the packet where the message should be placed. We'll need to do a raw mute. Get the raw packets, packet contents as mutable. Raw mute. Take a mute self. This will give a mute U8. For example, a, a UDP packet could be build UDP that um, I see what you're saying to like make a builder syntax for it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for this raw internal part, it'll just take all the parameters and then we'll, we're going to make an abstraction that will make this a lot easier to use, right? We don't, we're not going to have an end user actually calling this create UDP raw. They will probably be calling dot UDP to get that UDP payload. Cause that one's easy. You just do UDP and then you do, I think dot payload on that UDP. All these we should probably make pub. But, got a client implementation, and this will be um, fn Where do I want to store the DHCP lease? I need to figure that out. I might just get a lease right away. Technically, since I'm doing DHCP leaves, I actually, leases, I actually need to know, I do need a, a clock implementation, so we'll probably have to do that, because uh, I need to know when that expires so I can re-request the lease, but I think right now we'll just assume that doesn't expire, probably make note of that, um, obviously that's not true, the leases do expire, but uh, DHCP is relatively simple, so look at DHCP v4. Um, there we go. It's a pretty simple protocol. Yeah, this is a, so we're going to send a, we're going to send a discover. We're going to broadcast a discover. So we'll do, um, we'll just start off with, uh, get DHP lease. Um,
uh, we'll say get lease on DHCP. Make this pub. That's gonna take a net device, something that implements net device, and then we'll. Uh, <laughs> I love slip-ons to configure us. I did wonder why those popped up. That was kind of interesting. Kernel source main must have been like the name of the slipper was DHCP or the brand or something. Mod DHCP. Okay, so we got get lease. This is gonna take a. I guess we'll do use um. Create net net device. So this is gonna take a device mutable dynamic reference to a net device. Should be valid. We can do that. And I think that's it. Yeah. So we can construct the DHP discover, which is just UDP. Maybe an ad. I have I don't get any ads from DuckDuckGo. I don't know. What was it? What did I search for? I don't know why it's not showing up now. It's a mystery. Maybe I was, what did I search for like wiki or something? A highlight over something? I don't know. Unless that wasn't for the DHP surf search, but I thought it was. Uh, here we're gonna do get a get a lease. So here we're gonna get a packet. Uh, let packet is equal to device dot allocate packet. Um, so get a packet from the device. Carl Bright, thanks for the follow. And then what we're gonna do is packet dot create UDP raw. And we're going to say the source ethernet is device.eth uh, mac. The destination is OXFF for 6. The source IP is 0. The destination IP is not 0, broadcast. The source port is 68, and the destination port is 67. And the message size is the size of a DHP structure. So we're going to figure out whatever this is, that's the end mark. These are all the options. Um, so all of these fields are dynamic dynamic in DHCP packets. I actually have a DHCP uh, parser and I've got a complete for all levels, uh, all options and stuff, parser for DHCP and Rust. Um, okay. Can anyone explain what's happening? We're writing a DHCP client to get an IP lease uh, on a network, so we're trying to figure out what IP address we should be using uh, on a network. That's what we're currently doing. Uh, create UDP raw, get a Mac, then, yep. And what's the size of a UDP, uh, a DHP packet? So four, let me do four, 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 plus these four. Four, 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 four. Got the cookie. Four, and then the options are dynamic. And we're always going to probably do the same things. We're going to have a discover, requested. In fact, we can actually just kind of take a look at how big a uh, DTP request is, but it's pretty straightforward. Um... Let's find that request. Where is this doing the DTP lease? Should be doing one. Really? Oh, yeah, we have this configured to static. Yeah, that's currently set up static. Okay, that makes sense. DHCP is a monster compared to UDP? No, nah, DHCP is really simple. It's really fucking simple. Okay, the size of this is, I think, 48 plus. Um, oh, 192 octets of zero. 
I think 240 then, plus the options. And we'll have to figure out what options we want to send. But options are really easy. So we're going to send a discover, which is a um, 30, 35. Yeah, 35 is a DHP discover. One is the length, and then one is the uh, payload. Or 35 is this is a the option. Fuck it. We're just going to look at the DHP spec. It's really easy. Um, So let's find the boop, 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 boop. Where the fuck is it? I just care about the packet. I don't care about any of this shit. Doesn't mean anything to me. So we're gonna do a DHP discover. We'll probably just we'll probably just send this shit off. Uh yeah, so this is um Yeah, this is the actual message right here. So we just have to add up all of these and then the variable options. So this is must be prepared to receive with options of length that blah, blah, blah. OK, so all I want to do is add all these numbers up. 1, 1, 1, 1, 4, 2, 2, 4, 4, 4, 4, 16, 64. 128, 236. All right, let me do that again. 1, 1, 1, 1, 4, 2, 2, 4. 4, 2, 2, 4. Now I just need these. 4, 4, 4, 16, 64, 128. 236. Definitely 236. All right, so it's 236 plus the option. So we'll say 236. And then we'll do uh, let mute payload is equal to packet uh, dot raw mute, I think. And this is the offset into where we put the payload. Offset dot dot offset plus 236. So this will give us access to the uh, DHP header it's here. Okay, so here we can do DHP header. Um, we might just cast this and make this into a structure. Might be easier for this one. Uh, we would have to use unsafe, which kind of sucks. And mute. Let's just make sure this is building. It is. So we can do DHP header opcode. This is a request. Uh, DHP header hardware type. This is Ethernet. Yeah, we'll we'll probably end up turning these into that's a six byte Ethernet address. Hops is zero. To be honest, we'll just zero out the whole thing, I think. Transaction ID, random number chosen by the client. Yeah, well, we're, we're just going to make a structure. Um, Repper C packed struct DHP header op h type hlen hops zid seconds. Flags, client address, your address, uh, server address, relay address. This is the hardware address, name, uh, file. Okay, so this should be able to assert that that is uh, assert size of DHP header is equal to 236. Let's just see if that works. I think it will. 
is core. Actually, we can just do that here. Core mem size of. Okay, and then where we were doing the testing stuff before, right here, we'll just do the same thing. We'll do um, create net DHCP get lease for mutable reference to Nick. So I'll get a, that'll cause that code to get called. Oh, that's not, yeah, we should, probably should put that under there. We could reorganize that to not have a flat uh, project structure. Okay, so that didn't assertion fail. Let me see if this assertion fails, just to make sure we're hitting that code, but it should. Assertion failed, okay. So, yep, it's 236, so we did it correctly. So now what we can do is, we can do let header is equal to unsafe, uh, cast the header to a DTP header. This is going to be a mutable reference to a DTP header, and we'll do um, DTP header as pointer. That's the pointer to the payload, which we will do, um, we'll slice it up. Core mem size of DHP header. So I'll make sure that we have enough room. Get access to the uh, header portion of the payload. And we're gonna cast that as mute pointer as a mutable reference to a DHP header. And then we'll mute deref that. And now we have access to the header in place of where it is in the packet. Um, the fact that Pixie works over DHP says enough. So, uh, Pixie, the only difference in Pixie and a normal DHCP packet is you set the file here to a null terminated string. That's it. It's just you put a fixed uh, null terminated string in here. That's all it is. <laughs> and that's the boot file name. It's, it's actually really straightforward. You can do a bunch of options where you specify the file as an option, uh, but we don't care about that, so... We're gonna do pretty fixed here. So we'll do header dot, and we'll do some enums here. So this is the uh, DHCP header. Uh, header, and then we'll do uh, opcode. Uh, this is a DHCP opcode. Repper U8 enum opcode. Honestly, we can just say header. We're in DHCP. We don't need to be redundant. Beautiful. And here we can do core mem size of header. So this will make a packet. Okay. Um, initialize the packet for a EDP packet to hold a payload of uh, we're going to want to change that length because we need to compute our options, but we'll start with this. This will be a request reply. And we can say boot request boot reply. Um, DHP hardware type. 